this video, I'll be showing you how to make a social media slash Instagram clone using React on the front end, Express on the back end, and then Sanity for our content management system, as well as our database. Now, this is going to be a pretty advanced tutorial that's going to walk you through how to do all of this completely from scratch. So I'm going to assume that you have some understanding of JavaScript as well as React and Express. Now, with that said, let me give you a demo of what we're going to be building out. Then I'll talk more about exactly how this will work and we'll get into all of the setup steps. So here you can see that I kind of have a mock Instagram. Now I know the styling is not quite what we would expect. I'm not going to focus on styling in this video. It's really just meant on the functionality. You guys can go in and change the CSS and make things look better after you have the functioning website built. Regardless, what I can do here is sign in. Now I'm not implementing real authentication here. And the reason for that is it would make this video extremely long. We're just going to focus on the actual content of the website as well as the functionality. So adding followers, searching for accounts, uh, unfollowing and following different users, being able to post something, right? All of that kind of stuff, view profiles, edit profiles. That's what we're focusing on here as opposed to kind of all the authentication stuff, which you can add to this fairly easily. Anyways, what I can do here is make an account. So maybe I make an account. I just call it hello and then world. And then once I make this account, it will automatically sign me in. Now, what I can also do is log out. And then if I know the username of the account, I can just sign in by entering that username. Nice. OK, so now I'm going to go to search and I'm just going to look for a few users here. And when I press search, I'm going to see all of the different users that I have here uh, in my, I guess, app. So what I can do is click on the rock. And if I want to, I can follow the rock. And now that I'm following the rock, we should see the follower count update here. I can go to my home page or my feed and I'll now see posts from whoever I'm following. Right. So if I go back to search here, let's search. Let's go to Tim Rusica, which is this beautiful guy right here. Let's follow him. Nice. And then when I go back home, I'll see all of the posts from him as well. Nice. Now I can click into different profiles. Of course, I can unfollow people if I want to do that. Then when I go back to the home page, of course, those uh, posts are going to be gone. Then I can go to my profile and I can actually edit this profile. So maybe I want to change my first and last name. Maybe I want to change my bio. Maybe I want to update a photo. So let's actually do that. OK, well, let's update and give it a second here. And we have now updated our profile. So that's really what I'm going to be focusing on in this video. I do know this looks a little bit simple, but there is a ton of stuff that's going on in the back end. And once you understand how to implement these different features here, you'll see how you can add a ton of other stuff like likes, comments, removing posts, uh, a bunch of stuff that I just haven't implemented in this app. And then, of course, you can make a post here by choosing a file uh, and then entering a bio or entering a caption for that photo. All right, so that is the demo of the application. Now, I do want to mention that this video is sponsored by Sanity, which, as I said, is what we're going to use for the content management as well as the database aspect of this app. Now, this is an awesome platform and it really just makes it easy to access different data and to do that from really any source. So even though we're going to be viewing our data from, say, a React front end here, we could be viewing our data from a mobile app or from really anything else. And one of the awesome parts about Sandy is they have this uh, what's it called Sandy Studio, which allows you to go in and actually view all of the entries in your database. So I can go and modify different things, view all of the different entries, and it makes it really convenient when we're debugging, as well as people who aren't developers to so just really easily say, add a post without having to actually go onto the website, you know, sign into an account, all of that kind of stuff. Now, of course, Sandy is completely free, and it's just an awesome thing to use for the database, and I've really enjoyed messing around with it as I've been learning it over the past few days. So yes, that's what we're going to be using. Not much more to say about that. You will learn about all of the features in Sanity as we go through this video. So I just want to jump in here and mention that for the free version of Sanity, usually you get 100,000 API requests, 500,000 API CDN requests, and then 10 gigabytes of bandwidth. But Sandy was actually nice enough to double all of that for this tutorial. So if you go to the link in the description, sandy.com slash tech with Tim, you'll see here that you can use this coupon. So Sandy and Knit and then hyphen hyphen coupon tech with Tim. And that actually gives you double the number of API requests. CDN requests and bandwidth. So usually this is 100K, 500,000, and then 10 gigabytes. And now it's been doubled to 200,000, 1 million, and 20 gigabytes. Again, completely free. You really will not need this many requests. But in case you want to run some other type of application using Sanity, then this is going to be a higher limit and just make it a bit easier for you to do that. Now, the way that you get access to this, again, is you write this Sandy init and then hyphen hyphen coupon tech with Tim. 
Now I'll leave this link in the description. Also, when we start setting up Sanity, I will mention that you can use this coupon code to get access to the doubled limits. So as I mentioned, we do have a few setup steps here for this application. We need to set up our database, our back end, and then our front end. So for the database, go to this website. It is sanity.io. And all you need to do is actually just make an account. So you can click on login. And then assuming you don't have an account, you can just create a new one. Once you've created that account, we can actually do all of the setup for this from our command line. So just install Node.js if you don't already have it. I'm assuming most of you have that already. And then get into VS Code or whatever editor you want to use. Now inside of VS Code here, and I've opened up a folder called Instagram Clone. This is where I'm going to put all of the code for this project. And I've made another folder inside of here called Database. Now Database is specifically where I'm going to put all of the Sanity database related stuff. I'll make two new folders, one for API and then one for front end, where the API will be our Express backend and the front end will be our React application. So now that I've CD'd into this database folder here, what I'm going to do is type the following npm install hyphen g and then at sanity slash CLI. Now this is going to globally install the Sandy CLI, which we're going to use to actually run the Sandy studio and create our Sandy database uh, kind of starting code, right? So I'm going to install that I already have it installed. So it goes pretty quickly. And then once I've done that, I'm going to type the command sanity init. Now this will work assuming that you've installed that uh, the Sandy CLI. And then it's going to ask you if you want to select an existing project or create a new one. So I'm going to create a new project here. That's what I would recommend you do as well. And we'll just call this Insta clone tutorial. And we should probably do like some underscores or something here. So it's a little bit easier to see. OK, Insta clone tutorial for my project name. Then it's going to ask me, do I want to use the default data set configuration? We're just going to click yes for this. We're going to create the data set here, which will take a second. And then we'll be given a few other options here. So project output path, I'm just going to hit enter, meaning it's the current directory. If you wanted it to be somewhere else, you would just type in the relative path to where you currently are. OK, and then we can use a uh, project template if we would like. So movie project, e-commerce blog. Now, I've already showed you what the studio looked like, but if you want to explore it with some sample data, then you can either uh, choose movie project or e-commerce and it will give you some data as well as a schema. And you can have a look at kind of what a sample Sandy Studio may look like and why it's beneficial. Anyways, for now, I'm going to go with clean project with no predefined schemas uh, because we don't need those for our project. We're going to write our own schemas. All right. So we'll just wait for this to finish. Once it is done, I will be right back and then we'll move on to the next steps. All right. So this command has now finished and I've opened up the database folder and you can see that we have a bunch of files and content inside of here. Now, all we really care about is the schemas folder where we have schema.js. We'll look at this later, but this is where we'll define our database models. Now, I want to mention here that what Sandy is actually going to do is it's going to build our different database models for us and then host that in the cloud. So we don't actually need to have any local database file here and our database will be in the cloud, meaning we can access it from really any application. So even though we're building a React app here, if we want to access it from Python or we want to access it from really any other programming language, we could just use the API that Sandy provides to access that data. That's why it's so nice to actually use Sandy because it hosts everything for us and kind of deals with all of the you know database related stuff. Hence why we're using it in this tutorial. Regardless, I want to mention that just keep in mind, we're not actually hosting the data locally. We're just defining the schemas. And then when we start the studio, which we can do now by typing in Sandy start, I will build the schemas for us, host that online uh, and you get the point. So I'm going to start this with Sandy start. Now I need to be inside of the project where Sandy is. So inside of this database folder and then it'll take a second. And what I can do is go to the, a local host link and I'll be able to actually view all my database models and all of the data that's in my database. Now, in this case, we don't have any models, so I'm not going to be able to view anything, but I just want to show you kind of how this works before we proceed. All right, so it is successfully compiled. So what I can do is go to localhost colon 333. So let's open that up now in Google Chrome. And when I go here, it's going to ask me to log in. So I had Google as my login. So let me log into this and then I will show you what it looks like. All right, so I've logged in now to my Google account. And of course, it's going to say empty schema because, well, it is empty. We haven't put anything here yet, uh, but I just want to show you this kind of how the studio works. You access it from this localhost link. All right, so we've pretty much set up st Sanity now. We'll do the uh, database models later on. So I'm just going to end this with Control C. And now we're going to set up Express. So I'm going to make a new folder here and I'm just going to call this API. And then I'm going to CD into the API folder. So CD API. 
All right, so I'm now inside of the API folder. So I'm just going to run the command npm init to give us a fresh project. And then I'm going to run through the setup here. So package name API is fine. The version one is fine. We don't need a description. Uh, the entry point of index.js is fine for right now. We don't need a test command. We don't need a Git repository. No keywords, no author, no license. Is this OK? Yes, it is. And hit enter. OK, so now we have a package.json, which is what I want. I'm going to install a bunch of modules that we need, and then we'll actually just create kind of the boilerplate express application before we start uh, kind of writing all of the different endpoints. So what I'm going to do is type npm install, and then I'm going to install the sanity client. Now there is a JavaScript client that we can use that will allow us to very easily send requests to the sanity API. Again, if you're working with Sandy from another programming language, uh, they do have some other built in packages and kind of pre built. I don't even know what you would call them modules uh, that, that you can use to connect to Sandy. But you also can just do it manually using the Sandy API. Regardless, npm install at Sandy client. We also want to install the body hyphen parser. This is going to allow us to actually get JSON uh, data in our Express API. Then we are going to install Molter. We're going to use this for uploading files. We're going to install .env. We're going to use this so we can have an environment variable file that stores our API token. We're then going to have FS, which is file system. Again, this is for uploading files. And then we're going to have a nano ID to get a unique ID. So let's spell that correctly. OK, so I'm going to install all of these right here. Again, if any of this is confusing to you, please feel free to check out the code from GitHub. Again, the link will be in the description and you can just take the package.json file, download that and then install everything that's inside of it on your own. OK, so I've now installed all of those packages. Now what I'm going to do is create a few different files that I need inside of here and then that will conclude the setup. So the first file that I want to make here is index.js. This is going to be my entry point. The next file that I want to make is going to be API calls.js. This file will be responsible for holding all of the sanity API calls. Uh, so interacting with our database, essentially. Next, what I'm going to do is make a new file, and this is going to be client.js. We're going to initialize this in a second. This will be our sanity client. And then finally, we're going to do .env, which is going to store an environment variable with our API token for the sanity project. Now, what's going on here? is we're going to have a backend. The backend is going to be interacting with the API, so the Sanity database API. And the point of this is so that our front end can hit our backend. Our backend can be authenticated with the API. And then that way we're not exposing our Sanity API token. And we're only having the backend of our application actually manipulating or dealing with any data. I could from my front end hit the API for Sanity. I don't actually need to build out an entire backend, but this will be slightly more secure. Now, I will mention that what we're doing here for the back end is not the most secure. You'd have to make some modifications if you were going to put this into production. But it's just better practice to have any of your API tokens uh, and interactions with data to be done from the back end as opposed to the front end. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. But that's what we're making the API essentially. So we forward requests from the front end to the back end that we're building. The back end will then send the appropriate request to the Sanity API, which will be hosting the database and giving us any data that we need and then returning that to the front end. So you can, so you can kind of think of the back end as a proxy between our front end and the database. All right, so we have .env client. Uh, we could really start anywhere here. I'll start at index.js and I'm just going to write kind of some boilerplate code to set up our Express application. So I'm going to say import Express from Express. And then I'm going to say import the body parser like this from and then this will be just body parser. So actually, I think it will be like this body hyphen parser. Now, I don't know why I did a space here. OK, we have our two imports. Then I'm going to say my const app is equal to express. This makes my express application. And I'm going to say app.use and then body parser.json and then app.use and this will be body parser dot and then this is going to be URL encoded. And then inside of here we have to have to pass an object and we're going to say extended and then false. Now, what we're doing here is essentially installing a few things that are going to allow us to actually look at and parse the data that's sent as the data in a post request or in a get request to our server. Now, if you don't have a body parser like this, you're not going to be able to actually receive, uh, say, post data or just data in general, JSON from a request. What this will do is actually parse the data for us, then it'll return it to us in our request.body. I know that might be a little bit confusing, but really this just allows us to actually get request data uh, from wherever the request is being sent from. 
Okay, so that's what we're doing for uh, this. Now we're just going to start the app. So I'm going to say app dot listen, and then I'm going to put this on port 3001. And then I'm going to have a function here. And this is just going to say console dot log. And then we'll just say started just so we know that the server actually ran successfully. All right, so that's all we need so far for index.js. We'll start writing a few different routes, uh, like get get roots, post roots, whatever later on. Uh, but for now, this is kind of our starting code. All right, now one thing I need to do here is go to package.json, and I just need to remove this test script, and I want to add a start script here. And what the start script is going to be is just node and then index.js. Okay, so that's going to run the file for us. And I need to add one other field here. And this field is going to be type and then module. Now, what this is going to allow us to do is actually have the import statements here. So a lot of times you'll see something like express equals and then something like use or something like require, sorry, uh, and then express. Now, I don't want to do it that way. I'd rather just have regular imports. So I'm going to have uh, a module type. So I say type equals module and that allows me to have my regular imports. OK, so that's what we need for package.json. That's good for index.json API calls. We don't need anything right now. But for our client.js, we are going to initialize the sanity client. So I'm going to say import and then sanity client from and then this is going to be at sanity slash client. And then I'm going to import dot env from and then this is going to simply be dot env. Remember, we installed all of these things. OK, now that we've done that, we're going to say dot env dot config. Remember what this is going to allow us to do is actually read this dot env file. So that's why I'm writing this. And then I'm going to say export default and I'm going to create a sanity client. So I'm going to say sanity client and I'm going to pass to it an object here that has all of the data that we need to kind of initialize the API connection to our sanity database. So I'm going to say project ID colon and then this will be something that I will tell you how to get in a second. We're going to say data set. You're going to make sure you put production here. This is just the name of the default data set for our Sandy project. Then we're going to say use CDN. Now I'm going to set this equal to false and I'll explain what this is in one second. We're going to say API version. And for the API version, what we can actually do is just put today's date. Now, when I'm recording this, it is February 22nd. And when you do that, it's just going to give you the most recent version based on this date. So just put the current date. You also could just do something like new date. But for now, we'll just hard code in this string because I know that works. Then we're going to say token. And this is going to be our API token, which I'll show you how to get again in a second. So what the CDN is going to do here, if we enable this to be true, is it's going to give us a much faster response from the database, but it's going to give us a lot of stale data. Now, the reason for this is going to cache all of our requests. So if we send the same request twice, it's going to say, oh, you sent this request before. What was the response last time? Let me just give you the same response as opposed to hitting the database. That's what the CDN does. So we want to make this false for our application because we're doing a lot of changes that we want to see happen instantly. So if we're caching all of our requests, we're going to be getting a lot of stale data, although that data will be returned to us, returned to us very much faster. So if you have cache data, everything is a lot quicker, but you're getting some stale data. Whereas if you don't cache it, it's going to be slower, but you're getting fresh data, which is what we're going to prefer here. So I'm going to turn the CDN off. You can make it true and see what happens in your application, obviously, once we start building out something that's more functional. So what we need to find now is the project ID for our Sandy application. Now, the way we can find that is we can go to database. We can go to Sandy.json. We can just copy the project ID. And notice here the name of the data set is production. So that's why I put that in uh, the data set field here. OK, so for the project ID, I'm going to paste that in. That's now going to link it to that project. And then we need a token. Now, to get the token, we actually have to go to the Sandy website. So what I'm going to do is go here to Sandy. I'm going to log in. And then I'm going to find my project. Now, my project here, uh, you can see I messed around with a bunch of them before this is Insta clone tutorial. I'm going to click on API here and then I'm going to go to tokens and I'm going to add an API token. Now for the name, let's just go tutorial and we want to have uh, editor access here. So we have read and write access to all data sets, but you could just give a viewer access, right? or the Deploy Studio token only, access to Deploy Sandy Studio and GraphQL APIs to our hosted service. Anyways, we want the editor, so let's go with editor. It's going to give us a token. This is the only time we can copy it, so I'm going to copy that token. And I'm going to go now to my env file. And I'm going to make a variable here called sanity, and we'll say API token in all capitals is equal to, 
and then I'm going to paste the token inside of here. Now I have to check if we need a string or not in this file. So bear with me. I don't think we do. Actually, yes, we do need a string. So let me make this stringified here by putting another quotation at the end. All right. So the point of this is that if we were to upload this project to GitHub, for example, we would not upload this .env file. And that would mean if someone else wanted to use our application, what they would have to do is make their own env file put their sanity API token inside of that file that have to change their project ID, then they'd be able to run this application with their own sanity project. So we're putting it in an env file because I don't want to hard code this directly into my uh, JS file. And it's kind of good practice to store things as environment variables that are sensitive data. Now, of course, I'm showing you the API token here. If any of you are crazy enough to type out the entire token, then well, you can have it, although I'm going to delete it after this video is finished being filmed anyways. OK, so now that we have this env file, what I want to do is access that variable from the env file. So since I've used dot env, what I can do here is type process. And then this is going to be dot env dot. And then this is going to be sanity underscore API underscore token. OK, I believe that is correct. Yes, that looks good. And that will access the variable right here from our environment variable file and allow us to use this Sandy API token again without having to hard code it directly into the file. OK, so now we have set up our client.js. We have set up our index.js. Let's now see if this actually works and then we'll move on to setting up the front end. So what I'm going to do here is just type npm start from inside of the API folder. And let's see if it works. Notice we got the output of started, which is what I wanted to see. We're all good. We can now quit this with control C. All right, so we now have our API and we have our database set up. The next thing that we need to set up is our React front end. So I'm going to go into the parent level or the top level directory here of my Instagram clone, and I'm going to run a few NPM commands. So I'm going to say npx create React app, and I'm going to call this front end. This will give us kind of the boilerplate React app code. So let's run that and let's see what we get here. OK, it's going to take us a second to run. Once this is done, then I'll open up that folder and start showing the other stuff we need to do. All right. So we have now created the uh, front end folder here that actually took a lot longer than I was expecting. So what I'm going to do now is CD into front end and I'm going to install the other NPM packages that we need. So I'm going to say NPM install. Then this is going to be react router DOM. I'm also going to install react and then router and then bootstrap. And the reason we need that, assuming we spell bootstrap correctly, is because we're going to install react bootstrap, which is going to give us some pre-built components, just allowing us to style things a little bit nicer. So again, react router DOM, react router bootstrap. Uh, I spelled bootstrap wrong a second time and then react bootstrap. OK, so let's run that. This will take a second. Once it's done, I will be right back. All right, so we have now installed all of the packages that we need. So I'm just going to go inside a front end and I'm going to start cleaning this up a little bit because we don't need all of the files that are inside of SRC. So SRC is where we're going to write our source code. We don't really have to worry about anything else right now. Inside of here, I'm just going to delete a few things that we don't need. So I don't need app.test.js. I don't need logo. I don't need report web vitals and I don't need setup tests. So let's delete all of those. Remove those through recycling bin. Let's now go to app.js. And uh, actually, let's remove the import for logo.svg. We don't need that for the source for this image. In fact, for all the stuff inside of here, we can just delete this and we can just make it so we have a single div for app. We can then go to index.js. We can remove the report web vitals, remove the import for that. And now we are good. Now, I just want to set up this SRC directory a little bit just so we're ready to start coding in a second. So let's make a new folder here. I want to call this components. This is where we're going to put all our components. I want to make another folder here called CSS. And I just want to move my CSS file inside of here. And that's where we'll put all of our custom CSS. So both the CSS folders or files are going to go in there and then we'll put app.js uh, inside of components. OK, and index.js can stay outside of here. But we now oh, the import automatically changed for us. OK, that was nice. Didn't realize it did that. I was going to say we have to change the import, but it doesn't look like we do. So for this import here, we will actually have to change this. So I'm going to say dot slash CSS slash index dot CSS because we're index and we're trying to get in the CSS folder. And then for app dot JS here, I need to change this import as well. So it's going to be dot dot slash and then CSS slash app dot CSS. Uh, that is going to bring us to the parent level directory SRC then into CSS and then to app dot CSS. Uh, if that's wrong, I'll fix it later. But I think right now that is good. OK, now that we've done that, 
let's go to our package.json and we just need to add one line here at the very bottom. And this is proxy. And then we're going to proxy localhost colon and then 3001. Now we'll also do HTTP before this. The reason why we need this here is because we want to forward requests that we're sending from the front end to our back end, which is going to run on port 3001. Now, I believe that our React app is going to run on port 3000. Our back end runs on 3001 and then the Sandy Studio will run on 3333, although we don't really care about that uh, URL for right now, because again, all of that's hosted in the cloud. That's just giving us kind of the nice visual of our uh, Sandy database. OK, so now we have most of the setup complete. We have our front end. We have our database. We have our API. So let's just run the front end and make sure that's working. So I'm inside a front end. So let's type npm start and let's see if this crashes or not or if it actually runs the application for us. All right. So it looks like everything is good here. I'm looking through the terminal. It doesn't look like I have any errors. And you can see that I'm at localhost colon 3000 and I can view my React application. So that is good. That is what I wanted to test out. Now, ideally, we're going to run this at the same time as our back end. But for now, we don't need to do that. I just wanted to make sure that each individual step was working. So now we have our front end, we have our database and we have our API. Let's just quickly go to the Sandy website for one second. And I want to show you here if I go to overview, uh, what I can do is view, for example, the API CDN requests, the regular API requests, the bandwidth, the documents. And for the free version, this is what we're limited at, right? 100,000 requests, 10 gigabytes of bandwidth. You are not going to hit that, especially because this is just a tutorial. And then you can view things like members, data sets, access, usage. I won't go through all of it, but I just wanted to mention that this does exist here. Uh, and again, because this is hosted on the cloud, you can view all of this data and you are rate limited at a certain point uh, because it's the free plan. Of course, you can upgrade and uh, get more limits or higher API requests and all that kind of stuff. OK, so now that we've done this, I want to start setting up the back end database, so specifically the schemas. So I want to go into the schemas directory here and then into schemas.js. And in fact, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to make a new file called user.js and another new file. And this is going to be called post.js. And inside each of these individual files, I'm going to code out the schemas for the database models for a user and for a post. Once I do that, I'll add them to the schema folder and then I'll show you how we actually build that schema by just running sanity start right and running that uh, that studio. All right. So I've just taken a quick cut here and opened up a website containing a basic tutorial on how to create schemas in sanity. I'll leave this in the description in case you guys want to have a look. But let's quickly run through this right here just so we understand basically how to create a schema. So we want to focus on this, which is an individual schema or actually this, which is an individual schema. And what we do to create a schema is we have a title, a name, a type, and then the fields that we want on each of these objects. So the title is the display name. This is what we're going to see when we're printing this out or when we're viewing it in the Sandy Studio. The name is what's going to be used in the APIs. So make sure the name has lowercase letters. At least that's the convention. Then for the type, we're only going to go with document for now. But as it says, you can have some more advanced types. We're not going to look at any more advanced ones. If you want to see how those work again, reference this documentation. We then have fields. Now the fields is going to be all of the data we want to store for every object that is of this type. And so now they just have one field, which is a name. So the title is name. That's the display name. The name which is used in the API is name. And then the type is going to be string. Now, of course, you can have more advanced types like arrays, references, booleans. And I'm going to show you a bunch of those as we write out our user as well as our post. OK, so just wanted to quickly run through that. Now let's create the user schema. So I'm going to write the schema in here and then we'll import it from schema.js. I uh, just to make things a bit cleaner. So I'm going to say export default for the title of this. It is going to be user. OK, then we will have a comma. Let's spell user correctly for the name. This will be user with a lowercase. And then we want the type. This is going to be a document. OK, and then for the fields, this is going to be an array. And inside of here, we're going to have a bunch of fields. So the first field is going to have a title of first name. Let's get the quotation marks correct here. It's going to have a name of this is going to be first underscore name. And then we're going to have the type of and then string. OK, that's all we need for that field. For the next field, we're going to have last names. We can actually just copy this and just change first to last. So this will be last and this will be last. All right. Next, we want to have a username. So we have first name, last name, username. We're going to have a bunch of other things as well. 
So we're going to say title. This will be username. The name will be username with a lowercase. And then we want the type here to be, again, a string. OK, continuing, we want to have a photo. Uh, this is going to be like the profile photo of the user. So we're going to say this is title and the title will be photo. The name will be photo and then the type will be and this is going to be an image. Next, we are going to put the bio. So I'm going to say title. This is bio. I think we all know what a bio is. A little description for the user. We're going to say the name is the bio. And the type here is going to be, you guessed it, a string. Actually, sorry, not a string, text, because text can store longer piece of data than string. Since we can potentially have quite a bit of data for the bio, we go with text. So actually, no, you didn't guess it. We're going with text. OK. All right. So this next field here is going to be following. Now, this is going to be all of the users that this user is following. Now, you also could have, say, on a user, a followers field, and then that would contain all of the people that are following them. However, you only want to have one or the other. So pick what you want. You can have followers on on the user, which contains all of the people following them, or you can have following, which is the people that a user is following. I think that makes sense to have what I'm going to put here, which is the following field, but just want to describe what this is. So I'm going to say title. This is going to be following. The name is going to be following. And then this needs to be an array, right? Because we're going to be following multiple users. So I'm going to say type array. And then this is going to be of. And inside of here, I'm going to define the type that this array is going to store. So I'm going to say type. This is going to be a reference type. Now, a reference is something that's going to reference another document. So inside here, we're going to reference the ID of another user. So I'm going to say two because that's what we need for reference. And then inside of here, I'm going to say type and then user. So this essentially states, OK, we're having an array and then this is going to be of references and these references are going to be two users. Now, one thing I can also do here is add what's known as a validation. So I can say validation and I can say rule and I can write a function here. And this rule can go to rule dot unique. And what this will mean is that we need to have unique values inside of this array. All right. Hopefully that makes sense, but that is what we're doing for the following field. Again, an array of references to a user. And when we reference the user, we're just going to need the ID to that user. And I'll show you how we make that later on. All right. The next thing that we want here, uh, actually, where am I going to define this? It looks like I'm going to define it right before this square bracket is going to be created at. So I'm going to say for the title, let's put this down. Let's have created at okay then we are going to have name this will be i've completely messed this up created at and then the type for this is going to be date time all right so thank you auto formatter for fixing that for me we have title created at name created at type date time we just want to know when we created this user great so that's really all we need for this schema here for the user, I'll slowly scroll through it so you guys can have a look at everything. Again, all this code will be available from the description. Next, we're going to do the schema for the post. All right. So for post, we're going to say export default. And then similarly to before, we're going to say title. This is going to be post. We're going to say name. This will be post. We're going to say type. This will be a document. And then we are going to have our fields like this, which will be an array and we will define the fields. So on a post, what do we need? Well, we need a photo. So we're going to have title, photo, name, photo, type, and this is going to be an image. OK, moving on to the next field, we're going to have a description for the post. So we're going to say title, description, name, description autocomplete is coming in clutch here and the type is going to be type text okay continuing we want the author of the post as well as when the post was created so i'm going to say title created at okay let's go name why did it do that uh oh name created at let's actually do created underscore at and then for the type this will be date time OK, let's make these on new lines, though. Auto formatter. Can you fix this for me? Nice. 
And lastly, we want the author. Now, the author needs to be a reference type to the user that created this post. So we're going to say title author. Excuse my bad typing here. Name author and then type is going to be a reference and it is going to reference to and we're going to put type and then user inside of here. All right, so we have now created our two schemas. We have our post schema as well as our user schema. So let's now go to schema.js. Let's import these two schemas and then we'll use them inside of here. So what I will do here is simply say import user from and then dot slash user dot JS and then import. And what's the other one that we wanted? We wanted a post from and then dot slash post dot JS. Nice. And then I put my types in here. So I'm going to say user and post doesn't matter the order that you place it. But now we are going to have these two schemas inside of our data set. All right. So we have now set up the database. We've set up the front end. We have set up the back end. Let's now rerun Sandy Studio and see if we can view these different uh, database models that we've created. So let's run a new terminal here. OK, new command prompt and let's CD into the database and let's go Sanity start. And then let's have a look at the Sandy Studio and view these new models. All right. So it is now compiled. So let's launch this in Google Chrome. Let's have a look here at the Sandy Studio. It's logging me in. And now notice we have user and post over here. We can actually make a user and a post if we want, right? One of the great things about Sandy Studio is the fact that I can do this. And maybe I give someone who is not very tech savvy in my organization access to this tool. And then they can just come in here and they can make a new blog post. They can make a new user. They can make whatever it is that they want by looking at a graphical user interface, right? So I have my first name, last name, username, photo, bio, following, created at. I'm not going to fill this out, but of course, you can see how easy it is to actually do that. OK, so we don't need that open anymore. Let's actually close Sandy Studio. And now what we'll move on to is actually writing some React code. Now, I understand this video has been long so far with all of the setup steps, uh, but that was anticipated at the beginning. There's a lot that we have to do. So let's now open up our front end and start writing some React code. And first of all, I want to make some new components. So just kind of template out the components that we want, and then we'll fill in those components one at a time. So I'm going to say new file. The first component that I want is going to be all posts. OK, uh, not dot KS. This is going to be dot JS. I also want a component that's going to seem a bit weird right now, but this is going to be alert and then dismissible. OK, uh, I don't know if I spelt that correctly. I think I did. OK, I think that's fine. Uh, this is going to be an alert that will show up on the screen. You saw that during the demo, but we'll need a component for that. So let's just write that right now. Uh, next, we're going to say create post dot JS. That's going to be for well making a post. We're then going to have edit profile. This is going to be kind of a I think it's called a modal or like a pop up that will show up on the screen that lets us edit a post as you saw in the demo. And then we're going to go login dot JS. Then I'm going to make a new file. This is going to be profile dot JS. We're going to have another component. This is going to be profile item dot JS. Now, this is actually going to be what shows up in the search bar for each one of our profiles or each one of our users. And then we're going to have search.js. And we're going to have, lastly, signup.js. All right, so I think that is pretty good. Now, for all of these components, what I want to do is just write the uh, kind of boilerplate function for them just so that I can import them and start setting up my roots for each of these different pages. So inside of all posts, I'm just going to say export like this, default, and then this will be a function, all posts. Okay. And then inside of here for now, I'm just going to return a P tag and this P tag will just say if we do this correctly, all posts just so we know what page we're on. Again, this is just for the routing. So let's copy that and let's put this inside of all of these. So for alert dismissible, this will be alert dismissible. OK, and then here this is going to need to be alert dismissible as well. Let's do a space, though, for create post. You guessed it. We're going to say create and then post. And then this is going to be create post. OK, continuing, we're going to have edit profile. So let's make this one edit and then profile. See how good the autocomplete here is. Edit profile. We want to log in. OK, just trying to come up with words to say here as we go in and fill all these in. Next, we're going to have profile. OK, this will be profile. We want profile item. 
profile item and inside of here profile item with the space we want to search we're almost done here last one coming up and the last one that we want here is going to be sign up okay so let's go sign up and then sign up okay apologize for that we just wanted to write all the basic functions so that now we're able able to see what page we're on when we start handling the routing we now close all of these we no longer need them we want to go inside of app.js and i want to start setting up my react router now my react router is what's going to allow us to route between different pages uh, and that's why i wanted to create all of those components so now i can import them and then route between them so let's just go up here and let's start by importing react and let's also import use state okay and we're going to do this from the react module okay then i'm going to import all of the components that i just created so i'm going to say import and then this is going to be all posts from and this is going to be dot slash and then all posts.js now if you're hearing something right now that is my cat running around my keyboard so apologize for that uh continuing i'm going to say import and then we're going to import the alert dismissible from alert dismissible okay dot js then we're going to import create post from dot slash create post then i'm going to import edit profile from edit profile i actually don't think we need the dot js here so i think i can remove that then i'm going to import login from dot slash login i'm going to import profile from profile and actually i don't need edit profile sorry i just need profile i uh, will import search okay from dot slash search and then lastly the sign up page import sign up from dot slash and then sign up okay all right so while we are at our imports here let's import what we need from react router dom as well so i'm going to say import and then this is going to be the browser and then router as well as a root as well as the roots as well as link from and then this is react and then hyphen router dom now, if you've never used this before again this is what allows us to route between the different pages and make it so if we go to say slash sign up it actually brings us to the slash sign up page uh so for our div we can leave the class name actually yeah we'll leave the class name empty for right now and we'll worry about the css later and i'm going to start actually building out the html of the page so the first thing that i need to do here is put browser router now anything inside of here will allow us to actually route between it okay so browser router is kind of where we're able to write roots as well as where we're able to have links and a nav bar and all this kind of stuff so that's why i'm writing this out then we're going to set up all of our different roots then i'll make a nav bar so inside of here i need to write this roots tag and then i need to end the roots tag and this is where you're allowed to define roots you can only do that inside of roots so make sure you don't try to make a root outside of it and then i will make my roots so i'm going to say root okay the element for this root is going to be equal to we're going to start with all posts now all posts i really could have called uh like your feed uh, but that's fine we're going to render the all post component for this root the path to this is just going to be home so when you go to the home page it's going to bring you to your feed which will render all of the posts on the screen or it will show only the posts of the people that you're following uh depending on uh what is it if you're logged in or if you're not logged in so I put exact here now what exact does is just make it so the path has to match this exactly if you don't have that then I could go to slash and then anything else like slash hello slash world and it would also match with this path just because it's only a single slash so that's why I have exact okay now continuing we're gonna have another root I'm gonna say root element equals uh, it doesn't really matter the order that we do this so let's just do login now, I could render it that way but I want to render it just with a slash for the path for this we'll say this is slash login now we could do exact but it doesn't really matter to me here because if you type slash login and then slash something else um that's fine we'll still bring you the login page um I, I think it's fine to just have login like this okay now continuing not router we want to root the element for this one might as well just do sign up so let's do sign up okay and then the path here is going to be equal to slash sign up uh, and then we'll have slash there. nice okay continuing I'm gonna have root element equals and then the next one that we want is profile so I'm gonna say profile 
like that. And then this will be path is equal to profile. OK, we need another root. Uh, where's my autocomplete here? Root element equals. Yeah, we want search. That's good for the path. We'll go with slash search. OK, and then is there any other ones that we need? Uh, we need create post. OK, let's do create post. We'll say root like that. And I keep saying router. I mean root. Sorry, if you see router, that's not what I meant to type. I meant to type root. OK, and then element is equal to. And then this is going to be uh, what was this? We need to create post. So let's have create post. The path will be slash create dash post. OK, and then we can end. And for sign up, just because my OCD will kill me here, let's go with sign and then hyphen up. And I realized that I made a small mistake here, guys. Let's just fix this to be root as opposed to router. Again, I don't know why I kept typing that. Uh, it's meant to be root, not router. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that and you guys are making fun of me, but that is fine. OK, so now we have all of the different routes that we need. So we can go to login, sign it, uh, profile, search, create post. We'll need to make a few more specifically. We need one for logout. And I'm also going to do something here for profile. Uh, we actually have a variable in the name and I go with username. Now, what this means is that I'm going to type slash profile slash and then the name of the user that I want to go to. And then this will be passed implicitly to the profile component. So I'll be able to know uh, what the parameter was essentially to get to this profile page. OK, so now that we've made those changes, let's run our front end. So let's go CD dot dot. Let's CD into the front end. Let's go NPM and then start and we'll go to localhost colon 3000. And let's just see if we can go to some different routes here. All right, so I've just opened up my React application here. Notice I'm on the all post page, which is what happens when we go to the default route. Now let's try sign up. OK, brings us to sign up. Let's try login. OK, brings us to login. Let's try profile. Uh, we'll go to profile slash Tim actually because we need a variable. OK, brings us to profile. Uh, and I'm sure the other ones are going to work as well. So here we go. We have now set up the React router. All right. So now that all of that is working, I want to build out a nav bar. So to do that, I'm going to bring in a few things here from Bootstrap that I need to use. So I'm going to say import. We're going to import the nav bar. We're going to import the uh, what else do we want here? The container. We're going to import the nav and we're going to import the button from. And then this is going to be React Bootstrap. So React and then Bootstrap like that. OK, let's start building the nav bar. So we're going to use the nav bar component. OK, inside of here, I'm going to say collapse on and then this is going to be select. And then I'm going to say expand is equal to medium. Now, this says when am I going to start expanding the nav bar from a collapsed nav bar to a larger nav bar? That's when the screen size is medium, which is a certain pixel amount in Bootstrap. Essentially, when I have collapse on select, uh, what that allows me to do is make it so that I can collapse the nav bar when it's a smaller version of the nav bar. You'll see what I mean when I start messing with the screen, but this navbar will be dynamic. So on mobile, you'll have to actually click on the button to view all of the different links. And then you can click on a button to collapse the navbar and hide all of the links. And it's saying, when do I want to expand the navbar? Well, I want to expand it into a full size navbar once the screen size is medium. OK, now for the background, I'm going to make this dark and all this stuff you can find from the bootstrap uh, documentation. So if I don't explain something, then just reference it there. And for the variant of the navbar, I'm going to go with dark. And that's all I need for the nav bar uh, definition here. Now, inside of the nav bar, I need to put a container. So I'm going to say container. This container is going to be fluid, which means it takes up the uh, entire top of the screen. So inside of this container, I'm going to put a few different things. The first thing I'm going to put is kind of the branding. Now, the branding would be the logo. In this case, I'm just going to put a name. So the way I do this is I say link container. And I need to import this, which I'm going to do now. So I'm going to say import and then link container. And this is going to be from and this will be react bootstrap or actually react router bootstrap. Sorry. So I'll explain why we need this. You need a link container when you are using bootstrap components with a react router. Seems a little bit weird, but when I want to actually navigate between different pages, I want to click on a button on the nav bar. And usually I would use this link component to allow me to navigate to another page. The issue is if I just use this standard link on the nav bar, it's going to be styled in a really weird way. So instead, I surround it with this link container, and then that's going to make it so that I have the default styling of the nav bar and that the styling of this link component doesn't override it. 
Uh, hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but that's why I needed to install React uh, Bootstrap or React Red or Bootstrap to get this link container component to allow my styling to stay consistent. So I'm going to say link container and I'm going to say two. This is going to go to slash and then I'm going to say navbar. Uh, wait, what the heck? This needs to go inside of here. Sorry, my autocomplete is doing some funky stuff. I'm going to say navbar dot link. OK, and then inside of the link, I'm going to put Instagram clone because that's the name of our app. OK, so that's the first thing that we need in this link container. Then what I'm going to do is say navbar dot and then toggle. Now, this is going to be the toggler for the nav bar, allowing me to expand it or unexpand it or collapse it, right? Collapse on select. And then I'm going to put all of the stuff that I want to be collapsible content. So I'm going to say nav bar dot collapse inside of here. So all the stuff that goes inside of if this will be collapsible when I hit this little toggler button for the nav bar. So now I want to add a nav. So I'm going to say nav. OK, and then inside of here, I'm going to put all of my links and link containers. So I'm going to say link container and then this is going to be two and this will be slash. OK, so inside of this link container, I'm going to say nav dot and then link and then we need to end this. So nav dot link. OK, and then here this will be feed. I mean, I can go with home feed, really whatever I want. Now let's copy this a few times. The next thing that we want is search. And the last thing that we want is just post. Now for the two links, we got to change this. This will be to search and this will be to create and then hyphen post. All right, so that wraps up most of the nav bar, but I want to put something on the right hand side of the screen that allows me to log in, to log out, to view the profile of the current user and then to sign in if I'm not currently signed in. So for now, we'll just put a sign in button, but then we'll make it so that once you're signed in, it shows you the logout button and it lets you view your profile. So for now, I'm just going to say uh, navbar dot text because I don't want this to be kind of a link like you see before. I want this just be regular text. And then inside of here, I'm going to say link. And then for the link, this link is going to go to and then slash login. And then I'm going to say not signed in. OK, so it's going to allow me to sign in. When I click on this, it will bring me to the login page. So let's have a look at what I did. I understand I just wrote a ton of code at once. To do that, we can just refresh the page on slash uh, home here. And we should see that we get a nav bar. Uh, OK, let me just he go here and clear the cache. And we're still not getting this. Um, all right, I'm not sure why we're not getting a nav bar here. Uh, let me have a look and I'll be right back. All right, so I was running this code and I was having trouble figuring out what the problem was because I wasn't seeing anything being rendered on my screen. But then I looked in the console and I realized that I actually named this right here on line 21 link when it needs to be brand. So my apologies, but this needs to be navbar.brand and then everything else should be fine. And now when we come back to the screen, we should see that we get a nice navbar here. We have feed, search, post, not signed in. I'm going to show you how we can move that to the right later on. When I click between the different links, it brings me to the different pages. When I click on the brand here, Instagram clone, it brings me to that page. So I just want to jump in here for one second and mention that if when you're looking at the nav bar, you're not getting a styled nav bar and it looks really strange and kind of default styles. What you can try doing is adding this line right here on line four to your index.js file. So you're going to have to just type this in dot dot slash node module slash slash bootstrap slash dist slash css slash bootstrap dot min dot css and that will actually import the css file just in case for some reason it's not being imported now if this line errors out for you then what you can do is just manually install bootstrap it should already be installed but you can do npm install and then bootstrap like that and then you should be good to go and you should be able to actually run this line Again, I'm not sure why that would be a problem for you, but I've had that in the past. So again, just import this line right here in your index.js file and it should fix that problem for you. Also, make sure your index.js file is right inside of SRC and not inside of any other folder. Otherwise, this relative import is going to be different. All right. So that is all we need for the nav bar. And also you can see when I make this small enough, it makes it collapsible. So now I can open and close it. So let's get the CSS working on the nav bar just so that we have this uh, moved over to the right hand side, then we'll move on and code out some more stuff. So to fix this and make that go over to the right hand side, what I'm going to do is add another nav group here. So I'm going to say nav 
I'm going to put my navbar.txt inside of here. And again, all of this you can find from the bootstrap documentation. I'm not going to explain how all of it works. And what I can do is go to this first nav here. And I can say class name is equal to and then me dot auto. Now, what this will do is make it so that we're going to space these two nav components out and that other nav component is going to go to the right hand side. So you can see now it's moved over to the right hand side. And if I remove this class here, so let's remove that and have a look. Notice that it kind of comes back over here to the left. So me auto just makes this. So we're going to take up the entire space that we have. So this will take up as much space as possible and then essentially push this over to the right hand side. And if we want to have a look at that more specifically, we can inspect here. And when we look at we have our div navbar collapse, we have another div. Notice it's taking up all of the space, right? This is the one that has the me auto on it. It's pushing all the way to the right hand side. And since it takes up all of the space, it pushes this tag over here all the way to the right hand side of the nav bar. Okay, so that is the CSS that we needed for the nav bar. I think that is all good for right now. Now we can start looking at login and sign up and then sending some requests to our API for actually creating an account and then signing into an account. So let's start by coding out the sign up page, which is going to allow us to create a new account. So inside of here, I'm going to say import and we're going to import use state from and then this is react. Then I am going to import a form and a button from and then react bootstrap. Then continuing down here, I want to set up some state for the different form entry points or form elements that I'm going to have. So I want to ask the user for a first name, a last name and a username. So I need state to store all three of those pieces of information. So I'm going to say const and we'll go with first name. And then why is my autocomplete giving me such weird things? I'm going to be set first name is equal to use state and this will be a string and then I'm going to say const and then last name and then set last name is equal to use state and then const username set username is equal to use state. All right, we'll use that state in a minute. Then we want to write the actual HTML of the page. So we're just going to set up a basic form. So I'm going to say form slash form like that. The class name for now will be empty, but we are going to add some CSS to make this centered on the screen. And I'll show you how we do that in a minute. And then inside of here, I'm going to say form dot group. I'm going to do a bunch of these groups uh, for each of the different elements that I have or inputs that I have. Now for the class name of these groups, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be MB4, which stands for margin bottom four, which just means we're going to space out our different form groups so that we have a margin at the bottom and they're not kind of squished directly together. Then I'm going to create a label. So I'm going to say form dot label. The first thing we'll ask for is the username and then we need a form dot control element, which is equivalent to an input element. OK, form dot control. And then for this, it's going to be type is equal to text. And then the placeholder is going to be username and then the on input function. We're going to call a function. Although let me fix the string here uh, and we'll write that function in a minute. Now I also realize I don't need to end the tag like that. I can just end it inside of here and I think that's going to be better. OK, so here, there we go. We have our first input here. Again, we have username. That's going to be the label for this here uh, and that's inside of a form group. OK, let's copy this two times because now we're going to have the same thing for first name and for last name. Remember, we're not going to do a password here. We're just going to allow them to create an account without any authentication and then sign in by just using the account name. Here, let's change this to be first name and let's change this to be last name. OK, I think that is all good. Now we want to set up the different functions as well as the button to submit the form. So outside of this form group here, I'm going to make a button. OK, this button will be our submit button. So the variant of the button is going to be primary. This is going to make a nice blue button. You also can use a variant like secondary. Uh, you also have danger and warning, I believe, which will give you kind of a red and yellow color. The type of this is going to be a button and then the on click is going to be a function again that we've yet to write. And then inside of here, we're just going to say create account for this button. Now I'll show you what the page looks like in a second, uh, but that is pretty much what we have for the HTML of the page. All right. So now we can add the different functions which are going to update the state for our respective input fields. And again, form.control is just equivalent to an input field, but it's going to give us a nice styled element. So what I'm going to do is make some functions here. I'm going to say function. We'll go with update username. This is going to take in E. Now E is going to give us what we actually typed into this input field. So what we're going to do is say set username and then this is going to be E dot target 
dot and then value. And that will give us exactly what they typed into this form control element. Now we can copy this function and just change the name of it to be uh, update and then first name. And then rather than set username, this is going to be set first name, then copy this one. And we'll do the same thing here for last name. So this will be update and then just change first here to be last and this to be last. OK, then I'm going to go inside of here and I'm just going to write the respective functions. So this is going to be update and then username. This is going to be update and then first name. And this is going to be update and you guessed it, last name. And then we need an on click here for this button. So let's just make a function. Uh, and is for some reason it's not showing that I'm calling this function. I probably just need to save the file. OK, that's fine for now. Yeah. OK, now it's good. Uh, but I want to go to function here and say on create or actually let's just call this create account. OK, we'll take an E here as well. For now, we're not going to do anything, but I'll just call it so we don't get an error in our uh, JSX here, which we're writing. OK, so create account, save. That should be all good now. Uh, I'm just going to open up my React application. Of course, I am running the NPM start command in my terminal. That's why I'm able to view this right now. And let's just go to not signed in. Uh, OK, it brings us to login. I want to go to the sign up page, actually. So sign hyphen up and then notice that we get this nice form. Now I want to put this in the center of the screen. Again, I'll show you how we do that in a second. But for now, we have username, first name and last name and then the button to create an account. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's code out the logic to actually press this button and have it make an account for us. And then once we do that, we can style the elements. All right, so let's come inside of here. And really what we need to do is just start coding out these different functions. Now, the only function we actually need to write here is going to be create account. And what we need to do is send a request to our back end, which can create the account for us. So before I can actually complete this, I need to write the uh, corresponding API endpoint in my back end. So let's go to API here. Let's go to index.js and we're going to write our very first route here that's going to be able to create an account for us. So what I'm going to do is write a post request here or write a post route, I guess, because when we're creating something, we're going to do that with the post method. So I'm going to say app dot post. And then for the URL here, this is going to be create and then user. I could write this in a different way, but I think that's fine for now. And then we need to accept a request and a response object. And then inside of here, we're going to write the function that we want to occur whenever we hit this endpoint. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get all of the data from the request body. So I'm going to say const and we'll go with body is equal to request dot body. This is how we can get all of the data, the JSON specifically that's sent to this post request. Now we're going to expect that we'll be sent a first name, a last name and a username. And then we'll send that information to actually a separate file to the API calls file, where then we will call the sanity API to create a new user. So again, this is really just a proxy that's going to be calling the appropriate functions that will then make the API calls to our sanity API and database. OK, so I'm going to write a function that we've yet to define, but it's called create user. And we're going to pass to this body dot and then first name body dot last name and then body dot username. And then we're going to say dot then because this will be a promise. We're going to take data and we're just going to say res dot JSON and then data. Now, what this does is simply return this data as a JSON as the response from this right here. So hopefully that makes sense, but that's all it's doing. We're going to call this function. It's going to return to us a promise. Once the promise resolves, we're going to get some data from it. So a result, and then we're going to return that data. So now that we've written this create user function, let's go to the API calls file. This is where we're going to interact with the database. So I want to write all of the functions that are using my sanity client inside of here. So the first thing I'm going to do is import the sanity client because this is how we're going to interact with the database, right? Using the client that we set up from client.js. And this is going to be from and then dot slash client.js. Then I'm going to say const functions is equal to and then this is going to be a, an empty object. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to put all of the things that I want to export from this file inside of functions and then just export this functions object. So to show you what I mean, I'm going to say functions dot create user. This is going to be equal to an arrow function. And this arrow function here is going to take in the first name, the last name and the username. Then inside of here, I'm going to use my sanity client. Uh, yes, I'm going to use it. I'm going to say return sanity client dot create. Now, doc create is how you create a new document. You can create any type of document using this command. And what you do is you pass an object of the document you want to make. 
So in this type, I uh, in this case, sorry, I put the type. So I'm going to say underscore type. And this is going to be user, the lowercase version. So the name of our database model, then we need to put in all of the fields that we want to complete. So I'm going to say first name is first name. Last underscore name is last name. Username is username and then created at is going to be new and date. OK, and that's actually all we need to create a new object in the database or a new document. Now, this is going to be a promise. So we're returning the promise, which then we can resolve from inside of index.js. So once this finishes, right, I call my dot, then I get the data. The data is just going to be the resulting object that we created. So it's going to give us the JSON of that object in the database. And then we'll return that here as the response from this route. So hopefully that makes sense. But just to mention here, I'm not filling in all of the fields for this user and I don't have to do that. And if I go to database and I look at my schemas and I look at user.js, you'll notice here that I'm just using the name field that I have, right? So first name, last name, username, but then I didn't fill in photo, bio or following. And when I don't do that, they'll just get the default value of this type. So again, empty array empty text and then an empty image, which is fine. We can fill that information in later on. We actually edit a user's profile. So that's it. This is how we create a user. Uh, now that we've done that, let's actually call this from the front end because we've set up really all we need in the back end. You're going to notice the back end will be fairly straightforward. We just re require it kind of for security here. So that again, we're not exposing our sanity API token on the front end. So inside of this create account function, what I want to do is send a request uh, and I want to send a request to our back end. Right. So what I'm going to do is start by setting up my request options. So I'm going to say const and then this is going to be request options and this is going to be equal to and then I need to make my method, which is going to be post and then I need to add some headers here. So for headers, I'm going to say inside of here the content type. OK is going to be and then this is going to be application slash JSON and this is content hyphen type. My apologies. Uh, that's all we actually need for the headers. And then for the body, this is going to be the data that we want to send. So we're going to pass JSON dot and then this is going to be stringify. OK, and we're going to stringify this object here. And this object is going to contain the first name as the first name key the last name as the last name key and then the username as the username key. OK, so that's what we need for our request options. We're going to use this inside of our fetch request. So now I'm going to say fetch and I'm going to say slash create and then user. OK, because this is the URL that we want to hit and then we're going to pass our request options. And for some reason, oh, I'm putting this inside of my request options. Oops, let's put this down here. OK, that should be better. So fetch, create user request options, and then we're going to say dot then. So whenever this response actually comes in, we're going to get our response, which will be underscore res. And all we will do here is write a little arrow function. And for the arrow function for right now, I'm just going to print out the response. So I'm going to say console dot log and then underscore res. And I'm actually going to do underscore res dot JSON just so we can see what the response was. And then we'll do a dot catch here. And for the dot catch, we'll catch an error and we will just console dot error and then whatever that error is. OK, now we will do something else here in a second. So we actually show an alert on the screen saying that you created the account and then we'll navigate you to the home page. Uh, but I just want to look and see if this is actually working. And for right now, we can test that by just printing out some stuff to the console. So my react app is open. So let's go to the console here and let's try to create a new account. So console uh, for the username, let's just go Tim for the first name. Let's go Tim for the last name. Let's go with my last name, which is Rasika. And OK, we got an issue here. So it says promise pending rejected uh, 500 internal server error. OK, so we're getting a few issues here. The first problem that I'm realizing is that I forgot to run my back end API. So what I'm going to do is open a new uh, console here. I'm actually going to split this terminal and inside of here. OK, let's make that a lot smaller. Let's go CD and let's CD to our API and then let's go NPM start. OK, that should fix that problem. Obviously, we need the back end running for us to be able to send a request to it. And then let's come back here and let's try this again. So I'm just going to press create account. And OK, again, we get 500 internal server error. So let's refresh this and try one more time. Tim, Tim, Rasika, 
create account. Okay, still getting there. So let me have a look at this and see what the issue is. All right, so I was just having a look at this error here and there's actually quite a few things that we did wrong. So first let's go to the API calls function uh, and let's export the functions, which I forgot to do. So export default functions, okay, which is this object right here. Then we're gonna go to index.js and we're actually going to import this because I can't call this create user function when I haven't imported it as I'm sure many of you already noticed. So I'm gonna say import, Let's spell import correctly. OK, functions from and then this is going to be dot slash API calls and then make sure you add the dot JS here. OK, now that we've done this, we want to get the individual function object from this functions object or the individual function from the functions object. So I'm going to say const and then I'm going to put inside of curly braces here. Create user is equal to and then functions like that. Now, I forget the exact syntactual name for what I'm doing here, uh, but I'm going to explain it as I'm breaking down this object into its individual components or individual fields. And so I'm able to get the create user function from it by just doing this. And if I add other functions later on, I can just write them out in this way. Uh, and yeah, that's how we're going to actually get access to the function. OK, so now we have access to this function here. Also on my front end, I'm going to go to sign up here. And I'm sure many of you already realize this. For our response, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to return uh, underscore res dot JSON because this is a promise to get the JSON. And then I'm going to say dot then. And also we can remove the underscore here and just have it res. And then I'm going to say data. And then I'm going to say console dot log. And I'm going to log the data. Uh, and what did I just do? I actually moved pages. OK, I don't even know how I just did that. Let's go back into sign up. OK, let's save that. And now we should be printing out the information that we need. OK, my apologies about that, guys. Let me rerun the API. So you are going to have to restart that. And now if I come here and I refresh, let's go Tim, Tim, Tim Rasika, create account and let's see what we get. And notice that we actually get this object and we have now created the account. Awesome. So we have created at ID, uh, rev type. We have a bunch of other stuff. We can look at all of the fields. We have username, created at type updated at all this stuff. Now what I'm going to do here is go to Sanity Studio and just make sure that object was created. So let's run one more terminal. Uh, I don't want to split it again, but I guess we'll have to. And let's CD into database and let's go Sanity Start. And now once this is compiled, I can go to the studio and can I, I can actually look at my uh, my new entry in the database. All right, so it is now compiled. So let's go to localhost uh, and then I want to go to three, 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 three. OK. Sandy Studio. Let's wait for this to load and let's see if we've created this new user and we can view it inside of here. So I'm going to go to user and we should see now that we have users. Now, the reason we had two is because I kind of messed up and I was messing around with this while I was trying to fix the error before. Anyways, the point is we now have the users that we created and let's say we want to delete one of them because in this case we have duplicate. What I can do is go here. I can click on this little down arrow and I can click delete and I can just delete the user like that. OK, but we do have the user and this is great for debugging. We can actually check to make sure everything was created. And for this user here, we have our first name, last name and then username. And then we could manually enter some other information if we want. Great. OK, so now that we've done that, I want to put this in the middle of the screen and I want to start adding some alerts on the screen that tells us, hey, you created the account successfully because we need some feedback to our user. Right. So let's move this down. I'm just going to hide that for now. We don't really need to rerun that. And let's now put this in the middle of the screen. So to do that, I'm going to go into CSS. I'm going to make a new file here and I'm going to call this signup.css. Then inside of signup, let's look at what classes we have. So for the form, I'm going to add a class name and this is going to be sign up and then form. So now we'll use this class name inside of our CSS file. But first, let's import the CSS file inside of here. So let's say import and then this is going to be dot dot slash and then CSS slash and then sign up dot CSS. OK, then we'll go to sign up dot CSS and we'll go dot sign up form and we'll write the custom CSS here to put it in the middle of the screen. So I'm going to use Flexbox to do this. So I'm going to say display and then flex. I'm going to say align items. This is going to be center. I'm going to say justify content. This is going to be center. Uh, sorry, this needs to be a regular colon, not a semicolon. Then we're going to say the flex direction is going to be column, which means all of our items will be aligned vertically. And then we're going to have height and this will be 100 percent just so we fill the entire screen. 
Okay, we, may, we might have to add some more CSS as well to make this work, uh, but for now that should do the job. So let's open up our app and notice now we are in the middle of the screen. Awesome. Now, the thing is, I want this to actually be dead center in the middle of the screen, not just aligned in the center uh, horizontally. So to get it to be dead center vertically, I actually need to extend the size of the root element or the root div of my HTML. So if I go here and look at the HTML, so I go elements, you can see that the body is only this high. So if I want this to be in the middle of the screen, what I need to do is make it so that this root div here takes up as much room as possible. And then once that's happening, this will automatically be pushed into the middle of the screen uh, because of the elements or because of the uh, CSS styling that I put here. All right. So to fix this problem, I actually need to write a few pieces of CSS uh, again, just to make it so that the root div is going to extend the entire size of the screen. And then all the other divs inside of that that's containing the main content of the page also extends the full size of the screen just so this goes in the middle. So I understand this might be a little bit confusing, but we're going to go to index.css. So inside of index.css, I'm just going to write some CSS here for the root. So hashtag root, which is the root div. I'm just going to make the height 100%. And then I'm going to make another class here and we'll use this in a second called fill parent. And I mean, this makes sense what it does, but it's going to fill its entire parent. And the way it's going to do this is by having a width of 100 percent. So let's do that. It's going to have a height of 100 percent. And let's add a semicolon, not a comma. I keep messing that up. And we're going to say the display here is flex. OK, and then the flex direction is going to be column so that everything we put in here is going to be aligned vertically because that's fill parent. While we're here, let's write another class that we're going to use later called center. So I'm going to say dot center. I'm going to say height. This is going to be 100 and then percent. We're going to say align items. This is going to be center. OK, we're going to say display and then flex. And then we're going to say flex direction and this will be column. OK, so we're using Flexbox uh, for all of this. Now I'm going to go to my app.js and here where we have an empty class name. I'm going to put fill parent. Now what this is going to do is make it so all of the content inside of here will fill the parent. So fill that root div. So we should expand it and take up the entire screen. We might have to add a little bit more CSS, but I think that should be good for now. So let's go here and let's just clear the cache and reset. And OK, we're not getting it in the middle of the screen. So let me have a look here and see what the problem is. All right, so I found the problem. Very simple fix here. We just need to go to body and we need to go height. And then this is going to be 100 VH, which stands for 100 vertical height. So just the entire width or sorry, the entire height of the screen, the viewport specifically. Uh, so this will now make it so the body has the max height, then the root will have the max height and then the div that we have will have the maximum height as well. And so we should get this centered in the screen. Fingers crossed. Let's go here and notice that we now have this right in the middle of the screen, which is what I wanted. OK, now I, I understand the CSS is probably not as good as it could be. I'm not a CSS master. Again, I'm not focusing too much on styling, uh, but now to get everything in the center of the screen should be pretty straightforward. OK, so let's try this one more time. Let's make an account here. Let's say Joey. Let's go with Joe and Smith, maybe Joey one, two, three, create account. Let's go to console and notice it creates. So now what we want to do is we want to navigate to another page and then give some feedback to the user. So we can start with kind of an alert for the user. And to do that, I'm going to go to this alert dismissible component and we're going to start coding this out and then we'll use this inside of our app component and we'll have kind of one simple way to trigger alerts from the main app component. And I'll show you how we do that. For now, though, what I want to do is import a few things. So I'm going to go and say import and then this is going to be use state and this will be from and then react. And then I'm going to import the alert component and this will be from react bootstrap. So from react and then bootstrap like that. OK, now inside of here, we need a piece of state. So for the state, we're going to say const and then this is going to be show set show. And this just tells us if we're currently showing the alert because the alert will have a button that allows us to close it. So by default, this will be true, but we could make it false. And we also want to accept three props here to this component. We want to accept a message, a variant and a delete alert function. Uh, so when the alert is deleted, we will call this function. That's kind of a callback, right? The message is the message we want to show. And then the variant is well, the variant for the alerts so that it's very dynamic and we can show a, uh, a bunch of different things. So here I'm going to say if show, then I will return something. Otherwise, though, 
then what I will do is just return null because we're not going to show anything if we're not showing the alert, right? So if we are showing something, then I'm going to return an alert component. So I'm going to say alert and then alert like that. And yeah, we can end it like that. That's fine. Inside of here, we're going to put the message for the alert. And then for the variant, this is going to be equal to the variant. OK, and then we want to have an on close and the on close is when we click that little button. Right. And what we'll do here is we will have an arrow function. And this arrow function will simply call delete alert, but it's also going to call set show uh, and it's going to make this false. OK, so let's put our curly braces here and then let me explain exactly what we're doing. OK, come on, give me uh, some autocomplete. What's wrong with this? I could not find matching tag. Oh, I need a lowercase on the L. OK, and then I want to add something to the end here, which is dismissible. And this will just be true. Now, when we put this in, we don't have to manually say true, but this makes it so we can dismiss the alert. All right. So that's actually all we need for this component. So we have a piece of state telling us if we are showing the component or not. So if we set this to false, then we're not going to render the alert. Uh, but if it's true, then we will be rendering the alert. Right. And then for the variants, that's whatever variants they pass in. There's a few different options. Like I think we have success warning. Uh, we may have danger. There's a bunch of them. I'll go through them later. On close means when we click the little dismissible button for the alert, then what we're going to do is delete the alert. So we're just calling this delete alert callback function and then we're going to call set show. And what set show will do is make this false, right? It's just changing the state. So then we'll no longer render the alert. And then inside of the alert, the message will show is whatever message they pass to this component. OK, so now that we have alert dismissible, I want to go inside of my app component and I'm going to use some state inside of here for the alert. So we'll make it so you can have one alert at a time. So we're going to say const like this and then this is going to be alert and then set alert and this will be equal to use state and then inside of here the state is actually going to be null and we'll have an object that is stored inside of here that will give us the variant as well as the message for an alert and i'll show you how we trigger that so now what i want to do is dynamically render this alert underneath the nav bar if we do have one so i'm going to write some jsx here and i'm going to say alert question mark and then if we do have an alert, then I'm going to say, OK, I want to render this alert dismissible component. OK, come on. Autocomplete, give it to me alert dismissible. Nice. OK, I want to render this component and what I need to pass to it is my alert. So I'm going to say dot 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 alert. OK, and then I want to pass a callback function for delete alert. And what the delete alert callback is going to do is just going to be an arrow function that is simply going to call set alert. And it's going to set it equal to no. OK, I believe that's all we need. So if we have an alert, we're going to show this. Otherwise, we just won't show anything. So we'll have no. OK, hopefully that makes sense. If alert is not no, render this component dot 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 alert is going to again decompose it, kind of break down the alert object. The alert object is going to have the variant as well as the message. And then we will delete the alert and the delete alert function is just this, which is going to set the alert here to be null, so then we'll no longer render this alert component. OK, so now how do we actually trigger an alert to be shown? Well, I need to pass the set alert function here to uh, the props of, in this case, the sign up page, and then it can use that function to change the state in the app component, which will then show the alert. So if I go to sign up and I say set alert is equal to and then set alert like that, then we're able to actually now call this function from inside of there. So let's now go to sign up. And let's see if we can use this. So instead of sign up in the props, I'm going to take set alert. OK, and I keep typing an uppercase L it needs to be lowercase. And then here, when we get our data, what we will do is we'll say set alert and the alert is going to have a variant of this will be success. This is going to be a green alert. And then the message is going to be account created. So we'll say your account has been created. Thank you very much. Autocomplete. And what is wrong here? Am I missing a bracket or something? Uh, OK, let's put that there. Um, set alert. Oh, I need to get rid of this semicolon. Sorry. OK, and I think that should fix it. Nice. OK, so now we are setting an alert once we get the data. And just so this doesn't give us an error, we'll do underscore data like that. All right. The next thing we need to do is navigate to the home page. So to navigate to the home page, I'm going to import a hook here. So I'm going to say import and then this is going to be use navigate. 
and this is from and this is going to be react router dom now this is only in react router version 6 and above uh, so if you're using version 5 although i don't know why you would be then this is not going to work i would just make sure you're using version 6 okay then what i'm going to do here is say const navigate is equal to use navigate and what use navigate allows me to do is navigate between different pages and go to a specific route so now what we'll do is after we set the alert we'll say navigate and we'll just navigate to whatever page you want to go to which in this case is just going to be slash although i just need to add some curly braces here so that we can have multiple statements being executed at the same time let's add a semicolon and now i believe we are good okay so we're going to set the alert we're going to navigate so now we can test this out by creating another account and see if it navigates us back to the home page so let's go here to react let's refresh let's just go test underscore account let's go test and then account and then create account and let's see okay your account has been created and then it navigates us over to the other page and if i hit the x button it closes the alert awesome we now have a way to create alerts we now know how to navigate and now what i want to do is make it so this little banner here tells us if we're signed in or not because after i create a new account i should just automatically be signed into it so how am i going to do that well from my app component here i'm going to make a piece of state i'm going to say const this is going to be user and then i'm going to say set user and this is going to be equal to use state and this is just going to be a string now this is going to be the name of the user that's currently logged in and we're just going to store that in the app component this is not the best way and if you're doing real authentication you do this in a different way but for now we'll just store the user here in the app component as a piece of state and that way we know if we're signed in and then we can check and render something different here uh, for this navbar text so if we are signed in so if we have a user then we're not going to render not signed in we're going to say you know signed in as whatever and then give kind of a link to go to that user's profile so in fact let's do that now so here what i'm going to write is user question mark checking if we're signed in or not and if we are signed in then i'm going to say navbar dot text okay and then for the text i'm going to say signed in as and then we'll put a link and this link is going to go to so two equals and then this is going to be slash profile slash but then we're going to add whatever the current user is because to get to the user's profile well it's profile plus and then the username and then we will have inside of here the name of the user okay uh, nice I think that's good for now and then we need to just have an option here where if they're not signed in then we're going to show this so we're going to copy that paste that here and now this is what we have so if we're signed in we show this otherwise we show this however if we're signed in we also want to show a button so the button will be inside of the navbar text as well so we'll say button okay the type is going to be button the variant is going to be primary okay and then we'll have an on click and what the on click is going to do is it's just going to set the user to be false so we're going to say this is an arrow function and this will be set user and we just set this to an empty string and then here the text on the button will be log out uh, and i think that's all we need although we also want to make it so that there is an alert that goes on the screen when we are signed out so we'll put our curly braces here and then we will set the user to be an empty string and after we set the user to be an empty string we're going to set an alert and we're going to say set alert we need to pass a variant the variant will be warning which will give us kind of a yellow one and then the message will say uh, you are now signed out okay so you are now signed out exclamation point okay so we can test this out now again feel free to pause the video and copy this or reference the code from the link in the description but when I go here and I refresh the page and I go to sign in uh let's create an account uh sorry not signed in is bringing me to login page I need to go to the sign up page so sign up page okay so let's make an account let's go with Tim one two three four Tim is great okay create account and then it says your account has been created brings us here and this is not changing okay I need to check why this is not changing uh, because that should have changed so now we're actually seeing the user that's signed in ah well the reason that is not changing is because I forgot to manually change it from sign up I have not actually set the user which is what I need to do so what we're going to do is in sign up here we're going to take another prop called set user and then after we navigate or actually before we navigate we're going to say set user and we're going to set this equal to whatever the username was so I can look at the data and actually I'll remove the underscore now because we're going to use it 
and I'll just get data dot and then username. And that's what I'll set the user to because, well, that's the username that the user just signed up with. Now, though, I need to pass the prop to sign up. So I'm going to go here to where I'm rendering sign up and I'm going to say set user is equal to set user. OK, so now this should work again. My apologies about that error. Let's go and fix this. OK, so open this up. Let's just give it a refresh. Let's go to the sign up page. OK, sign up and we'll make an account. Tim, one, two, three, four, five. Tim is great. Let's fix the capitalization. OK, create account. And now notice that we get signed in as Tim1234 and then we have the option to log out. Now I'll show you how we can add a little spacer between those, uh, but we need to make it so that we hit the logout button, it signs out, which is what it did. Okay, I forgot that I actually already implemented that. So that is all good. That is working. Okay, next we'll do the sign in page. However, let's just add that little spacer between the logout button just so that it uh, looks a bit nicer. So here we have signed in as. What I'm going to do is just put some JSX and inside of the JSX, I'm just going to put an empty string. I'm going to put a little bar here. Now, I know this looks a bit weird, but it's just going to be a bar and then an empty string. So we just have kind of a little spacer uh, as well as this pipe. Now, I don't know if I actually even need the empty string, but I think that should make it so it spaces out a little bit more. Uh, but let's have a look at this now if we create a new account. So again, I have to make so many accounts. It'll be nicer when we can just uh, just sign in. Sorry, not create post, create user or what am I doing? Sign up. OK, let's go to not see sign up, just regular sign up. OK, and let's go Joe, Joey, one, two, three, four, five. Very creative. Joey Smith. Don't really care about the spelling right now. We're just trying to test this. And OK, there we go. Now we have a little spacer between the logout button and between signed in as. And when I click on this, it brings me to this profile page. OK, now we log out and it signs us up. Nice. Now let's do the sign up page. It's going to be very similar. Or sorry, let's do the login page. It's going to be very similar to the sign up page. So let's close this. Let's close this. Let's go to login and let's start coding this out. So similarly to the uh, sign up page, I need to import use state. So I'm going to import use state from and then this will be react. And then I need to import a few things here from bootstrap. Specifically, I need to import the form and the button. So I'm going to say import form button from and then this will be react and then bootstrap. OK, so let's go bootstrap like that. And then I'm going to say import and then we will import use navigate as well as link. And then this is going to be from react router and then hyphen DOM. OK, nice. Now inside of here, we can code out our state to start. So I'm going to say const and then this is going to be username set username is equal to use state. This will simply be a string. And then we're going to say const navigate is equal to use navigate. We're going to use this so that when we sign in, we can be redirected to the home page. OK, now that we have that, let's write our login form. This will be a little bit simpler than the other one because we only need a username attribute here or username input field. So I'm going to say form form. The class name is going to be equal to and this actually needs to be the exact same class that we had for sign up so that we go in the middle. So really what I can do here is I can just take this class and I can paste this inside of index.css and rather than calling it sign up form, I can just call this center form. And now I can just use this inside of any of my form tags. Really, I could use it for any div as well, and it should just put it in the center of the screen. So let's just make a change quickly here. Let's put this center form and then inside of sign up, let's change it so that rather than using the class name of sign up form, we're using center form because they're going to be the same. And then we can no longer import sign up. And I can remove the class from here because I don't need that anymore. And if we add any more uh, CSS in the future, we put it in that file. OK, uh, that should be good. Let's go to login. So we have our center form. Now we need our form dot group. OK, so let's add the group uh, for the class name of this. We're going to say class name equals and then margin bottom. And then this will be three. I believe the other one we did four, but let's just go with three. Let's change it up for this one. We'll go form dot label. And then we're going to say the label is username. And then we want a form dot control, which again is equivalent to the input tag. OK, for the form dot control, we're going to say type is equal to text. We are going to say the placeholder is equal to username. 
we don't need a class name, but we do need an on input. So on input here will be equal to an arrow function. We could write a uh, custom function as well, but this will just take in E and then we can say set username E dot target dot value. Now we could have done this before in sign up, but we've already finished that. So we don't need to change it now. We have type placeholder and then we have our on inputs. Now we'll get what you type in. Now that we have this, I just want to add something that says uh, how to get to the sign up page, because right now we have to manually go to that link. So here I'll do something like if you don't have an account, then click on this to go to the sign up page. Right. We've seen that before on uh, on sign up forms. So I'm going to say small. This will just give us some smaller text and then the ID. Actually, we don't need an ID, but the class name of this will be equal to form text and then text muted. This just makes it so it's a bit grayed out and it's not uh, as strong as the standard text. I'm going to say don't have an account question mark sign up and then we'll put a link inside of here. OK, and we'll say here now for the link, I'm just going to say two is equal to and then this is going to be sign up and I think that should be good for that. OK, now that we've done that, let's add a button. So the button is going to go outside of the form group, so it gets spaced out a bit. We're going to say variant is equal to primary. You get a nice blue button for the type. We will just say that this is going to be a button and then I'm going to say on click is equal to and then the on click function will need to write and we'll do that in a second. And here I will say sign in or actually let's just go with login. All right. So now let's write the function for handling the login. So I'm going to say function handle login. OK inside of here, we're going to have a fetch uh, and we need to write that back in endpoint. So for right now, we can just say console dot log the username and then we'll finish this later. But for the on click, we can just write handle login and we do need to take an E even if we don't use it because it will pass E to that function implicitly. All right. So now we have the login page. Sorry, not export. This is E. OK, uh, and what's the issue here? It's saying export is no. OK, no, it's because it's still reading the previous one. It hasn't seen that I changed this to E. Anyways, now we have login. So let's just go to the login page and see what it looks like. OK, so there we go. We can see we get our nice login page. I just had to refresh this so everything is working fine. And then if I click on sign up, OK, that is a bit weird. It's bringing us to login slash sign up. The reason for that is I need to add a slash here. OK, apologies about that. Let's refresh the page. Let's go back to login. OK, let's click this now and then it brings us to the sign up page. Nice. So we can click this to get to login. OK, awesome. So now we actually want to log in, which requires that we have an account. So now we need to write the back end that actually will check if the account exists for the user we're trying to sign in as and then essentially return to us the account data for that. So let's go to our back end here. So let's close a few of these files that we don't need. Let's go to index.js and now let's write the root. All right, so here I'm going to write app dot get because it's going to be a get request and this is going to be, I guess, get profile uh, and we will say uh, request and then response. This will be an arrow function and then inside of here, I'm going to accept a query parameter, which is going to tell me the user that I want to get the profile for. So I'm going to say const user is equal to request dot query, which is the query parameters dot and then user and then I'm going to send a request here to get profile. So I'm going to say get profile user dot then and then this is going to be inside of here data and we're going to say res dot JSON and we're going to return that data. OK, so now we need to write this get profile function from API calls. So first of all, let's just import it so we don't get the error we got before and let's go to API calls and now write get profile. So here I'm going to say functions dot and then this is going to be get profile. This is going to be an arrow function. This arrow function is going to take in the user. And then what we're going to do is say return sanity client and then not get this is going to be dot fetch. And what dot fetch actually accepts inside of here is a string, which is going to be the query that we want uh, to get. OK, so the query language that we're going to use inside of here is something called grok G R O Q. Now that is graph relational object queries, and I'm just going to write them out here. I'll leave some documentation in the description that explains exactly how to write them. Uh, but it would be a very, very long video if I went through explaining every aspect of the query language. So you'll start to understand once I give you an example. I uh, would just bear with me here because it will look a little bit confusing right now. So we're going to put an asterisk 
we're going to put our square brackets here. And the first thing we're going to do is define the type of the document that we want to query from the database. So in this case, the type that I want is a user. And I just need to single quote this uh, just so that my quotes don't get all messed up here. OK, so we have our single quotes. We have our type, which is equal to a user inside of double quotes. And I'm going to say and 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 then username is equal to. And then this is going to be uh, the dollar sign and then username, because this will be a variable that I input in a second. In fact, I can just do user like that. So what I've just written here is essentially the condition for this query. So I'm saying, OK, I want to get all documents that are of type user and have a username that's equal to the username that I pass right here. So that's just going to give me a single document. At least that's what I hope for. And then what I do after this is I define all of the fields on this document that I'd like to receive. So I actually need to put this inside of back ticks just so that we can have this string extend onto multiple lines. And inside of here, uh, what I'm going to write is all the fields that I want. So I'm going to write dot dot dot. Now, what this does is it's going to give me every single field. That's that's what dot 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 does. OK, then I can write. Then what I can do is write my own custom fields in here and kind of modify the fields uh, to get some certain attributes that I'm looking for. So a field that I want is following. I want to know how many users this person is following. So I actually don't care about the following list. I don't want to know the individual users. I just want to know the count of how many people this person's following because we're going to use this for a few other things as well, not just for getting the uh, the username of the user or checking if a user exists. Right. So I'm going to use the count function and I'm going to count how many elements are in the following array of the users following field. OK. That's what count is doing, just tells us how many are there. And then it's going to put it into a field called following. So this will essentially override the current following field and give us just the number of people the users following. Then I'm going to say followers. And this is a bit more difficult. What I need to do for this is another query. And I'm going to say type is equal to. And then this is going to be user. And I'm going to say and and references. And then I'm going to use the I believe it's called a hat operator or the carrot. Uh, someone can correct me in the comments on exactly what this symbol is. And then dot underscore ID. Now what this references here uh, or what this story is weird because it says references. But what this refers to is the ID of whatever this user is. OK, so whatever user I get here from this query or whatever users I get from this query, this is referencing that user. And so when I'm saying I want to get all the fields, I want to get the following and then I want to get followers. For the followers, I need to find a user that references the current user that I'm on and then add that to a list here. Again, I know this is a little bit weird, but that's kind of what this query is doing. It's going to give me a list of all of the users that reference the current user that I'm receiving. And so that will tell me all of the people that are following this user. OK, hopefully that is clear. And then next I'm going to say photo. And since the photo gives us a few different attributes, I need to say photo asset arrow like this. And then I'm going to break this into an underscore ID and a URL. So a photo in sanity is kind of a nested object. It gives us an asset. It also gives us a few other things as well. And this asset, what I need to do is kind of break it down into an ID and to a URL. So I'm saying, OK, for the photo, the aspect of the photo that I want to get is the asset. And then from the asset, I want to get the ID and I want to get the URL. And so I have to write that in this way. OK. That's just how you get the IT and the URL of the asset of the photo. The URL is what we use to actually render the photo and it will be hosted by Sanity. We don't need to download the photo or anything like that. OK, so that is this first query. Again, I know it's a bit confusing. Please reference the documentation if you want more explanation. But hopefully you can at least understand the basics of what's going on here. Uh, and I think I can put this on another line. and It'll make it a little bit easier to read. Let's just indent all of this uh, by one. All right, so now that we have this, we should actually just be able to use the backend endpoint that we wrote, and it should return to us information about the user that we passed here to get the profile from. Again, we're going to use this in multiple places. That's why I wrote all of these other aspects of the query. If we just wanted to see if a user existed, uh, then we really could just have dot 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 in here, and that would just return all of the fields related to the user. So index, we wrote this as get profile, and we're accepting a query parameter. So when I go to login now, Inside of here, I'm going to send a fetch request that's going to contain a query parameter. So what we'll do is say fetch and then fetch is going to be slash get profile. OK, and then we're going to say question mark user is equal to and then I can do a concatenation if I want. I'll just say plus and then this is going to be username right here. OK, so whatever they entered into the field. 
then I'm going to say dot then I'm going to get my response. I'm going to return my response dot JSON and then I'm going to say dot then and I'm going to say data and I'm going to look at the data and do something inside of here. So for the data, what I need to check is if the length of the data is greater than zero. Now, what that means is that I actually do have a user because I'm going to re be returned a list from sanity of all of the things that match that query. So if I go back here, this will give me a list of everything that has a username that matches with this. So theoretically, if I had multiple users with the same username, which we're not going to allow, but if we did have that, I would get all of the users that had that username, right? Because it's giving me a list of all of the results. So even though this will only give me one result, Sanity doesn't know that. So by default, it returns to me a list or an array. And so what I have to do is look in that list and see if we have at least one element. If we do, that means the user exists. If we don't, that means the user does not exist. And then we have to grab the first element out of this array and use that to access the different fields. So I'm going to say if the data dot length is greater than zero, we need to put this inside of parentheses here. Then what we can do is say add alert. OK, we're going to have to take add alert in here. So let's say add alert. We also want to take in set user. So we'll pass that from our app in one second. But the alert that we want to add is going to have a variant of success. OK, and it's going to have a message of successfully logged in exclamation point. OK, so that's what we need for the add alert. Then we're going to say set user. We're going to set this. Sorry, let's go to set user to be the data zero dot username. And we know we can do this because we'll have at least one element in our data, right? So data dot zero data zero, sorry, dot username. And then we are going to navigate to the home page. OK, so we're just going to navigate to slash. All right. Now, otherwise, what we will do is just set an alert saying that there's no user with that name. So we're going to say add alert. OK, this is going to have a variant which is equal to and this will be danger, which is going to be red. Apparently, I can't type very well today. And then we're going to have a message that says no user with that name exists. OK, let's fix our capitalization. All right, we'll do an exclamation point as well. OK, so that's what we have for handle login. And then we'll just have a catch here just in case something goes wrong. And we'll have an error and we'll just display that error as an alert. So I'm just going to say add alert. OK, variance danger message will be error and then error dot message. Nice. OK, so I think that's all we need for the login. Let's see if this works now and if it actually logs us in and brings us back to the home page. So let's go here. Let's refresh. We actually need to rerun our API because we've now changed one of the uh, what do you call it? one of the functions in there. So let's end that. Let's rerun npm start. OK, it looks like that's working successfully. All right, so let's attempt this from our front ends. Let's give a refresh. Let's type in Tim and log in. And it doesn't seem to be working. We're not actually getting anything here. And OK, so we're getting a crash from our back end. And let me go and have a read here and see what it's saying. Uh, OK, param username reference, but not provided. OK, so this is from our Sandy client. So let's go to our API calls. And what I need to do is just fix this so that user is going to go inside of uh, squ uh, squiggly brackets. Sorry, kind of forgot that I need to do that since we can pass multiple parameters. They need to be inside of a JavaScript object. And so I can just write user like that. And I think that will fix the problem for us. So let's try this now. Let's rerun the API. So yes, we want to end that. Let's rerun. OK, and now let's come here. Let's refresh and let's go. Tim, let's hit log in. And OK, again, we got another error. So what's the error this time? Is it saying the same thing? Uh, param username reference but not provided. OK, so the issue here is that user does not match with username. So what I can do is make this username colon. And now hopefully that should fix the problem. So let's rerun this again. My apologies, guys. Whenever you're working on a large project, you are going to get tons of errors. I like to keep them in just to be real with you that uh, not everything is perfect. Anyways, let's restart this. So let's refresh. Let's go here with Tim. Let's hit log in. And we got add alert is not a function. OK, nice. So we can fix that problem now. But that means that the sanity, uh, what is it, query that we had didn't fail. So at least we're getting an error on the front end here, not on the back end. We're not seeing anything inside of our index.js or inside of our back end. 
So let's go to login or actually let's go to app. And the fix to this is we need to pass our set alert and set user to the login component. So if we paste that in here, that now should fix the problem because remember in our uh, what is it? What do you call these again? Props. We have add alert and set user, but we weren't passing them. So of course those were not defined and we were getting a problem. So let's try this now. Let's refresh. Let's go Tim. Let's go log in and uncaught add alert is not a function. All right. So it looks like the error is that I have add alert as opposed to set alert. My apologies here. This needs to be set alert, not add alert. So let's change all of these to be set. And now that should fix the problem again. My apologies. Let's refresh. Let's go, Tim. Let's go log in. And there we go. Successfully logged in, signed in as Tim. Nice. OK, let's log out. Let's go to sign in. Let's close that. Let's try to sign in as an account that doesn't exist like H and then no user with that name exists. Nice. OK, so that's working. Let's go with Tim log in and then it signs us in. All right. So we now have signing in, signing out and signing up completed. The next thing that I guess we can work on is searching for users. Uh, then we can start looking at the profile, creating posts. In fact, before we do that, let's actually deal with creating posts and uploading files. Uh, and then once that's done, we can kind of move on to some other features. Doesn't really matter the order that we go in at this point. So to create a post, we obviously need the HTML for that page as well as that component. So let's start with that. We're going to go to create post and we're going to import a few things. So I'm going to say import and let's import if we can type here, use state and use effect. This will be from and then react and then continuing. We're going to import just like before in the other pages, a button as well as a form from and then this will be react bootstrap. And I'm also going to import use navigate. So I'm going to say import use navigate from and then this will be uh, react router and then done. OK, now that we have that, let's set up the state that we're going to need. So when we create a post, we're going to have a caption for that post as well as a file. Uh, the file will be an image, right? So we're going to say const. This will be caption is going to be set caption. This will be equal to use state and then that's a string. Then we're going to have const and this will be file and then we'll have set file. Really, this will just be the image. But for now, we can call it file and this will be use state. We'll just go with an empty string because we're going to store the path to the file and then we're going to have const navigate. If we spell it correctly is equal to use navigate. OK. Now I'm going to add a use effect here, which is going to run as soon as the component is rendered. And what this function is going to do is just make sure that we're currently signed in. So I'm going to ask that we're passed here a user as well as the add alert function. And it's not going to be add alert. It's going to be set alert. I don't want to make that mistake twice. And the user we're going to check here and see if we have a user. So if we don't have a user, if it's an empty string, that means we're not signed in. And well, we can't make a post if we're not signed in. So I'm going to add an alert to the screen or set the alert saying, hey, you can't uh, do this because you're not signed in. And then we'll bring you over to the login page. So I'm going to say if not user, then we will set an alert. And for the alert, we're going to have a variant of warning. Uh, I mean, we could do warning. We could do danger. Let's actually do danger. I think danger makes more sense. And then we'll go with message and we'll say, please sign in to make a post exclamation point. OK, and then what we're going to do is navigate them. So I'm going to say navigate and we'll navigate to slash login. And I think that's good for that. And then here we want to rerun this effect whenever the user changes. OK, so that's what we need for use effect. Now let's do the HTML of the page. So I am going to return. So let's render a form inside of here. So let's go form for the class name. Right now we can go with center form and then inside of the form, we're going to need a file upload. Uh, so that's what we'll put in our first form group. And then we're going to need a button. Uh, we're going to need a few other things as well. So I'm going to put a form dot group and then slash form dot group a for the class. We'll go with margin bottom three. So class name is equal to M B and then three. OK, uh, I think that's fine for now. 
inside of here the first thing that we'll do is have an image tag now the image tag is just going to show us the image that we currently have uploaded so i'll say image src is going to be equal to file question mark if we do have a file then we're going to say url dot and then create object and then url and that's going to be for our file otherwise we're going to say no and then we're going to have class name which is equal to upload image and i'm going to write that class later okay so that's going to be our image tag again this is going to display the current image that we have uploaded if we've uploaded an image so if we do have a file we're going to get the url for that file uh, you don't have to wonder too much about what this is doing but essentially just allows us to directly reference this file and display it as the source for the image and then we're going to have another form group that we need so let's copy this for this next form group inside of here we will have the file upload so i'm just going to put an input tag let's end it like that and then we'll say type is equal to file we will say accept and then this is going to be equal to and image and then that will be slash and then an asterisk and then let's put our quotation mark and then we're going to say on change and we can make this call a function so for the function let's actually just write it right now let's say function upload file let's take e and then we will take inside of here or we will call sorry the upload file function okay i think that's all we need for the image upload the next thing that we're going to need is the caption so i'm going to say form dot group okay then we're going to have our form dot and this will be control and this will just be the caption so i will say type is equal to text we will do placeholder equal to caption we can actually just do something like enter a caption and then we'll have an on input and the on input will be equal to and we will do an arrow function inside of here that accepts e and then we will simply update our caption so we'll say set caption e dot target dot value and let's fix control so we have the proper capitalization okay other than that we want a button uh why is that highlighting in red okay i think that's fine um yeah that's looks fine to me right now actually let's end the tag like this sorry and then that should hopefully fix our problem for us okay there we go so now we want to have a div I'm going to say div class name is equal to and then this is going to be post button and then wrapper I'll show you why we need this in a second but we're going to add some styling uh, to this div just to put the button in a certain location and then I'm going to say button and inside of here we'll say variant is equal to primary and then we will go with type equal to button and then we'll have on not submit but on click is going to be equal to and we will call a function that we've yet to call yet to write sorry so this function will be function and we'll say make post like that okay so let's put make post here and then inside of the button we will just make this say post okay i think that's all we need for now let's have a look at the create post page and just see what we're getting and then we'll complete the rest of this because obviously it's not fully finished okay so we're getting an error here it says set alert is not a function okay i need to remember to pass these two things as props to this from app so let's go to app.js let's go to create post let's say user is equal to user and let's say not add alert but set alert is equal to set alert and then what the heck is this uh the path is fine okay let's just write it up because it gave me this weird autocomplete here so this will be set alert is equal to set alert okay now let's try this and please sign in to make a post nice okay so let's sign in as tim let's log in it's going to take a second okay let's go to post and then we have our file we have our caption and we have our post and i'll have to fix this again because you're noticing that you know the post button's kind of weird the caption should probably be larger the file input isn't lined up uh, so we'll fix all of that in one minute we also want to have kind of a default image for the uh the image right like that we have here so we can see something showing up even if there's not something there let me just refresh again here and see if we're getting any errors okay so let's go tim log in 
and it looks like if we go to post, we are all good. Okay, so let's handle the styling and making things look a little bit uh, nicer now. All right, so I need to add a few classes here as well as a few divs in create post. So the first thing I'm for my button here, I'm going to say class name is equal to post button. Okay, then I'm going to add a div that's going to surround all of this. So we're going to say div class name is equal to and then I guess we'll just go with post or actually let's just go with create post. Okay, let's take that div and let's surround everything inside of here. All right. Again, I'll explain all the CSS in a minute. And then we need a few other uh, class names. So for our image, let's add a class name. Let's say class name is equal to post image. I believe that is fine. OK, so now that we have all of these classes, let's make a custom CSS file. Let me just close some of this so it's not clogging up my uh, left hand side. So let's make a new CSS file. Let's call this create post.css. We can then import it inside of here. So we're going to say import and then this will be dot dot slash CSS slash create post dot CSS. OK, now let's go to create post and let's write the different classes that we need. So the first class that I want to write here is going to be create post. So let's just write this out and then we can see exactly what's going to happen. So I want to set the min width to be 30 percent of the parent. I then want to say the display is flex. I want to say the flex direction is going to be column. OK, just so we have a flex box. All of the elements inside of that div will now be a flex item. And then we're going to have margin hyphen top. And this is going to be equal to 2 em. 2EM is going to be whatever the default font size is, I believe, of the browser multiplied by two. OK, so that's margin top just to give us a bit of spacing from the top of the screen. I then I'm going to have my post button and then wrapper. So this is the div that's wrapping that button. And this is going to allow me to actually center the button. So I'm going to say display. This is going to be flex. And then I'm going to say align items. And this is going to be center. And then I'm going to justify the content in the center as well. All right. So now that we have that for post button wrapper, we're going to do our post button. I just want to make it larger. So I'm going to say post button width and then 100 percent. So we'll take up 100 percent of its parent. And then I want my upload image. So let's go upload image or actually it's not upload image. It's post image to have a width and a height. So I'm going to say width is equal to 300 pixels and height is equal to 300 pixels just so it takes up some room on the screen and we should see something now. OK, so now that we've added this CSS, let's go here and let's sign in. So let's go, Tim. OK, uh, let's go to post. OK, so that looks a little bit weird. The issue that's happening here is I'm spacing everything out and taking up the entire height of the screen, which I don't necessarily want to do. So I'm going to need to fix this slightly. And the way I'm going to fix this is by actually creating a new uh, class name here. So rather than center form, I'm going to have post form. And let's now go here and write the post form class. So I'm going to say dot post form and we'll do something similar to what we had for center form, but we're just not going to take up the entire height. So I'm going to say display. This will be flex. We're then going to go align items and this will be center. And then I want to have justify content. This will be center. And then I want to have the flex direction and this will be column. OK, so let's see this now. And OK, I got to sign in. So let's go, Tim, log in. Let's go post and close, uh, although the image, it's still a little bit weird, right? It looks like this input tag is going above the image. I don't know why that's the case. So let me have a quick look here and I'll be right back. All right. So I'm just having a look here and I made a few kind of silly mistakes. So first of all, I added a post image class to this input tag, which was not expected. And I also realized that I named this upload when it should be post to match with what we have here, right? Post image and now post image. So now we'll have it a width and a height. I also realized that for this form, I forgot the class name equal to margin bottom three. And I believe now with those fixes, we should actually be good. So let me have a look at this now. And that looks much better. OK, everything is aligned. So just quickly looking at the CSS, uh, what we did uh, is we made it so that our post form has a display flex. Everything is aligned in the center, so horizontally and vertically. 
and then the direction is column, meaning that we're having everything aligned vertically, right? Then we have create post. So for create post, I just wanted to make the minimum width of everything 30%. So that way we're going to take up a certain amount of size on the screen no matter what. Then I have display flex, flex direction column, and the margin top is this right here. So it's making it so we're not directly squished to the top of the screen. Uh, we have some padding between the other diff. So that's what we're doing there or I guess a margin padding, whatever, you know what I mean? And then we have post button wrapper, display flex, align item center, and then justify content center. This uh, pushes our button into the center of its container because it wouldn't have been directly in the center before. And then we have post button with 100% just to make it take up the entire width of its container, which will be 30% of the width of the div because this div, the create post div is gonna be 30% of the entire screen. So it will be 100% of this div, right? Hopefully that makes sense. And then post image, we're just giving it a width and height of 300. We could do percentages, but I think this is fine. And then you'll see if we resize the screen, uh, everything actually looks all right. And we can, you know, kind of move it around and it's all good. And in fact, maybe we want to just make the image uh, have a width equal to 100% and a height equal to 100%. Uh, although height, I guess I can't really do. I could do height 300 width maximum, and then that way it will uh, expand. Although I'm not super fussed with the CSS for now. So honestly, let's just leave it and you guys can mess around with that if you want. Okay, so that is uh, most of the styling for create post. Now, of course, we want to actually be able to make a post and we need to be able to upload a file. Now, uploading a file is going to be a bit more complicated, but inside of here, what I can do for upload file is say set and then file like this. And it's going to be E dot target dot and then files and then zero because we're only uploading one file. Okay, so that's what we'll do. We could also put this in arrow function, but I think it's fine just to leave it here. It doesn't really matter. And now for make post, we want to write this. But before we can do that, we need to be able to handle this on the back end. So let's go to index.js and let's start writing it now so that we can actually accept a file upload as well as the caption and the user that's making this post. And then we can create a new post. Now, this is fairly complicated uh, to actually accept a file upload. We have to use a few things that we haven't yet seen, but that we installed previously. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say import and then I'm going to import Molter from and then Molter. Now, I might be mispronouncing that, but that's something that we need to use to actually handle a file upload. Now, after we make our app, what we need to set up here is a storage location for all of the files that are going to be uploaded. Now, I'm going to put them in a folder here called public. So in API, I'm going to make a new folder. This folder will be called public, and that's where we're going to save all of the files that are being uploaded before we then upload them to Sanity, because we need them stored on our local disk before we can upload them to Sanity. We can delete them after if we want, or we can just keep them here. It's really up to us. So what I'm going to do is say var storage like that is equal to multer dot and then this is going to be disk storage and we're going to define a location where we want to store this. So inside of disk storage, I'm going to say the destination is going to be a function and this function is going to accept a request, a file and a CB and we're just going to say CB and then inside of here, it's going to be null and then public. And this is a callback function. Now, I understand this is not going to make any sense right now. I'm going to be quite honest with you. I just found this code on Stack Overflow, tested it a bit, and it seemed to work. So I don't know exactly what's going on here, but I will try my best to explain the parts that I do understand. I do know that what this does, though, is set up a storage location where we're able to save files to. So I have the destination, which is equal to this. And then the file name is going to be the callback function here. And it's going to be null. And it's going to be date dot now plus and then we're going to put a hyphen and then we're going to put file dot and then original name. OK, so we're getting the destination uh, to get the destination. We take in the request, the file and a callback function, and we just call the callback function with public. Now, callback is going to be essentially our current location. So we're going to append public to it, which means that the location that we want to save this is in the public folder, right? So relative to our current path plus the public folder, then the file name that we want to save is going to be daytime dot now. So whatever the current date is, plus a string, plus the file dot original name, just so that we have a unique name for our file name. OK, now that we have that, we're going to say var upload is equal to Molter and we're going to pass this an object, which is storage storage. So now it knows where we're going to be saving any uploads. Now to actually accept an upload, uh, we're going to do the following. We're going to say app dot 
and then I'm going to make this a post request because we're going to be adding a, uh, a new image and this is going to be slash create post. So sorry, not just new image, but a new post. And then I'm going to pass here upload dot and then single and then the parameter type is going to be file because we're uploading a file and then we are going to have our regular request and our response. And what we're going to do inside of here is get the body. So we're going to say const body is equal to request dot body. OK, and then we're going to call the function create post and we're going to pass to this the body dot user, which is going to be the user that we want to make the post for the body dot caption, which is going to be the caption of the post and then the request dot file. So notice I'm doing request not file, not body dot file, because the file that we want to store will be a part of this request because we have this upload dot single here. Then we're going to say dot then we're going to put inside parentheses here data and we're going to say res dot JSON and then data. Now I will explain how we actually upload the file in a second because we're going to have to do that from uh, the create post function. What we've just done here is set up a storage location. Again, don't worry too much about this code. I don't fully understand all of it. I just know that it does work. We then have upload. Now this is the multer object, which is going to allow us to actually accept a file upload here on our server. So now we pass in here upload dot single file, which means we're accepting a single file to this post request, OK, as well as any of the request body that we want. And then we're going to take body.user, body.caption, request.file, pass that to create post and request.file will be the path to the file, which will now be sitting on our server. So we're uploading the file from our uh, front end. We're then going to be downloading it on the back end, saving it locally. And then we're going to take that file and use that and upload it to Sanity. OK, the reason we're doing this is because we need to upload to Sanity. So we first need to get the file here on our back end. Then once we have it here, we can use it and send it to Sanity. All right, so let's go to API calls now. And what was the function? We want to write the function create post. So what we're going to do here is say functions dot create post. Now this will be an arrow function. And what we want to take in here is the user, the caption and the image. OK, and then we're going to say return. And this is going to be sanity client. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to upload the photo to sanity. So to upload a photo to sanity is different than to create uh, a regular document. So we first upload the folder or first upload the image. Sorry. Then we're going to link the image as uh, this user's post. So you'll see what I mean in a minute. But we're going to say sanity client dot assets because we're uploading an asset. We're going to say dot upload. We're going to upload an image and then we're going to create a read stream. And this is going to be of the image dot path. Now I need to import this from our file system. So we're going to go up to the top here and we're going to say import create read stream from file system. OK, and then we also need to import one other thing, the base name from and then path. And I think path is installed by default, but if it's not, then we'll have to install it in Node.js. OK, so we're creating a read stream of the image dot path. This is essentially going to give us a bytes stream of this image, and then we'll be able to upload that to sanity because what well, we need to take the image, turn it into a format sanity can accept, which is this and then upload it. Now, we also need to pass here as an additional argument the name for this file. So I'm just going to say file name is equal to base name of image dot path. And this is going to give me, well, just the base name. So just the image name, not the entire path. So I'm saying, OK, I want to create a read stream of the file at this location. We want to save it as the file name of this. And then we're going to wait for this response to finish. We're going to get the data from this. And the data is going to include information about this image that we need to link it to a post. So now what we're going to do is say functions dot get user ID. It's a function we're going to write in one second. We're going to say dot user. We're going to say dot then we're going to say IDs inside of here. Uh, actually, did I mess something up here? Uh, nope, I think we're OK for now. I'm going to say IDs and then I'm going to do something here inside of an arrow function. OK, let's save this. Hopefully it gives me some formatting. Uh, what's the issue with my parentheses expression expected? Uh, OK, that's fine. We'll do something inside of here. And here we're going to say return sandy client dot and then create and then we're going to create a new post. Now, I know this is really confusing. Let's first write out this get user ID function. Because what we need to do here when we're making a post is we need to have a reference to the image for the post as well as a reference to the user who made the post. Now, to be able to do that, we have to have both the ID of the image as well as the ID of the user. 
So that's why I'm first doing the upload, right? I'm uploading the image. It's then going to return to me some data. This data is now going to contain the ID of the image. I can then use that ID to link the image to the post because of the, of the image is stored separately than the post. Then same with the user. I need the ID of the user, which I don't have. I just have the name. So I have to get that ID. So I'm going to say functions dot get user ID. This will be an arrow function that takes in a user. And then what we'll do inside of get user ID as well, we will get the user ID. So to get the user ID, we're going to say return sanity client dot. And then this is going to be fetch. And then the and then the query that we want here for the fetch is going to be following. We'll put it inside of back ticks just so we can have a multi line string here. We're going to do our asterisks. We're going to do our square brackets. We're going to say underscore type is equal to our user. Let's have a space here and then we will add similar to four and user is equal to and then this will be username and then we'll have to pass that username in a minute. And then inside of here, the only thing that we want is underscore ID. So rather than putting dot 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 or anything else, we just put this because we only care about the ID of the user. And then here we're going to say username colon and then user like that. OK, nice. So that gets the user ID. So we've now written that function. So now what we're doing right is we're saying, OK, well, once the image is uploaded, we're now going to get the ID of the user. Now, it's actually going to give us a list of IDs because remember, it's always going to return to us multiple things. So if we want just the ID, we can say const ID is equal to IDs at zero and then dot underscore ID. OK, and that will give us the ID of the user, assuming this user exists. And then we're going to return sandy client dot create. And then the type that we're going to use here is going to be a post. OK, so we're going to say type post. And then we'll fill in the other fields that we need for creating a post. So we'll put the author of the post. The author is going to be equal to a reference. So we're going to say underscore ref. And this is going to reference the ID. OK, that's all we need for that. Then for our photo, this is going to be an asset. And this asset is going to have a reference to the data dot underscore ID, which will be the ID of the photo that we just uploaded that we're now getting from data. And then after photo, we're going to have our description, which will really just be the caption. I think I called it description in the uh, in the database, although let's have a look. Actually, let's go here. Schemas post. And yes, I did call description. So we're going to have to use description other than caption. OK, and then the last thing that we want is the created at which is new and then date. All right, so that is actually all we need to create a post. I know very confusing. There's a lot of stuff that we have to do. It took me a long time going through the documentation to figure this out, because since we have this on the back end, we need to first download the image. Then we need to get the path to the image Then we need to upload it to sanity. Then we need to link the image with the post as well as the user ID with the post. And so this is how you do it, right? If I want to have a reference to a person, I do underscore ref for the author. And then I'm referencing the ID of a person object. And then for the photo, I put asset inside of here because that's one of the mandatory fields. Then this asset is referencing an asset that is on sanity already that we just uploaded. So that's why we had to do that first and then get the ID of it. Then the description, well, it's a caption created at new date. There we go. We have the create post function. OK, so that actually should be fine now. So if we go to index.js, that's all we need for slash create post. Now for make post, we're going to send a request here. So let's do, uh, start creating our uh, what do you call it request options as well as our form data. So when we want to send a file, we need to send this file in form data. So what I'm going to do is say const form data is equal to and then this is going to be new form data because remember here we need to upload a file. Then what I can do is add the fields that I want to the form data. So I can say form data dot append. I can append, for example, the user that will be equal to whatever user is passed here to create a post. All right. Continuing, we're going to say form data dot append and we're going to append a description. Uh, actually, let's check here. Index.js. Uh, nope. We're going to append a caption. And the caption will be caption. OK. And then we're going to say form data dot append and we're going to append a file and the file will be the file. All right. OK, then we're going to say const request options and we're going to say that this is equal to an object and we're going to say the method is equal to and this is going to be post and then the data will be our form data. OK, we're just doing it this way because we're actually sending a file. So we want to add that to our form data so it's handled properly. 
And then I'm going to fetch the slash create post. And then we'll pass the request options. And we're going to say dot then. And we're going to get a response. So underscore res like that. And then we will do the following. So assuming that we get a response and we don't get an error, we're going to say add alert. And we're going to say variant. And then this is going to be success. And then we're going to say a message. And we're going to say post created exclamation point. And then we're going to navigate to the home page. So navigate home. Now, if we do not get this successfully, so if we have an error, we're going to need to catch that error. So we're going to catch error. OK, and then we're going to make a new alert. So we're going to say add alert or not add alert. This is going to be set alert. Don't tell me I called this one add alert. OK, sorry, guys, set alert. So we're setting alert. And then the variant here is going to be danger. And the message will just be error message. So whatever that is, we'll display that. OK, so that should actually be it for making a post now. So when we hit that post button, it should just well make the post and we should be good to go again. Apologize for all the complexity there, but it is required. So let's refresh the page. OK, let's sign in as Tim. Let's go to post. Let's close that. Let's choose a file. Uh, I have Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Nice. Awesome. Uploaded. And notice it shows up here because again, when I go to my image, let's have a look at it here. You can see that I am displaying the image only if we have a file. Since I set the file, we now have it so I can display it there. And then what I'll do for the caption is say, this guy is strong. OK, and hit post and post created. Although we got an issue, it says create post not found. Ah, OK, so the reason we got that problem there is because we need to restart our API because we added a new function. So let's restart this and let's try this again. OK, so let's come here. Let's go to post. Let's choose a file, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. This is a strong man. OK, and then post. All right. Again, 500 internal server error. What's the error that we got this time? It says create post is not defined. OK, we need to import that. So let's go to our index.js and let's add here create post. And now hopefully this should work. OK, let's try this now. Let's go to post. We need to rerun the API because we made a change. OK, so stop and rerun. Let's go back here. Let's upload a file and let's go testing this time and post and another internal server error. What is the error this time? Property path of undefined. Hmm. OK, let me have a look here and then I will be right back. All right, so I found the problem here. I apologize. This is a really stupid error here. I need to change data to be body. So it was saying that I wasn't getting a file because I wasn't really sending any uh, data because I had data rather than body. So this needs to be body here in request options. And now it should fix the problem for us. So let's rerun this. Let's go to refresh. Let us sign in. OK, Tim, sign in. Let's go to post and then let's choose a file. OK, let's go with Dwayne again. Strong man post. OK, this is a good sign. It's taking a second. That means it's uploading the file and then post created. And if we go to our back end, you can see I've just printed something out and we get actually the file that was passed here. So let's now go to Sandy Studio and let's see if we have that image uploaded. So when I go to post, notice that we have a photo. And when I look at the photo, we get Dwayne with description strong man and that is posted by Tim. Awesome. So we've just figured out how to create a post. Now that we have done that, we want to view all of the posts, then search for users, then set up the profiles. Hopefully at this point in time, you are realizing that, yes, this app does look simple, but there is a lot going on in the back end. I will continue to show you how to do the rest of the stuff right now. All right. So now we're going to move on and code out the all posts page, which is going to show us all of the posts for a user's feed. Or if the user is not signed in, then it will just show us all of the posts. So that's how I'm going to implement it here. Feel free to change it around if you'd like. Anyways, we need to import a few things here. So we're going to say import and we're going to import react. We're going to import use effect. We need this. We're also going to import use state and then this will all be from react. And sorry, I don't think I need react. I think I just need use effect and use state. OK, continuing, I'm going to import and this is going to be link from and this will be react router DOM. Then I'm going to import a card from bootstrap. So from 
and then this will be react and then bootstrap down here. Nice. Now that we have that, let's set up the state that we want for our page. We're also going to accept a user as a props so that we know if we're signed in or not. And we show the user's feed or we just show all of the pages or all of the posts. Sorry. So I'm going to say const. This is going to be all and then posts and then data. And this will be set all posts like that. And then this will be equal to use state. And for now, we will go with no and we'll put an object in there later. OK, then we're going to write our use effect, although actually, yeah, we'll do the use effect now. So I'm going to say use effect. OK, and then we need to do the arrow function and we want to update this whenever the user changes. So if a user signs in, then we're going to change it to show their feed as opposed to showing uh, all of the posts. So inside of here, the first thing I'm going to do is say if and this is going to be not user, then what I want to do is I want to fetch all of the posts. So I'll just write the fetch, but then we'll actually write the back end endpoint later on. So I'm going to say get all and then posts. So that's what we do if we don't have a user. Otherwise, if we do have a user, then we want to fetch. And this is going to be slash get and then posts of and then following. And then we're going to do as a query parameter user equals and then plus and then whatever the name of the user is, because again, we want to get all of the posts of the users that this user is following. All right, so that's what we need for the use effect. We'll have to modify this in a second and actually do something with the different fetch requests. But for now, we'll just leave it like this. And now we can write the HTML of the page. So I'm going to return a div here. And for now, I'm not actually going to write any classes in a separate file. I'm just going to write them all inline CSS. It's definitely not best practice. And I'm being a bit inconsistent here. Uh, but just to show you that I can use some built in bootstrap classes instead of having to write all of the custom classes myself. So I'm going to say div class name. Then this is going to be equal to center. And then this will be MT3. So margin top three. Now, the center class is one that we already made. And if we go to index.css, we should see that we have center here and it just puts us in the center of the screen. OK, going back to all posts, what I want to do inside of here is I want to map the all post data. So I'm going to say all post data dot map. And then for every single element in my all post data, which is going to be a list of all of the posts that I have, I want to display a card for them. So I'm going to say post and then index. And then this is going to go to an arrow function. And actually not an arrow function, sorry, just a uh, parentheses. Well, it is an arrow function, but we're going to have parentheses as opposed to the curly braces. And then inside of here, I'm going to have a div. So each post will have its own div and the div is going to be class name equal to. And this is going to be center as well. And we're going to say M and then two. Now this is margin two, meaning we're going to have a margin of two on all sides. And then for this, I'm going to say style is equal to. And I'm going to say that the min underscore width is equal to 30 percent. So we're going to go 30 percent like that. And then we're going to say that the max width is equal to and we're going to go with 400 pixels. Now, this will just give us a nice dynamic size, though. So we're going to take up a minimum width of 30, 30 uh, percent on the screen. But when the screen is large enough, we'll take up up to 400 pixels. Now, you could change this around if you want the post to be slightly larger, uh, but I messed around with a bunch of different values and this was pretty good. Now, since we're going to have a bunch of divs that are going to be in kind of a list, uh, we're going to say key is equal to and then index. Whenever you're using map and you're putting multiple elements inside of what's being mapped, you're supposed to put a key uh, and the key is just a unique value for the elements on the page. So kind of hard to explain it more than that, but you'll see that you get errors if you don't have this or you'll get warnings at least that are saying that you need to have a key property in the element uh, because when you're rendering them dynamically like this, that's what React expects. Now inside of this div, we're going to display a card. So I'm going to say card like this slash card and then we're going to put a div inside of the card. <clears throat> now this div will have a class name and this will be equal to deflex so display flex. And we need another S here for the class name. Now, this is a bootstrap class that you can use that just adds uh, the display being flex for the specific div. Then I'm going to say align items and then center. I think you can guess what that is going to do. And then we'll make this a flex column as opposed to a flex row. And then let's end our div. OK, now inside of this div, I'm going to put a card image. So I'm going to say card dot and then this will be image and then card dot and then image. The variant of this 
is going to be top, which means we're going to put the image at the top of the card that we have for the SRC. This is going to be equal to the post dot and then photo dot and then asset dot URL. OK, that's the source for our photo. And then for the style, we're going to say that this is equal to and then this will be width and then 100 percent. So we'll take up the maximum width of our container. OK, there we go. Now we want to do a card body outside of this div. So I'm going to say card dot and then this is going to be body. And this will be card dot body as well. Inside of the card body, I want to have a link to the user's profile. So we're going to have kind of an at symbol. Say the user actually posted this photo. Then I want to have the description of the post as well as when the post was well posted. So the date time that it was uploaded or yeah, I posted whatever you want to call it. So inside of here, I'm going to make a link and I'm going to say two is equal to and then we'll actually do inside of curly braces here slash profile slash and then this is going to be plus and then this will be post dot and then this will be username like that. OK, that should be fine. And then we'll end the link. So slash link. And here we'll just put the name of the user. So I'm going to say card dot and then title and then card dot and then title like that. Let's fix that. And inside of here, this will be an at symbol. And then we will say post dot and then username. Now, username will be a field that we're going to add to each post. Each post is going to have all of the elements on it that our posts have from our database uh, and from what our query returns, which we're going to write in a second for both of these fetches. OK, so now we have the card title that's inside the card body. Uh, next, we want to have the description. So we're going to say card dot and then text and then card dot text. And then we want to put inside of here the post dot. And then this is the description. OK, so that's all we need here for this. That's what's going to be the content of our card body. Now we're going to make a card footer. So I'm going to say card dot and then footer like that. This will be beneath the card. It's kind of muted and it looks a little bit. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, like kind of lighter. So I'm going to say class name equals text and then muted. And then inside of here, I'm going to post the post dot created at. All right. Now the create ad is just going to be the date time this was posted at. We could format this and make it a bit nicer, but for now, I think that's good enough. Uh, and that is what we will have for the content of our page. So now all we need to do is write the queries for get all posts and get posts of following. So we're going to have to go to our API calls or sorry, to our index.js, and then we'll go to our API calls after that. So looking here again in all posts, we had get all posts and get posts of following. So let's copy this one to start. And let's go app dot get. Let's paste that in slash get posts of following. We're going to take in our request, our response. This will go to an arrow function. Then we're going to say const body or not const body. We're going to say const and then this will be user is equal to request dot query dot user because we want to know the user that we're going to be getting these posts for. Then once we have that, we're going to call the get posts of following function and we're going to take in user or pass user sorry and then say dot then and then we will have inside of here data and then we will return res.json and data okay now we're going to do the exact same thing here uh, except it is going to be for get all posts so we'll just say get all posts and then we don't need a user because well when we're getting all of the posts we don't care about the user we'll change this function to be get all posts now, while we are in here, let's import these functions and then we're going to have to actually write them. So let's write get all posts and get posts of following like that. OK, I think that is what they were. Looks good. Now let's go inside of API calls and let's write the queries and calls with the Sandy client. So I'm going to say functions dot. We'll start with get all posts. This one will be easier. So I'll say get all posts. This is going to be an arrow function. This arrow function actually doesn't take in any parameters. And we're going to return sanity client dot. And then this will be fetch. And we want to fetch a specific query. Now, this query is going to be asterisk followed by our square brackets. Instead of here, we're going to go underscore type is equal to. And then this is going to be post. Now, there's nothing else that we care about. We just want to get all of the posts and then we want to get some specific information from those posts. So we'll start by saying dot dot dot. 
Then we're going to get the username. So since this is a custom field, I'm quoting this. So I'm saying username is going to be the author, which is a nested object, right? Because this is a reference to a uh, what you call this to a person or to a user object. So we're going to say author and then we're going to get the author's username like that. So that's how we're going to have username on all of the uh, values that are returned here from this query. Then down here, I'm going to say photo and then we're going to take the asset. And then the asset is going to give us the underscore ID as well as the URL. So in case I didn't mention this before, whenever you see the arrow, that essentially means that we have a reference type. So an asset is a reference type and we are going inside of the reference and grabbing some specific fields. So I'm getting the username here and here I'm getting the ID as well as the URL, which is the information that we need. OK, so that's what we need for get all posts. Now we're going to have to write a fairly complicated query, which is going to get all of the posts for following. So the reason why this is a little bit confusing is because we have all of the users that we're following on our user. But I need to then go and find all of the posts that reference a user that this user is following. So you're going to see, but it's not the most trivial thing in the world. And it took me a good amount of time to actually come up with this query. Uh, so you're welcome for just typing it out for you here. So I'm going to say get posts of following is equal to we'll take in the username. OK, and then we're going to say uh, what is this return sanity clients dot fetch. And we are going to fetch the following. It's going to be underscore type. And we're actually going to start with user. So what I'm going to do here is start by finding the current user, then going through a list of all of the people that this user follows or an array of all the people that this user follows, and then adding a post field to all of those people so that we're able to get all of their posts and then we can aggregate all of their posts together. So I'm going to say underscore type is equal to user. And I'm going to say username is equal to and then this is going to be pound username or not pound dollar sign username. Then let's make sure we pass this variable. So I'll just pass username since the name is the same as uh, this variable. I can just pass it like that. And then I'm going to say following and this is an array and I'm going to essentially map all of the values into in in the array uh, to some certain return values that I want to get. So I want to get the posts. So I'm going to say posts colon. And then this is going to be a new query and this query is going to be type and this is going to be underscore post and I'm going to say and and references and we're going to do the hat dot and then underscore ID. Now, this is a bit weird, but every single one of the entries in this following array here is going to be a person. So what this hat is going to reference is the current person that I'm on while I'm looping through this array. And then for every single one of those people, I'm going to do a query to get all of the posts that they have made. So let's make sure this is underscore type. And then from all of their posts, what I want is dot dot dot. So everything from the post as well as a username field. The username again is going to be author and then username. And then I'm going to go photo and then I'm going to say asset. Since this is a reference type, I'm going to go with my arrow and then I'm going to get underscore ID and then URL. OK, so similar to what we did here, except the query is a little bit more advanced. So I'm adding a post field to every single entry in my following array. Then outside of here, when I actually return this, I'm going to loop through. I'm going to grab all of these post field and I'm going to aggregate them together. So that's all we need for now. So get posts of following. So let's go back to index.js here. And let's continue writing some code. So for my data here and get posts of following, I'm going to change this slightly and I'm going to now loop through my results. I'm going to grab all of those posts field and I'm going to combine them into one array and then return that array. So I'm going to say var posts is equal to and then this is going to be data zero dot following. OK, so this will give us the list of following from the user that we got the post for. So I know this is a bit weird, but again, we looked up the current user, so the user that we want to get the feed for. We got all of the people they were following, and then we added the post field to that following array. So now I'm getting this following array, and now I'm going to map this. So I'm going to say posts is equal to, and then this is going to be posts dot map, and I'm going to map every single post to the post dot post. Okay. Now I know I said the word post like a hundred times, but it's going to be post dot post, which is the field inside of that object containing all of their posts. 
now that I have that, I'm going to say post is equal to, and then this is going to be post dot, and I'm going to flatten this to one level. Now, what this will do is just take all of the nested arrays that I'm going to have inside of here and flatten them into one. And then what I'm going to do is say res dot JSON with posts. Okay. Now I'll also just add a catch here in case something goes wrong. So I'll say catch error, and then we'll just res dot JSON. We'll just return an empty array. So if something does go wrong, empty array just saying, you know, okay, there's no post because an error occurred. All right. So I think that's all I need for now. So let's go back to all posts now and let's continue writing these fetches. So now we'll actually display some data. So for this fetch, I'm going to say dot. Then I'm going to say uh, this will be res. We want to return the res dot JSON. And then we're going to do another dot. Then we want to get the data. And then we are going to say set all posts and we'll set all posts with the data. Now we'll do a very similar thing here. In fact, we'll do the exact same thing. So let's do this and let's run that. Now what I can do is also just add a catch to both of these in case something does go wrong. So I can say catch error and then we can just console dot error this error. I won't show it in a uh, alert, although I could do that if I want. Now let's just take this catch and copy it and put it down here again, just so in case anything goes wrong, we'll be logging that to the console. Nice. So now that we do that, we should actually be able to see all of the posts from a user once they've signed in or when we're not signed in, we should just see all of the posts. And so let's resize or resize. Let's rerun our API. Excuse me. I've been recording for a long time now, as you guys can probably tell. So NPM start our API and let's go back to our front end. So let's refresh our React app and we're getting an error. Cannot read property of null reading map. OK. Uh, what else? Any other errors here? It says can I read property of null reading map? Okay, so let me have a look why that's going wrong. Uh, what are we mapping? So we are mapping our uh, what is it? All posts. Okay, so the way to fix this is to say all posts data question mark. Otherwise, we'll go down here and we'll just render null. Now, the reason we're going to do this is just to make sure that we have some data, because if we have no data, then this is null. We also could fix that by just making this an empty list. Uh, but for now, I think it's fine to leave a null and say, OK, well, if we uh, have no posts, then we're not going to do this, obviously, because that's going to give us an error. Otherwise, we can show null, or maybe what we want to show is just something simple like a P tag uh, that just says no posts to display. OK, so let's do that. Let's go to our front end and then notice we're going to see the one post that we currently have. OK, so we see this post. And if I sign in as Tim, let's do that when it redirects me to the home page. Uh, oh, it's showing me this post, which it actually shouldn't be showing me because I'm not following this person. Uh, let me just go back to feed here. And OK, so it's still showing this to me. Let's sign in as another account. I forget if we have an account like Joey one, two, three. Let's sign in. And it's still showing it to me. OK, let me have a look here and see what's going wrong, because we should not be seeing this post when we are signed in. All right. So to fix this problem, I just realized we need to go to app.js and we need to pass the user to our all post page because I forgot to do that. So I'm going to say user user like that. Now, when we go to all posts, we will actually have a prop. So now this condition will be correct. Uh, so when we have a user, it will actually give us all of the posts of their following. OK. So let's now go here and notice that the page is actually refreshed for us because we added that. So if I go to say search, go back to feed, uh, no post to display, or actually it's giving me an empty list. And since it's giving me an empty list, uh, we don't have no. And so it's not showing me no post to display, but we're not displaying any posts because I'm not following the person that made that post. So now what I want to do is make it so that we can actually search for uh, different users. And then once we search for them, we'll be able to view their profile and then we can actually start following people, right? Because, well, we need to follow people to be able to view the different posts. So let's start working on that. Uh, let's close all posts. Let's close. Actually, let's not close app. Let's pass. Do we want to pass something to app? Or, sorry, do we want to pass something to search? I think for now we don't need to. Uh, let's go to the search component and let's start writing this out. So I'm going to start by importing what we need here. So I'm going to import use state from and then react and then I'm going to import a form, a button, a list group and a card from and then this is going to be react bootstrap and then I'm going to import a profile list item 
from profile list item dot js. Now I will write this later on, but every single item that we're going to have in a list is going to represent a user and it's just going to be easier to have a separate component that we can render for each one of those individual users in the list that will do all the styling and formatting for us. So we'll use this later on. Uh, you can think of this kind of as an li tag within a list. That's uh, what it will be. And it will just show, you know, the users following. It will have a follow button, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I want to import a CSS uh, sheet, which we're going to fill in. There's actually quite a bit of styling we need to do here. So we'll say slash CSS slash and then search dot CSS. OK, and what is the error that we're getting here? It's saying browser doesn't contain a valid field, doesn't contain JS. Can I remove this? Is that going to fix the problem? Uh, OK, you know what? We'll look at the problem later on uh, because right now we just need to finish writing this. OK, so now we want to add some state here. So I'm going to say const. This is going to be search text and then update search text. OK, update search text is equal to use state. And the search text is going to be the text that we're searching for when we're searching for a user. Then we're going to say const search results as well as update search results or set search results or whatever we want to call this update search results. I know I'm being inconsistent here, uh, but that's fine for right now. You guys can change that if you want. And for the search results, we'll have an empty list for now. And then uh, we will uh, just return the uh, HTML of the page. Sorry. So return and we're going to have a div. So we're going to say div class name is going to be equal to search. I'll fill in all of the classes, then we'll just write all of the CSS at once. OK, so we have search. Now let's make another div. Now this div is going to have a class name of search and then wrapper. And then we will end the div tag. And then inside of here, we're going to have a form, which is going to allow the user to enter their search text and then hit the button to search. So we'll say form. And then for the class name, this will be equal to the search and then form. OK, then we'll go here and we'll say form dot and then control. And then to end this tag, we'll just end it within itself. For the type here, uh, we are going to go with text. So type equals text. We're going to have an on input, which will be a function. This will actually just be a function that updates the search text. So we'll take E in here and we'll say update search text E dot target dot value. And then we'll have a placeholder and we'll just type search for a username. OK, so let's write that username like that. OK, nice. Now continuing under the form control, uh, we actually want a form group to put this form control inside of. So my apologies. Let's write that now form group. OK, let's copy the ending tag. Let's wrap it around our form control. And then for the form group, we'll have a class name. And this is going to be equal to the search field just so that I can expand the size of the uh, the field inside of here. OK, now outside of the form group, we want to have a button to submit. So we'll say button and then button. And then here we will just type search. For the variant, we are going to have this being equal to primary. And then we'll have an on click, which will call a function that I have yet to write. OK, I think that's all we need for right now. Then underneath the form, but inside of the search wrapper, I'm going to start displaying all of the search results. So we're going to go here and say search results dot length. And we're going to say if this is greater than zero, then what I want to do is I want to render this. So let's have this. Otherwise, we're just going to render null. Or actually, rather than rendering no, we'll render a p tag and we'll just say no search results. So we'll say p slash p and then no search results. OK, and then inside of here, we want to render a div. So I'm going to say div slash div. And then for the class name, this is going to be the search results and then wrapper. So let's fix wrapper here so that it has a hyphen. And then inside of this div, we're going to render a bunch of cards. So we're going to have card, card. For the card, we're going to have style equals 
and then we're just going to make the width 100%. Okay. And then inside of the card, we're going to render a list group. I understand this is a lot. We'll walk through it after in a second, but let's just get it all down. I'm going to say the variant of this is going to be flush. This is going to be just, well, a list group that will display all of the different list items that I have. And then inside of here, we're going to say search results dot map. And we're going to map the, I guess we'll call it item and IDX. And we'll map this to a profile list item. So I'm going to say profile list item like that. And then let's just end the tag here. And we'll pass to this dot 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 item, which is going to contain all of the information about uh, what do you call it? An individual user that shows up in the search page. Now let's change width here. So that's inside of a string. OK, profile list item. And then we also want to pass an index here. So I'm going to say IDX is equal to IDX just so we can render an index inside of the tag and we don't get a warning. OK, understand that was a lot. I think that's pretty much all that we need for this. Now let's write the two functions for the on click for the button. Uh, as well as did we have another function that we needed to write? Uh, actually, no, we already did this one for the on input. So let's just write the search function. So let's go function search. OK, and then let's just simply call search right here. OK, so I think that's good. Uh, I'm not sure. It looks like we're getting some errors. So let's see what the errors are. OK, so the error first is saying search.css does not exist. So let's create that file search.css. OK, now that that is created, uh, it's giving us another error. It's saying profile list item does not exist. OK, that's because it's called profile item. So let's change this to be profile item from profile item. We don't need to call it list item. And we are getting another error here. It says profile list item is not defined. Um, OK, that would be right here. Let's change this to profile item. Save and looks like all of our errors go away. OK, so let's open up our front end. And this is what the search page looks like. A little bit weird, but we have the uh, the search field expanding the entire width. We have the search button that says no search results. If I hit search, it's going to say no search results again. What we need to do now is add the styling and all of the classes for this. So let's do that. It is going to be quite a bit of CSS. Let's start writing it out. So we're going to say dot search. And this is going to be display and then flex. And then we're going to say the flex direction is a column. And we're going to say align items. And we're going to align them in the center. OK, we're then going to have our search wrapper. So I'm going to say search wrapper. This is going to be display flex. I'm going to say the flex direction is going to be column. I'm going to say align items center. I'm going to say justify content. Uh, this will be center as well. We're then going to have the min width, which is equal to 30%. So take up a minimum of 30% of the screen. Uh, why is that? Oh, it's because I have a comma here. So let's fix that. Then we're going to have a max width and the max width. I'm going to make 500 pixels. OK, so let's see how this looks so far when I make these two changes. Notice here that the classes I did was this div and this div. So let's have a look and notice that now we're taking up kind of the correct amount of size in the screen. We do want to be a bit larger, so we're going to have to affect some of the uh, the other styles or some of the other classes. We're going to have to change them. Uh, but anyways, you get kind of what we're looking at right now. OK, now that we have that, let's do our search field. So for the search field, this is going to be where we actually have the input. I'm just going to say width is 100 percent. OK, now after the search field, we're going to go search form. So let's go search form like that. The search form is going to be display flex. It's going to be margin and then top. And rather than 20 pixels, we're just going to go with 2 EM. OK, then we're going to go flex direction. The flex direction here is going to be the row. And then the width is going to be 100 percent. Now, before I do the rest of them, let's actually just see what this looks like so far. And now notice that we have this beside the search button. So that's what I wanted to have. And that's what this does right here. When I put the flex direction to row it means all of the items contained in this div or I guess this is the form are going to be aligned in a row rather than in a column. Uh, so that's what I was doing to make it look like that. OK, now that we have that, I'm going to go the search and then the results and then wrapper. And this is going to be equal to margin top. We're going to do 2 EM as well. I'm going to say flex direction. This is going to be column. And then the width 
is going to be 100%. All right, so after search results wrapper, that should be all good. So let's now have a look at what we get. Okay, nice. So that's exactly what I was expecting. We have the margin from the top. We have the text field and the button kind of beside each other. We have this in the center. Now what we need to do is start actually getting the results and then displaying them by using where is it here? The profile item. So we can actually code out profile item first to display an individual profile item. And then that way is going to be very easy for us to just finish the uh, the fetch commands there uh, and allow us to actually get the different uh, users that we search for. So let's start here by importing and let's import a button. Let's import a list group and then let's do this from and this will be the react and then bootstrap. And then we're going to say import and we're going to import use navigate. And this will be from react and then router and then Dom. OK, now we're exporting our profile item inside of profile item. I want to take a few props. I want a username. I want a first name. I want a last name. I want a photo and I want the followers. However, for the first name, I'm going to do it like this for the last name. I'm going to do it like this. And then the photo will be here. Now, the reason I'm doing it in this way is so that these match exactly what the fields are that are going to be returned from our sanity API. Uh, and that way I don't need to actually do any modifications or manually look for them. OK, now I'm going to say const like this is going to be use navigate or const navigate will be use navigate. OK, so const navigate equals use navigate. And then we are just going to return what we want to display. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to say return. We're going to return a list item. OK, this list item uh, will have a div inside of it. So we're going to say div. The class name of this div is going to be equal to dflex. This is going to be a line item center, justify content and actually not center. We're going to justify the content between. Then I'm going to end the div tag. And inside of this div, I want to have another div. This div is going to have a class name, which is equal to it's going to be dflex. OK. And then we're going to, going to align the items in the center of this div. And then we will put an image. Now, the image here is going to be the profile photo of this user. So I'm going to say image we will end the image tag within itself. And then we'll say SRC is equal to and we'll check if we have a photo. Now, if we don't have a photo or if we do have a photo, sorry, then I'm going to say photo dot asset. So let's do this dot asset dot URL. Otherwise, we'll just display a placeholder photo uh, that kind of says, OK, this user doesn't have a photo, but we're going to show something anyways, just so it doesn't look empty. Now, this is the URL for the placeholder photo. So what you can do here is just change this to be any size you want. So in this case, when I make it 80, it's going to make the size of this image 80 pixels, right? So HTTPS colon slash less via dot placeholder dot com slash 80. There you go. That's all we need for the source. And then for the style here, I'm just going to say style is equal to and we're going to make the width of this 100 percent and the height of this 100 percent and you'll see that what ends up happening here is the height and width is going to be limited by the size of the container so when we expand the width and the height 100 percent the image will just fill the amount of size that we allow this div to take up okay hopefully that it makes sense now we're going to put another div here and this will just be a div to space out a few items so we'll say slash div and then inside of here, we're going to put a P tag. The class name is going to be equal to and this is going to be PX2 and then M hyphen zero. So that's margin zero. So the PX2 means that we're going to have padding and the on the left and the right hand side. Now, two is just a certain amount of padding. It's not two pixels. It is more than that. It's two multiplied by something. I forget exactly what it's multiplied by. It might be EM. But anyways, that's what this is. And then I'm saying margin zero. So I'm just eliminating the margin on this P tag here. But I will have the padding. And then inside of here, I want to put the username. So I'm going to say in a strong tags, just so this is uh, what do you call it, like standing out. I'm going to say the username. OK, then beneath this, I want to have the first name and the last name of this user. So I'm going to say P P and then we are going to do the same thing here. We're going to have PX2 and M0. So class name is equal to PX2 M0. And we're going to check if we have a first name. So I'm going to say first underscore name question mark. If that's the case, then we'll render the first name. Otherwise, we're just going to render an empty string and then we're going to add this to a space plus 
and then the last name if we have a last name. So I'm going to say last underscore name question mark and then last underscore name. And then if we don't have last name, it'll just be an empty string. OK, so that's what we need for rendering the first and last name. Again, we're just checking if we have a first name. If we do, we'll show it and checking if we have a last name. If we don't, then we won't show it. And if we do, then we'll show it in concatenation with the first name and a space. All right. Now that we have done that, we're going to complete the next div. So we want to put a div here and we're going to say div div for the class name of this div. This is going to be D flex and then flex hyphen column. OK, and then inside of here, we're going to put the number of followers that this user has in a P tag. So I'm going to say P P and then we're going to do class name. We're going to say P X two. OK, and we don't actually need M zero. We just need P X two. And then in a strong tag again, we're going to say strong, strong. We will have followers, which remember is going to be the number of followers, not actually a list of followers, at least the way that we're going to call this. And then here I will put followers like that. And then we're going to put a button below this, which is going to ask us if we want to view the profile. So I'm going to say button like that. And we will just have the text be view the variant I will have equal to success. So this is a green button and then the class name will be equal to PX2 and then margin zero. So we move the margin from that and then we're going to have an on click event and the on click is going to be equal to an arrow function. And this arrow function is going to navigate us to the user's profile when we click on it. So I'm going to say, uh, yeah, I can do it actually without this. I'll say navigate and it's going to be slash profile slash plus and then username like that. All right. I think that is all we need. Uh, that looks good, although I think I may have messed up some of the divs here. This div, I actually believe I need to take out of here and put it one level down. OK, that makes sense. Let me just walk through what we did because this was a lot. So we created a list item and that is containing everything, right? Then inside of the list item, we have one main div. And what this div role is, is to just make sure everything is centered uh, and to justify the content between. Now, justifying the content between means we're going to push the first item to the left and the second item to the right hand side of the screen. So we're justifying the content on the left and the right as opposed to centering that. So we're centering it. Uh, was it vertically? But we are not centering it horizontally. We're pushing this to the left hand side and this to the right hand side. OK, so the profile image goes to the left as well as the name and the username. And then we have the followers and the view button going to the right hand side. So then we have this div right here, which is going to align our image with this div. So those would be the two flex children or the two flex items for this flex container. And you'll see that we'll get an image. And then what we will have is this div beside the image where we'll have the username as well as the first name and the last name. And the first name and the last name should be stacked on top of each other because we have them as P tags. Okay, then coming inside of here, again, we have another div. Now this is a flex column, which means we're gonna have everything aligned vertically and we're going to have our followers. And then beneath that, we're gonna have the button. Okay, hopefully that makes a bit of sense. That's what we have for profile item. Search.css is finished. So now we just need to finish this search field and we need to make a call to our API here. So what we'll do inside of search is we'll say fetch. And for the fetch, we're going to say slash search for and then username. We're going to say question mark text is equal to plus and then this will be the search text. And then we'll just write uh, what we'll do here and then we'll write the back end API uh, call as well as the uh, API endpoint on our Node.js server, our express server. So we'll say res res.json dot then we're going to have data. And then what we're going to do with the data is we're just going to update the search results. So I can actually just say update and then this will be search results like that with the data and then we will have a dot catch. We will catch our error and we'll just say console dot error error like that. Uh, and that should be good. Now I might have to do message. I think it's fine if I just show the error, it should actually display it for me and I will actually be able to view the message from that error object. OK, that's what we have for search. So this component is pretty much done. We now just need to go to index.js and we need to write uh, this root. So what was the root? It was search for username with a query parameter of text. So let's copy that. Let's go here. 
let's say app dot get okay slash search for username then we're going to take in our uh, request our response that will be an arrow function we want to get the text query parameter so I'm going to say const text equals and then this will be request dot query dot text and then we're going to call a function so we're going to say search for username we're going to pass text then dot then and then inside of here we're going to have data and we're going to say res.json data okay so now let's import this and then write that you guys should be getting used to doing this by now we've done it a few times let's go to api calls and now let's write the api call for that so we're going to say functions dot and then this is going to be search for username this is equal to an arrow function this is going to take in some text that we want to search for and then we are going to return sandy client dot fetch uh what is the issue here sorry this is functions not function so functions dot search for username we're going to fetch we'll go with our back ticks again we're going to do our asterisk and then we're going to say underscore type is equal to and then user and what I want to do is match this text against uh, any text for our usernames. So we're going to search for usernames in that box. And essentially any text that I find, I'm just going to see if it's contained in the username starting from the beginning. And if it is, then I will return that user. So the way I do this here is I write and and username. And then this is going to be match. And then we'll write a variable here with the dollar sign and we'll say text. And then we'll just pass text as the object here. So we actually get that. Now, what match says is if the start of the username matches with the text that we have right here, then it will match. I mean, hopefully that's clear. But if we have a username that's like, hello, then the text H E would match with that. But the text E L L O would not match because we didn't start with an H. So maybe you want to search for it in a different way, but I think this makes sense. You're going to search like a few letters. And then if the uh, those letters are contained in the beginning of any username, then it will show you all of the usernames that have that uh, result, right? Okay, so here, now we need to decide what we want to return. So I'm going to return dot, 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 which just means everything. And then again, I'm going to return my followers. And here for followers, I'm going to count the number of followers that this user has. Now to count this again is not trivial because I need to find how many references there are from other users to this user because we're not storing followers on a user, we're storing following. So now I need to do another query. And for this query, I'm going to say underscore type is equal to, and then this is going to be user. Okay, so we'll go with user like that. Uh, and then we're going to say and and references. And then again, we're going to go with the carrots and then dot underscore ID. So we're looking for how many users reference the current user that we got uh, when we're searching through all of the different users. OK, then we're going to say photo. And then this is going to be asset. And then we're going to have our arrow and then we're going to say underscore ID and then URL, just like we've always done. All right, I believe that's it uh, for search for username. And now it should actually just be functioning. I mean, I always say that we've probably done something wrong, to be honest, but uh, let's give it a shot and let's see. And you can see I had the uh, the bootstrap page open so I could remember what the X meant for PX. OK, so let's go here. Uh, it says list item is not defined. Uh, that is inside a profile item. So let's go to profile item. And I had list group. Sorry, this needs to be list item. So let's change that import. Now we should be good. OK, list item import is list item was not found in React Bootstrap. All right, let's have a look here. Uh, the issue is that I need to actually have this be list group. And then rather than list item, this is going to be list group dot item. OK, so that uh, makes sense. List group dot item. OK, now that we have that, let's go back and see if this works and let's hit search. And we got an issue. It says console dot error is not a function. Where is that? That is line 11 uh, in search. Ah, this needs to be error. OK, well, that means that we did get an error, so that's no good. And the reason we got an error is because we need to restart our API. So let's restart it because we added some code to it. Always forget to do that. I always think it automatically restarts. Now let's try this again. So let's refresh. Let's hit search. And we should see some search results popping up here, although it's not showing me anything. So, OK, this is a little bit weird why I'm not getting anything at all. 
Uh, let me have a look here and see what the problem is. All right, so I realized what the problem here is and it's actually in our API call. So the query was working as we wrote it, but I wrote it incorrectly because we need to put quotation marks around this text as well as an asterisk at the end that indicates that we're going to be matching using a regular expression pattern. So the text and then anything following the text is what we're looking for. So hopefully that makes sense. But that is why that wasn't working because the query was wrong. So we actually had our fetch request going through, weren't getting any errors on the back end. We just need to fix this now so that we have the correct regular expression pattern. OK, so now that we have that, let's refresh this and let's hit search. And it should show us all of the uh, the different accounts that we have. And it's not because I have not restarted my uh, API here. So let's restart that. Now let's give a nice refresh. Let's hit search and let's see if it gives us any results. OK, back to the drawing board here. Not sure what's going wrong now. All right, so I was just messing around here because I was really confused why this wasn't working. And it looks like the way that we were embedding our text variable in here just wasn't happening properly. So what I did here is changed it. So now I'm using a dollar sign and just directly embedding text as opposed to using the variable inside of sandyclient.fetch. Not exactly sure why this is an issue, but I think it has to do with the quotation marks here uh, and how they were being used. I think we were having double quotes being placed inside of here for some reason, and maybe I didn't need to quote this string. Uh, anyways, I'm just going to go with this because I know this is a solution and now it looks like it's working. So I'm going to go back to search here and notice that I've just been printing out the data. And the reason I was doing that is because even though now this is working and I restarted my API, you'll see that I'm not actually seeing any content here, even though I'm being returned uh, all of my different list items, which are the uh, the strings that match with this user. And if I search again here, you'll see that we get even more, which is all of the users that we created. So clearly I'm not rendering this properly. Uh, so let's have a look here and see why the rendering is incorrect. And let me stop actually printing this out because we don't need to do that anymore. So this is a very silly issue here, but inside of my search results map, I'm not returning anything because of the fact that I have this curly brace here. So instead, I'm going to remove it and just move this up so it's directly in line with the arrow. And now, OK, it automatically adds a parentheses, but now I'll actually be returning this item before I wasn't returning it. I just had it inside of there. And so since it wasn't being returned, well, I wasn't rendering anything on the screen. So let's go back now and see and notice that we're actually getting, well, what we expected. Now, for some reason, the images down here are larger than the ones up here. Uh, that's a little bit strange to me. So what I can do is just manually set the width to fix that problem. So let's go and do that. Uh, where is our image? Our image is in profile item. So here, rather than making the width 100% and the height 100%, in fact, I didn't want to make the height 100%. I just want the width to be 100%. So now let's see if that fixes anything at all. Uh, doesn't look like it. So let's just manually set the width. Let's say width is going to be something like 80 pixels. OK, let's see now. And there we go. So now it's fixed in all of our images, are uniform width. And I think 80 pixels is actually a decent width. And we can see as I move this, it's going to dynamically resize and everything looks good. Now let's try searching for some other usernames here. So I'll go with something like Joey. Uh, when I do that, we get a list that just contains the names that have Joey. And if I search for something like T, now we'll get all of the ones that start with T. If we go with Tim, we should just get three accounts. Nice. And then if I hit view here, it brings me to the profile page, which is going to be the next thing that we're tackling in this tutorial. OK, so searching is done. Signing in is done. Signing up is done. Viewing posts is done. So now what we're going to tackle is the profile page. Now, the profile page is uh, fairly complicated. I won't lie to you. And the reason why it's complicated is because we need a way to follow a user, unfollow a user and to edit our profile. So let's start coding out profile. I'm going to go to the profile component. And there is going to be a lot of styling here as well, because we want to display all of the posts that a user has on their profile as well. Right. So I'm going to start by importing everything that I need. I'm going to import use state, use effect. This will be from React. I'm then going to import use params. So import use params like that. Now, what this will give me access to is the parameters that were coming from my path. So when I go to say slash Tim, I'll get access to the Tim part, which then I can then use to grab the information about the current user. So I'm going to say import use params from React router DOM. OK, and then I'm going to import the button from React Bootstrap. So let's do that from and then React and then Bootstrap. OK, 
then I am going to import edit profile from edit profile, which we'll use later on. And then I'm going to import the CSS for this, which I've not yet created. So I'll have to make that. But it's going to be dot dot CSS slash and then profile dot CSS. Let's go here and make this CSS file. So it's going to be profile dot CSS. I will write all of our CSS inside of here. OK, so going back to profile.js, so we can now set up the state here and the piece of state that I want is going to be the profile data, the post that this user has, if we're following this user or not, because if we're not following it, then we need to show a follow button. If we are following, then we need to show a, a different button, a button that's going to say unfollow, right? If we are the owner of this profile or not, if we own this profile, then we need to show an ed edit button so we can edit the profile. And then we need to know if we're in the editing mode or not, because I'm going to display, I think it's called a modal. It's kind of like a pop up uh, where we'll be able to edit the profile uh, without leaving the page. So those are the three pieces of state that I need. Not three pieces. That's more than three. I believe it's five pieces. But I'm going to say const profile and then data and then set and then profile data. This will be equal to use and then state. And we'll just put an empty object inside of here for now. And then we're going to say const. And the next thing we need is the posts. So posts and then set posts like that. This will be equal to use state. OK, nice. And then we'll say const and this will be following. And then we'll say set following like that. And then we're going to say is equal to and then use state. And for now, we'll make it false. Then we are going to say const and we're going to say owner. So are we the owner of this or not? And then set owner. And then this will be equal to use state false. And then we're going to say const editing telling us if we are editing or not. And then set editing is equal to use state false. And then finally, we're going to say const params is equal to use params like that, which will give us access again to the uh, profile that we're currently looking at. OK, now what I'm going to do is write a few functions just so that we have them defined and then we'll fill them in. So the first function we want is going to be update following. This will tell us if we're following or not. So I'm going to say update following. I uh, will take in profile here. And for now, we just won't do anything. Then I'm going to say function. This is going to be update profile. So this is just going to grab the profile information for a specific username. OK, and then we're going to say function and this will be follow click. So if we click the follow button, what do we do here? OK, and I think that's all we need for our functions. Never mind. We need one more and this is going to be hide edit callback. And again, we'll fill these in later. I just wanted to code them out for right now. Uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do is just say if the profile data is equal to an empty object, then what I want to do is just return nothing. And the reason I'm going to do this is because actually we're going to return null is because if we don't have any profile data, then that means that the profile that we went to does not exist. So I will show an alert for that, but I just don't want to render anything on the screen. So we'll just return null. Otherwise, though, if that's not the case, then we can start actually coding out the content of the profile page. Now, again, this is going to be fairly complicated. A lot of CSS just because we need to design kind of like a decent looking profile with everything laid out properly. So I'll code out everything and then I will try my best to walk through it. But there is some understanding of CSS you have to have to understand how this works. So for now, we're going to say class name is equal to profile. OK, then we're going to do an H4 tag for the name of the profile. Now you can make this smaller if you want, but I think H4 is good. And we're going to say at and then this is going to be the profile data dot. And then this will be the username of the profile. Then beneath that, I'm going to have a div. And for this div, we're going to have a class name, which is equal to the profile data. Now, the profile data is going to be the, the number of posts, the number of followers and the number of following. Uh, it also actually I'm not sure if in this div we're going to hold the posts or not, but either way, we'll have this div. Now, inside of here, we want an image. The image is going to be the profile image right of this user. We want to see that. So I'm going to say image SRC is equal to and then this will be profile data dot photo question mark. So if we do have a photo, then we will display it. So we'll say profile data dot photo dot asset dot URL. Otherwise, though, we're going to uh, show the placeholder image which I'm just going to grab from profile item right here. OK, so let's grab that and paste it here. 
then uh, we can add an ID for this. So we'll say ID is equal to, and this will be the profile underscore image. Uh, we could have made this a class, but I think the ID is fine. And that will allow us to then change the size of this, which we'll do later on. Okay, so now that we have the username and we have the image, the next thing that we want to display is what I'm going to call some vertical data. So I'm going to say div div. It's going to be class name equal to vertical and then data like that. And then inside of here, I'm going to put a P tag. And in the first P tag, what I want to put is the number of posts that this user has. So I'm going to say strong, strong, and we're going to say posts. And then beneath this, I want to display the number of posts in an H4 tag. So I'm just going to say H4. And then I'm going to go here and say that this will be. So here I'm going to say posts, question mark, and then posts dot length. So if we do have some posts, then I will display what the post dot length is. Otherwise, I will display zero just in case for some reason when we try to get the post, we get an error. We'll just show zero. OK, then the next thing that I want to display is uh, some more vertical data. So I'm going to copy this because what this vertical data uh, class will do is it will just align both of these. So they're going to be on top of each other and be centered. So other than posts, I want the number of followers. So let's go followers. Let's then say profile data dot followers. And then this is going to be profile data dot followers dot length. And otherwise, we'll display zero. OK, copying this again, we're going to have one more piece of vertical data, which is going to be the following. So now rather than followers, it's going to be following. And then this will be profile data dot and then I think we can just do following because following will already be the count because we'll get that from the query from the back end. Whereas here, the followers will be a list or an array. And so we just need to count the number of elements that are inside of that. OK, now that we have that, we want to write the follow button. So I'm going to say div class name is equal to and this will be the follow button. All right. So for the follow button, there's a few things I need to do here. Hence why the logic is going to be kind of long. I need to check if we're signed in and if we're signed in, then I'm going to allow the user if it's not their profile to follow or unfollow. And if it is our current profile, so like the profile we're looking at is ours, then we'll be able to edit it. Now, if we're not signed in, then we won't show any button because you can't interact with the profile if you're not signed into an account. So let's do this. We're going to say user and and not owner. So if we are signed in and we are not the owner, then we'll do this. Uh, sorry, this will be a question mark. We'll do this. Otherwise, we will not display anything. And inside of here, we're just going to show a button. Now, the button will say follow or unfollow, but the text of the button is going to be variable based on if we're following. So I'm going to say following question mark. If we are following, then it will say unfollow. Otherwise, it will say follow. OK, and then for the variant, again, that's going to be determined on if we are following or not. So I'm going to say variant. And then this is going to be following question mark. Uh, if we are following, then it will be a danger because unfollowing will be red. And if we are not following, then it will be a success uh, saying that, you know, we want to follow. So we'll have a green button to follow and a red button to unfollow. I think that makes sense. Uh, for the button, we need an on click as well. So let's have the on click equal to and then this is going to be the follow button pressed. Uh, what did I call this? Uh, follow click. Sorry. So let's go follow click like that. All right. I think that's it for the button. Uh, that looks good now. Now beneath here, I want to potentially render another button that says edit. So I'm going to say if user and and so let's go and and owner here. Then I want to display a button. So question mark, otherwise null. And this button is going to say the following. It's going to say edit. The variant is going to be primary, so it'll be blue. And then the on click will be. And I guess we'll just go with uh, set editing here. So I'm going to say this is an arrow function. We'll go set editing true. And when we set this to true, then we will dynamically render that editing page. And so it will show the editing page once uh, this here, this piece of state comes to true. 
Okay, so that, I think that's all we need for the edit button. That looks good to me. Now that we have done this, we have written a lot. Let's uh, go through what we done, did so far. So we have our profile that's inside of the div. We then have an H4 here, which is going to be the name of the profile. So the username, we then have profile data. So all of that goes inside of this div right here. And we have an image, which is the profile image. We then have a bunch of vertical data uh, divs, which are storing the number of posts, number of followers, number of following. Then we're going to have a button. So all of these divs here, these four divs, because they're inside of this profile data div, they're going to be aligned in a row beside each other with a certain amount of spacing. That's why I put them in here. Same with the profile image. OK, so now that we have that, we want to go down one and we want to create a profile bio. So I'm going to make another div here and I'm going to say div div class name is equal to and this will be profile and then bio like that. And the bio is going to be like your first name, last name, and then the description that you had. So we'll make a div div class name is equal to. And then the first class that we'll have here is the profile name. OK, and then inside of the profile name, I'm going to have a strong tag. I'm going to display the first and last name. Now I can actually just copy what I had for profile item. So let's copy this here. First name, last name, and we'll just modify it a little bit. So actually it'll be profile data dot first name. OK, and then if that's the case, we'll display. Oops, did not mean to copy that whole line. If that's the case, we'll display the profile data dot first name. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because you could only have a first name or you could only have a last name. And well, if you don't have one of them, I don't want to get an error by trying to access it and then not seeing it there. OK, so I think that's good for our uh, profile data or for our first and last name. Sorry. Now that we have done that, let's do our bio. So in another div, I'm going to say class name is equal to and this will be the profile text. And then inside of here, we'll go profile data dot and then this will be the bio. Now, I think I might be crazy here because I keep saying bio when I think I mean description. But let me go to my database and let's go to user. And we have bio. OK, so it is bio in here. So when I'm making a user, I guess I didn't enter the bio field. Have I been looking at the description of a user at all recently? No, the description would have been of the post. OK, so my apologies. I'm just going a little bit crazy after coding for this long. Uh, anyways, we'll continue here. So we have profile text. We're going to show the profile data dot bio. That looks good to me. And then that is all good for right now. OK. The last thing that we want to show here in another div is going to be all of the posts of the user. So we're going to have a div. I'm going to say that the class name of this div. So let's code that out first is going to be equal to profile. And then this is going to be posts and then dot wrapper. And then we're going to have another class or another div with a class name of profile posts. Let's end the div. OK, and then inside of here, I want to map all of the posts. So I'm going to say posts and then we're going to say and and post dot length. So let's go post dot length is greater than zero. If that's the case, then I want to map all of my posts. So I'm going to say post dot map and we are going to map the post and the IDX. And then here, what we want to return is an image for the post. So I'm going to say image SRC is equal to post dot photo dot asset dot URL. Uh, and that should be fine because if we have a post, we know we're going to have an image for it. And then we need to end the image tag and we need to say key is equal to. And then this is going to be IDX. OK, now I've done something wrong here with the brackets. Uh, let's see how I can fix this. OK, so we're returning. We have our image tag, which is closing. This should be this closing tag. Uh, let's see what's wrong. All right. So the issue here is that I just need to add something where I do colon null just so we have another option. So if uh, this is not the case, if this condition is not the case, then I want to display null. Now, what's the error here? Expected a colon. Uh, no, I think it's expecting a question mark. Uh, but when I save it, it's auto formatting. OK, it looks like that's all good. OK. Apologies, that was a lot of code to write at once. Let's remove this final return statement. But we've completed the HTML for this page. 
Now really what we need to do is fill in these functions and we also need to write all of the CSS. Now we can't really write the CSS or at least see what it's doing until we have these functions filled in and we're getting some profile data, getting some posts and getting all of this. So let's start by writing the function which is going to be update profile. So I'm going to go to update profile here and what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to fetch and I'm going to fetch from slash and then get profile, which we've actually already written. And I'm going to say user is equal to plus and then user. Uh, and actually, sorry, this is going to be username. And we're going to get username from our params. But we're going to call this function from somewhere else, which I'll do in a minute. Okay, so we have fetch uh, slash get profile user username. I'm going to say dot then. We're going to get our res. We're going to return the res dot JSON. Then we're going to say dot then again. We're going to get data and we're going to return the data. So we're going to say, actually, we're not going to return the data. We're going to set the profile data of data. Okay, so that's what we need for there. However, we need to do a few things just in case any errors occur here. So let's add our curly braces. And the first thing that I want to check is if we have any profile data. So I'm going to say if, and this is going to be data, and I keep writing the wrong brackets. So I'm going to say if data dot length is equal to zero. Then I'm going to add an alert and I'm going to get the alert from in here. So I'm going to take in user and I'm going to take in set alert. So I'm going to say set alert like that. And the alert that we want to send is that this user does not exist. So if we don't get any length from our data, that means there was no user that existed with the username that we're trying to get the profile for. So we set the alert with the variant equal to or equal to danger and the message equal to no user no user with this username exists okay or i guess we could say profile does not exist that's probably a bit shorter profile does not exist uh not exist okay nice so that's what we have for set alert and then we can just write return here and then down here we will set the profile data However, before we set the profile data, I want to fetch all of the posts that this user has. And I have to do that in a separate request based on the way that I'm going to write these queries. So I'm going to say fetch and this is going to be get. So slash get posts and this is going to be question mark user equals plus and then username. OK, and then here I'm going to say dot then I'm going to get my response. I'm going to return my res dot JSON. OK, then I'm going to say dot then going to get my data and then I'm going to handle the data. So again, what we're doing here is we're getting all of the information about a specific user. So we're just getting their profile. Then once we get that, assuming that we actually have a user with that name, we're going to get all the posts from that user. And once we get the posts, I'm going to change this actually. So rather than this saying data, this is going to be profile data. OK, and we'll change this to be profile data just so this is a bit more clear and actually no we don't want to shadow the above name uh, so let's leave this as data let's leave this as data as well but let's change this to be posts just so it's clear that we have data up here and we have posts here because we're going to have to use them both so I'm going to set the profile data of the data that we got here but then the posts I'm going to say set posts and that's going to be the post that we got all right, so now that we've done this, I just need to make a few modifications. First, I need to make this data zero because, again, our data is going to be a list, even though it only contains one element. So I want to get the first element. Then I'm going to call this update following function. So I'm going to say update following, and I'm going to call this with data zero. And this will update if the current user is following this user. So we know if we have to display a follow button or an unfollow button. And then lastly, I'm going to say set owner. And I'm just going to say is the current user, which is stored in the variable user, equal to data zero. And I guess we'll do three equal signs because this is JavaScript dot and then username. So this is saying is the current user the profile that we just got? If it is, then we want to show the editing button or show the edit button at least. And so that's why we're uh, we're setting this here. OK, now that we've done that, we can just add a catch. Uh, so we'll add actually, I guess we can just add one catch right here. So we can say dot catch we can say error and then we can say console dot error and we will just display this error. Uh, this here should actually handle almost all of the errors for us. So if we get a length of zero, uh, then we will just say profile does not exist. Otherwise, we can just log the error to the console. OK, now that we've done that, I guess we need to write the get post request. 
And then once we write the get post request, we're going to have to write this function here for update following. And actually, I think we can just write update following first uh, because this is pretty straightforward. So for the update following, all I need to do is just loop through all of the followers of this profile and see if the current user is in this. So I'm going to say four and this will be let and we'll go with follower of and then this will be profile dot followers. Then I'm going to say if follower dot username is equal 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 to the user then what we'll do is say set following and we'll set that equal to true and then we'll break uh, actually not break we're going to return sorry and then otherwise so if we get to the end of the for loop we'll say set following and then false okay so this just sets the state again telling us if we are following or not now, what I need to do is add a use effect here. So I'm going to say use effect. And I'm just going to call this update profile. So I'm going to say update profile. And then what I need to pass here is the params dot and then username like that. And then what I want to run this again is whenever the params dot username changes or whenever the current user changes. So if I log out that I need to refresh the page again. So we change the follow button actually we remove the follow button off the screen if the user were to sign out or we show the follow button if the user were to sign in. OK, so the next thing we're going to have to do after this is editing. But I want to write this get posts first, which will just give us all of the posts of a specific user. So let's go to API calls and actually not API calls. Let's go to index.js and let's start writing out this function. So get posts is going to be pretty straightforward. We're just going to say app dot get is going to be slash get and then posts like that. And then we're going to do request response and we are going to get the query parameter, which is the username. So I'm going to say const user is equal to request dot query dot user. That looks good to me. Then we're going to say get posts past the user. And then you already know what we're going to do here. Dot then I'm going to take in our data. I'm going to say res .json data. OK, so now let's import this and then write the function. So we're going to go with get posts and then we're going to go to our where is this API calls and start writing this. So functions dot get posts and not a following just get posts. We're going to take in a user so equal to user equal to an arrow function. We're going to return the sandy client dot fetch and we need to fetch again another query here. So this is going to be the asterisk square brackets underscore type is equal to and this will be post and then we want to say and and the author of this post and then the username is equal to and then this will be pound or not pound dollar sign user and then we'll pass our username actually i can just change the parameter name to be username and then that will fix the problem for us okay now we just need to write the data that we want to get so for the data here, I want to get dot, dot, dot. So everything as well as the followers uh, or sorry, not as well as the followers, but as well as the username. So I'm going to say username and then this is going to be equal to author and then username. And then I want to get the photo. So I'm going to say photo and this will be asset. And then the asset is going to go to underscore ID and URL. Okay, that's all we need. So what this uh, query is going to do specifically is going to get all of the posts where the username of the author of that post is equal to our user or our user name. Sorry. Uh, and yeah, that's all we need. And then we're going to get the username of the author just as a field that we've added as well as everything else. And then the photo, the asset, the ID, the URL. OK, so I think that's all good. So let's rerun our API here. So let's go and stop this. OK, let's go NPM start. And then is there an error here? We do have one error. Uh, what is the error that we're getting? It's saying the .css doesn't exist. OK, uh, what is the problem? It looks like it imported a CSS file that we don't have. So let's go to profile and dots. Ah, this is why I just need a slash here. Now, when I add the slash, it should fix the problem. And notice our error goes away and we're only having warnings. OK, let's try this now. Go to the front end. Uh, let's refresh. And notice that we get an empty profile photo. We get an at, we get posts, followers, zero, zero, zero. 
and it says uncaught type error res.arraybuffer.json is not a function. Uh, looks like I must have messed something up there. So let's go to line 40 here. And what is the issue? I have array buffer. Why the heck do I have array buffer? Autocomplete must have did that to me. Let's save that. Let's go back here. And notice we get Tim, one, two, three, four, five, zero posts, zero followers, zero following. Now let's make a post. Uh, please sign in to make a post. Okay, fair enough. Let's go, Tim, log in. And let's go post. Let's choose a file. Uh, let's just post this thing. I don't know what this is. Okay, hello. Make a post. All right. Uh, we go to our feed here. We're not going to see it because, well, we're not following ourselves. That makes sense. Now let's go to our profile by clicking on this. And notice that it shows us. Hmm, okay, so it's actually showing us all of the posts. Unless maybe I posted the Dwayne Durock Johnson from Tim as well. Although I don't think that I did. Um, maybe I did. I mean, we can check that. So let's go here. Let's go to post. Let's go to Dwayne. And I did post it from Tim. Okay, so that makes sense. So it's showing us all of the posts here that we had, as well as number of posts, number of followers, number of following. And the only thing I'm not seeing right now is the button. Uh, and I'm not sure why I'm not seeing that. So let's see how we can get the button to show up. And then let's do the CSS to fix this. And then we will continue. OK, so where is my button? My button is right here. I'm saying user and owner. And ah, the reason for this is I'm not passing user to this uh, profile component. And I'm also not passing set alert. So let's fix that. Let's go to app. Let's go here to our profile and let's say user is equal to and let's pass user and then let's go set alert is equal to set alert and we're all good okay now let's go back and now notice we're getting the edit button because this is our profile awesome when i click that it doesn't do anything but that's what we expected now let's go here to search let's search let's go to say joey and now notice it shows the follow button here because we are not following this user and obviously we need to make the follow button do something we're making some really good progress so far on the profile page all right so now we need to add following we need to add the styling so let's do the styling first i keep forgetting to do that it's also because i hate styling as i'm sure many of you do as well let's start writing at all of these classes the first class that i'm going to write is my vertical data i'm going to say this is display flex i'm going to say this is align items and then we're going to align this in the center uh, we need our semicolon here okay we need the justify content so we're going to say justify content center and then we're going to say the flex direction is going to be columns so they go above each other so let's have a look what happened now and we add that notice that now our posts uh followers and following are all stacked above each other which is what we wanted okay the next thing we want is dot profile so for dot profile, we're going to say display flex. We're going to say flex direction here is going to be row. OK, then we're going to say justify content. This is going to be center align items. This is going to be center. I'm also going to put a flex wrap here where I say flex wrap and this is going to be wrap. OK, let's have a look now and notice that everything kind of gets pushed in the middle here. A little bit strange, but we're making some progress. All right, next, I actually need to write a class that I forgot to add. So what I'm going to do is go back to profile here and add another div that I forgot to ha add here. So right inside of profile, I'm going to say div class name is equal to this is going to be profile hyphen banner. OK, so this is going to contain everything up to but not including the posts. So I'm going to put the ending div tag right here. And now we have a profile banner div. So now I'm going to go to profile.css. I'm going to code this. Now, the profile banner, again, just contains kind of the top banner aspect. That's everything other than the post for this user. OK, so we have profile banner. What we want for profile banner is the following. We're going to have a min width. So we're going to say min width is going to be 30 percent of the screen or of the parent. We're going to say the max width will be 500 pixels. Again, this is not the best way to code all this out, but it will make it look decent enough for our uh, our purposes. I'm going to say this is display flex. I'm going to say flex direction, and this is going to be column. OK, I'm going to go with align items. So align item center. We're going to go with the justify content center as well. And then we're going to go column gap, which is how much of a gap there is between each column. And this is going to be 2 EM. OK, now let's have a look here. And notice it brings it all back here over to the left hand side. Don't worry, as I code out the rest of it, it will continue to fix it. 
status profile banner. Now we need our profile data. So I'm going to say profile data, and this is going to be display, and this will be flex. And then we want to have a flex direction of row. And then we want to have a column gap here as well of 2 EM. Okay, so continuing here, let's go dot follow and then button. And for the follow button, I want to have the display of flex and I want to have a line item center. Okay, then we're going to have our profile image, which I'm referencing with ID. Don't really know why I went with ID as opposed to class, but it's done now. We're going to say max width is 100%. So let's fix that. And then min width is, and this is going to be 100%. Okay. Apologies if you hear my little kitten here that is meowing sitting right beside me. I know you guys can't see her, but uh, she's meowing and I'm not sure if it's picking up on the mic or not. We're going to continue here. We're going to have profile bio. This is going to be display flex. And then we're going to say flex direction. This is going to be the column. OK, and then we're going to go dot profile posts and then this is going to be hyphen wrapper. This is going to have a min width and not of none, but of 30 percent. It is going to have a max width of 500 pixels, so 500 PX, and then it's going to have display flex. OK, and the flex direction is going to be column. So let's fix that. OK, then for our profile posts, I want to have a grid to uh, display them so that it's nice and organized. So I'm going to have profile posts and then inside of here, we're going to have display and this is going to be as a grid. And then I'm going to say grid template columns and I'm going to say one fractional unit, one fractional unit, one fractional unit. And what this will do is make it so that we have three posts in every single row of our grid. Uh, that's kind of just what this is doing. Now, if I wanted four, I would do one more fractional unit. If I wanted two, I would remove one. I'm not going to explain much more than that. That's what that line does, though. And then finally, I'm going to say profile posts. And then for all of the image tags inside of there, I'm going to say the width can be 100 percent and the min width will be 100 percent as well. OK, min width and then 100 percent. OK, again, I'm not a master of CSS. I'm sure some things here don't make complete sense. And there's probably better ways to do stuff, uh, but this is what I got working before and I'm not really down to change it right now. OK, so let's go here and let's refresh. OK, so that looks better after I refresh, but this image is way too big. So I got to find a way to make the image smaller. Uh, so let me have a look here and then I'll be right back. All right. So I realized what the issue is. I had this at 100 percent when I meant to have 100 pixels for my profile image. So let's fix that. Make it pixels, not percent. And there we go. That is looking much better. Now, it is a little bit offset, like it's over to the left when I want it to be in the center. Uh, so again, let me just have a quick peek here and see why we're getting that. All right, so I see the issue here for my align items in my profile banner. I'm actually going to align them at flex start, which means I'm going to align them at the beginning of the container. Uh, and I think that should make the fix. So let's have a look at this now. And that looks a bit better. So these items have now been pushed over to the left. We still have this kind of offset to the left when it should be in the middle of the screen. So let me continue to look for the issue here. I'll be right back. All right, so I found the other issue here had to do with my profile. So I had the flex direction as row when it needs to be column. Uh, when we make that column now, it should fix this and put it in the center of the screen. And as you can see, it does. And when I resize it, everything is dynamic and looks OK. All right, there we go. Now let's go to Tim's profile because there's some images there. And let's see if these are laid out nicer now. So for Tim, now we get our two images. Not perfect, but I can live with that for right now. Uh, it's good enough. Again, we're not focusing a ton on the styling, but I can see the different images. And actually, maybe one thing that I do want to do is add a little bit of a break here between the images as well as uh, the bio here. So let's implement that. And the way that we can do that is we can go to uh, profile here and we can just add in a break div in between here. So I can say div, I can say class name is equal to break. And then if I go to my profile.css, let's just write that. So I'm going to say dot break. And for dot break, this will be pretty straightforward. We're just going to say uh, flex and then basis is going to be 100%. OK. And then we're going to say that the height of this is going to be 2 EM, which is how much we want to break by. Now, the flex base is 100 percent. We'll just make it so it takes up 100 percent of the width of the screen. And then the height 2 EM will just be well the height. And so it should break. Uh, OK, that is actually not what I was expecting was going to happen. 
Uh, let's change something here. Okay, so the reason that happened is because my profile flex direction is column. I know I just changed that, but now that I've added the break in, I think it messed some stuff up. So let's change this back to row now. And when I change this back to row, you should see that now we get them aligned in a row. And okay, there we go. So that's better. All right, now we have our space. We have our name. We have this. Let's sign in now. Let's now go to our profile. And now notice it says the edit button shows this, shows our name. Very nice. Okay, everything is working as I expected. Now we want to be able to edit the profile and then follow and unfollow. And then we will be done with this project. So let's start by coding out the edit profile. Now, as I said, I'm going to put that in a separate component and this is going to pop up a pop up or a modal that's going to show us all of the different fields that we can edit. So we can edit the profile photo. We can edit the bio. We can edit the first name and the last name. So what I want to do for edit profile is start with my imports. So I'm going to say import use state and then this will be from and react. And then I'm going to import the button, the form and the modal from and then this is going to be react and then bootstrap. OK, nice. Now that we have that, let's take in some props here. So the props that I want for the profile is going to be should I show this? What's the hide callback? So when I hide this modal by clicking out of it, uh, what's the callback function for that? Then we have user. We have not add alert, but set alert. And then we have the profile data because we need to populate the fields uh, with kind of the default data that's already there and then see if we need to update it or not. So what I'm going to do now is say my state. So I'm going to put a state for the bio. So I'm going to say const bio and then set bio is equal to use states. So we'll say use state and then this will be the profile data dot bio. So that's what the default value is going to be for it, whatever our current profile data bio is. Then we'll have const and this will be the first name and this will be set first name equal to use state profile data dot first underscore name. OK, and then we're going to have const last name set last name is equal to use state. So let's do that profile data dot last underscore name. OK, then we're going to have const and this will be a file. This will be set file and this will be use state and this will be an empty string. And the file is going to be for our profile picture. And I'll show you how we uh, update the profile photo uh, later on. OK, then we are going to write the HTML for our page or for this modal for the component. So I'm going to return a modal. Now, this is kind of a pop up on the screen. That's what I've been saying a bunch of times now. Now, do I want to show this? Well, I'm going to say show is equal to and then show. So if this is false, we won't show it. If it's true, then we will show it. I'm going to say on hide. So when this is hidden, what do we do? Well, we are going to call the hide callback function, which will be passed to us from wherever we render this component. Then inside of here, I'm going to say modal dot header. And for the header, well, we're going to add a close button, which will allow us to close this. And I'm going to add a title. So I'm going to say modal dot and then title and then this will be edit profile and I think that's all we need for the title. OK, now outside of the header, we're going to add a body. So I'm going to say modal dot body. Of course, this will be the main body of that. And then inside of here, we're going to add a form. So add form and inside of the form, we're going to have a group. So form dot group. OK, and then the class name here is going to be margin bottom three or MB three. Then we are going to update the profile photo if we have one. So I'm going to say profile data dot photo question mark. So do we have a photo uh, and sorry and and not file. Now, the reason I need this is because what I want to show for the image is whatever the photo is currently of our profile. And if we don't have a photo, then I want to show the file that the user uploaded. However, if we have a photo and we have a file, meaning that the user just changed the profile photo, then I want to show the file that they uploaded. So that's what I'm checking. Do we have a photo and do we not have a file? If we do, let's show the photo. Otherwise, if we have a file, let's show the file that they uploaded. OK, so if that's the case, then what I'm going to show here is an image tag. And inside the image tag, the SRC is going to be the profile data dot photo dot URL. Sorry, dot asset dot URL. 
and then the class name is going to be equal to. So for the class name, let's go with upload image and then we will write the HTML for that or write the CSS sorry, for that in a minute. Now, otherwise, OK, so for the else here, what I need to do is render a different image. So I'm going to say image. It's going to be SRC. And this is going to be equal to the following. Let's just end the tag here so I can save this, hopefully. Uh, oh, OK, let's do this. OK, now it's going to be a little bit easier for you guys to see. So I'm going to say SRC is equal to and I'm going to check here if we have a file. So I'm going to say file question mark. If we do have a file, then I'm going to say URL dot create object. And then this will be URL and we will put inside of here the file. Otherwise, we'll just have no here for the source of our image. So we won't actually show anything. And then I'll say class name is equal to. And again, this will be upload image, which we're going to need to write the CSS for in a minute. OK, so that is for our image. Now let's copy this form group and let's put another one and let's copy it a few times because we're going to have three more inputs here. So for the next one, I just want a regular input, which is going to be a file input. So I'm going to say input. This is going to be type equal to file. And then what do I want next? I want an on change and the on change is going to be equal to an arrow function. And the arrow function is simply going to say set file. And this is going to be E, but we need to take in E here dot target dot files at index zero, which we've already seen. So that'll give us the file that uh, we actually uploaded here. And then we can say accepts or actually let's go look at our create post and try to remember here what we had. OK, so it says accept image slash and then asterisk. OK, so that's what we want for this as well. So edit profile. Let's paste that in. OK, that's it for that form group. Now we're also going to have another one, which I forgot about in the next form group, though, we are going to have a form control for the first name, I guess. So we'll have form control and then we'll just end the tag inside of itself. We'll say type is equal to text. We will say placeholder is equal to first name. And then we're going to say that the default value is going to be equal to profile data dot first underscore name. OK, and on input, this is going to be equal to an arrow function where we're going to update the first name. So we're going to say set first name e dot target dot value. OK, so let's copy this and let's paste the same thing here. But now we're going to do this for the last name. So the default value will be last name. And then we will do rather than set first name, set last name. OK, lastly, we want the bio so we can actually paste this in as well. And now we're just going to say bio. This will be dot bio. And then rather than setting the first name, we will set the you guessed it bio. OK, last thing we need here is a button. So inside of the form, I'm going to put a div. I'm going to put another div here. And then I'm going to say that this is a button. OK, the variant will be equal to uh, primary. So we have a blue button here. The type is a button, although I don't actually think I even need that one. It's just a default button. And I'm going to say on click is equal to and then I'm going to make a function here. So I'm going to say function update profile. OK, and we'll do something inside of here for now, though. Let's just call update profile. OK, so that should be the HTML of the entire page. I believe that's all good. What is the issue here with the return? I uh, expecting that. Uh, OK, I think this is fine. Um, yeah, just give me a warning. OK, so I guess my VS code is just tripping out now. I think that's all good for right now. Now what we need to do is code out this update profile function. So inside of this function, since I need to actually send a file, right, if we have a file to update the, uh, the what do you call it, the profile image, I need to create my form data. So I'm going to say const form data is equal to new form uh, and data like that. OK, and then I'm going to say form data dot append and we're going to append the file with the file and the form data dot append and we're going to append the user user and this is actually going to be the user that we want to update the profile for which will just be our current user so actually that makes sense we can just use user inside of here all right so then i'm going to continue and say form data dot append 
we're going to append the first name. So let's do that. The first underscore name. This will match up with first name, which is our state variable. And then form data dot append. We're going to append the last name and the last name. And then we're going to do the bio. So form data dot append and then bio bio like that. All right. That should be all good. Then we are going to say const request options and we're going to say that this is equal to and this is going to be method and this is going to be post. Now we also could maybe make this a patch method, but I think it's fine to just make it a post because we're going to be uploading a file as well. And then for the body, we're going to have our form data. OK, then we're going to fetch an endpoint. We need to write this endpoint still, but we might as well just write the code now. And this is going to be update profile. We're going to pass to this the request options and we're going to say dot. Then we're going to get the response and we're going to return the response dot JSON. We're going to say dot. Then we're going to get the data and then we're going to do something with the data. Now, what we're going to do specifically is we're going to add an alert and we're going to say actually, is it add alert? What did I call this set alert? I keep saying add when I mean set. OK, so we're going to set an alert and we're going to say here the variant. And this is going to be equal to success. OK, and then the message. And this is going to be equal to profile updated. Successfully. OK, now what I'm about to do here is going to seem a little bit weird. But it's going to save us from having to make another request to the API to retrieve the new image for our uh, our profile image if we uploaded one. So I'll explain why we need this, but I'm going to say if file. So if we did actually upload a new file, then I'm going to say data dot and I'm going to add a new key here. It's going to be image URL is equal to URL dot object or dot create object. So it's going to be create object URL. And I'm going to pass to a file. Now, the point of this is that I'm going to now call the hide callback function with my data. And I've now added this image URL field to it. And so now from the component that's rendering this, which is going to be the profile component, I can grab the image that was uploaded here in the modal and without having to wait to get a response from the API, at least to send another request, get the new profile data, get the new image, etc. What I'll do is just immediately update it on the profile. And so it's going to seem like it's a lot faster because what happens here is when I send this request, it's going to return to me all of the data that I updated on my object. It's also going to return just the data of the object in general. The issue is that it's not going to return to me a URL for the image that I uploaded. It's only returning to me the ID and the reference of that image. So since I already have the image path here, I'm going to say data dot image URL is equal to and I create a URL for it. And then I display it immediately. Again, this is saving me a request to the API. So once we start getting through this, uh, it'll make more sense. But again, we're just adding the URL to the image we uploaded to this data. So now I can grab that from the profile component and I can just display that instantly. And so it looks like we updated very quickly when uh, we don't have to send a second request to the API to get the new image. Hopefully I'm clear there. Let's add a catch, though, just in case something goes wrong. So I'm going to say error. And then here we will add an alert actually. So I'll say set alert. Caught myself that time. And let's go with variant. And this will be danger. And then the message will be error dot message. And then we also need to call the hide callback function from here as well. But this time we're not going to have any data to return. So I'm going to do semicolon and then I'm going to call the hide callback. And I'm just going to pass to it undefined uh, because well, we have no data. OK, so that's it for the update profile function. Now, that's really going to complete this component. Now, what we need to do is write the update profile API uh, endpoint. So let's go to actually index.js first. And inside of index.js, we're going to write this. So we're going to say app dot post. Now, this is going to be slash and this will be update profile. Now here we want to accept a file, although we're not sure if we're always going to get a file, but we could because when you're updating the profile, the idea here is that you can update some aspects of the profile, but you don't have to, right? You might only update the first name, you might only update the last name. So we have to be careful here how we're updating this and making sure we don't clear any fields. 
if we didn't change those. So I'm going to say upload.file. And then inside of here, uh, actually, sorry, not upload.file, upload.single. This will be a file. And then we're going to say, let's go here, request response. And then this will be equal to an arrow function. Inside of here, I'm going to get the body. So I'm going to say const body is equal to and then request dot body like that. All right. So now that we've done that, I want to call a function called update profile and I need to pass to this my body dot user my body dot and then this is going to be the first name my body dot last name. OK, so let's go last name like that. My body dot and then this is going to be the bio. OK, and then finally, we're going to pass the request dot. Is it image or is it file? I believe it is simply file. OK, then we're going to have dot then data. And then we are going to return res.json like that. All right, so let me just quickly fix this so that we don't have these uh, things here because we don't need those. Now, what I wanted to mention is that throughout this video, I haven't really been showing you all of the responses from the Sandy client. Now, they're just standard JSON responses that are going to contain all of the fields from our database. But now at this point, it's going to be a little bit different because we're going to actually be updating an object. And when we update an object, it's going to return to us kind of a different looking response. Now, from the Sandy documentation, you can see exactly how all of that works. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that if you want to look at what the exact response is, you can come in here and you can just print out the data before you return res.json and then that way you'll be able to see well exactly what the response is in the console uh, or specifically you'll see it actually from your API like when I was here when I was printing out a file that I was uploading. In fact, let me remove that. I have a console.log somewhere. Uh, where is it? Yeah, right here. Console.log request.file. Okay, anyways, we have update profile. We have this function. So let's now import the function. Okay. And then I just want to copy this just so I don't forget the different arguments. And let's go into API calls and let's start writing this. So I'm going to say actually not const functions dot. And then this is going to be update profile like that. This will be equal to an arrow function. And then we're going to take in the first name, the last name, the bio. Uh, we also need the user. So first we'll take in the user, first name, last name, bio. And then this is going to be the file or we'll call it the image. This will go to an arrow function. And inside of here, we need to make what's known as a patch request uh, with the Sandy API client so that we can update the profile. So to update the profile, first, we're going to check if we have an image, because if we have an image, we need to upload that image and then use the new ID of that image as kind of an update field when we're updating the profile of the user. Right. So I'm going to say if image like that. So if we actually have something, then we're going to return the Sandy client and this is going to be dot assets. Right. And then dot upload. And we're going to do exactly what we did before. So Sandy client dot assets dot upload. We're going to upload an image. We're going to create a read stream. This is going to be of the image dot path. And in fact, uh, actually, yeah, we'll just code it out because why not? We have the file name here. And this will be the base name of the image dot path. OK, and then from here, we're going to say dot then and then we're going to have some data. And then what we're going to do with this data is we're actually going to say functions dot get user ID like that. We're going to get the user dot then. I know this is a lot. I'm going to save in a second. Actually, let's save right now just so we can see this a little bit easier. OK, that's a bit easier to read. So I now have dot then. Now I'm going to get IDs and then from the IDs, <clears throat> excuse me, I need to say sanity like this. So sanity, sanity client dot and then this is going to be patch and I'm going to patch IDs zero dot underscore ID. Don't worry, I'll explain all of this in one minute. And I am going to set something specifically. I'm going to set all of the fields that I want to update. So let's write that out. But first, let me just fix this so I don't have my curly brace because I can't have that here. That's going to crash my program. OK, so dot set. And this is the way that we update a field. OK, so let me just slow down for one second because I'm getting lost a bit myself. So we have 
if image, if we do have an image, we're going to start by uploading the image, which we already know how to do. Once we upload the image, it's going to return to us some data. That data is going to contain the ID of the image, which we're going to use to reference it. Okay, so that's where we're first uploading the image. Then we're saying functions.getUserID. We've written this, uh, I guess, very close to the top. Yeah, it's right here. Just returns to us uh, information about a user, specifically just the ID but it's going to give it to us in a list. So we want to get ID zero and then dot underscore ID, which, which will actually be the ID of this user. Then we're saying dot set because we're patching here. So patch says we're going to be updating and then we're setting. And when we set a field, we're just changing the value of that field to be whatever we want. So then I'm going to write an object here and I'm just going to put the names of all my fields. So I'm going to say first name, last name, bio. And then for the image, we're going to have to set it a little bit differently. So we're going to say the image, actually not the image, sorry, the photo, because that's the name in our database. And this is going to be equal to an asset. And the asset is going to be a reference. So we're going to say underscore ref. And this is going to reference data dot underscore ID. OK, let's save this. Now it's a little bit easier to read. So again, we upload the image. We get the data associated with the image, which will allow us to get the ID. We get the user ID of the current user. And then we say sandy client dot patch and we're patching what ID or what document we're patching the document with the ID of this user. So when you use dot patch, you pass in an ID of the document that you want to patch and set different fields on. And then I'm saying dot set. So dot set allows me to actually set the values. So I pass an object here. I pass first name, last name, bio, and then I'm passing photo. And this is going to be an asset that's referencing the image that we just uploaded, which we're going to be able to get the ID of from data. OK, and then what we do is we type dot commit. And when we do that, it's going to commit all of the changes uh, to the sanity database. All right. Now we also have the option to unset. I won't show you that again. You can reference it from the documentation, but setting is how we can make an update to the object and override those fields. Nice. Now that we have that, we need to write an else because if we don't have an image, then we're not going to upload an image. And in fact, if we don't have an image, we're just going to do this. So I'm going to copy this part right here. Uh, actually, it'll just be this first part. And we're going to say return like that. This is going to be functions dot get user ID dot then. And then inside of here, what we're returning is sandy client dot patch ID zero ID set first name, last name bio. But we're not going to set the photo this time because, well, we don't have a photo. So there's no reason for us to set the photo, right? Pretty straightforward. OK, so I think that's all we need to do inside of here. That looks good for update profile. Definitely the most complicated one that we had to do thus far. Now we will go back to edit profile uh, and I guess we can actually just give it a test, although I need to render this component from inside of profile. So I am importing edit profile from edit profile. So what I'm going to do now is go here to uh, right before profile and I'm going to the, render the edit profile component. So I'm going to say edit profile. And then what I need to pass to the profile is quite a few things. So I need to say user is equal to and then user. I'm going to pass show, which is going to be equal to editing. So if we're editing, we're show it or we're going to show it. If we're not, then we are not, obviously. And then I'm going to pass my hide callback. OK, so hide callback is going to be equal to. And then what did we call this? I think we called this hide edit callback. OK, that is what we called it. And let's just end the component so I don't forget to do that. So we have user show hide callback. We also need to pass our profile data. So I'm going to say profile data is equal to and then profile data. Let's save that. And then lastly, we need to pass our add alert. So I'm going to say add alert is equal to and then add alert, which would have been passed to us uh, in a prop right here. And oh my gosh, I keep saying add alert set alert, set alert. And then let's just go to edit profile and make sure I called this set alert. OK, I did call it set alert. Nice. OK, so that now will actually allow us to view the edit profile page uh, whenever we click the edit button. All right, I think that's all we need to do for the profile component. I have a feeling a few things are not going to work as expected, but that's fine. We'll fix them when we get to that point. So let's go here. Uh, let's go to our React app. Let's refresh. Uh, OK, let's sign in. Let's sign in as Tim. Let's go to our profile and notice we can click edit. So let's hit edit. 
and nice we get this modal now the button oh i forgot to put text for the button so let me do that in a second uh, we also need to make a size for the image so it takes up some room but you can see i have tim rasika and then i don't have a bio now when i press the button it should update but let's first just fix this a little bit uh, so that the button actually has a name so let's go to edit profile uh, our button is down here so let's i don't even know what we should do maybe just submit and that's fine uh, and then our image we want to add a oh we want to add the styling for upload image okay so let's do that first so let's actually do this inside of profile.css and we'll say dot upload image and then the image that we want to upload here is going to be width of 300 pixels and height of 300 pixels we'll just give it a static width and height for now doesn't really matter too much okay so let's restart our api actually so now we can test this so let's go yes let's restart okay it started all right now let's come here let's sign in as tim so sign in okay now let's go to our profile okay it says edit shows our modal perfect now we could put this in the middle i'm not too worried about that right now let's add a bio so let's say hello world and let's add a new image and actually we don't have any image at all so let's just go with something like this okay nice dog let's press submit and let's see if this is going to work or not okay so it said profile updated successfully but we have not closed the modal and when i come back here uh it's actually not even letting me close it because i have not implemented the hide callback function so we need to fix that but it does look like that it was updated we didn't get any errors which is a good sign so let's continue now. okay so let me close this let's go to edit profile and we need to implement this hide sorry let's go to profile my bad we need to implement this hide edit callback. So inside of head, hide edit callback, we're going to say set editing false. Now that will at least close the modal for us. We also need to do a few other things. The next thing that we're going to have to do is get the data that's going to be passed here. And we're going to use that to make some updates to our profile again, so we don't have to send another request. So I'm going to say if data. So if it's not undefined, if this did happen successfully, then I'm going to say profile data dot first underscore name is equal to whatever the new data dot first name is and then the profile data dot last underscore name is equal to data dot and then last underscore name okay and then i'm going to say if data dot image underscore url so if we do have an image url inside of there then we'll update the photo so profile data actually we'll say profile data dot photo is going to be equal to and then this will be an asset and then this will be a URL and the new URL will just be data dot image URL. OK, and then down here we'll say profile data dot and then bio is equal to data dot bio. OK, and then we'll say set profile data and we will set it to be profile data just to make sure the state updates. OK. So just to stop here and explain, because I know I'm not explaining exactly the data that's being returned from our API call. When we update, as I was saying, it's going to return to us a new object with all of those new updates. However, the image that we're going to get is not going to contain a URL because we didn't explicitly ask for the URL from the asset. And so that is why, again, I was adding that uh, image URL aspect to our data from the edit profile here. That's why I did this. So now when we come back here, we just grab the first name, grab the last name from the new data, right? This will be whatever the updated first name is, whatever the updated last name is, updated image, updated bio. And we just use that to update our profile data. We then set the profile data, set editing equal to false. And now we have all of the updates we just made without having to send an additional request. Now, if we wanted to simplify this, we could actually just call the update profile function here. And then that would send another request that would then give us all of the new data. And then we wouldn't have to worry about any of this. So what we could do is not return any data and just call update profile. And we just call this with the username, right? And then that would update it for us. However, I prefer doing this and it's going to be faster and look faster on our page. So let's try this now. Let's go here. Let me click this. It actually closed. And then we have undefined, undefined, and then hello world. Okay. So this is a bit of an issue. Uh, our first name and last name are not being updated as I hoped they were going to be updated. So I will show you how to fix this, but I was hoping it wasn't going to happen. So let's go back to edit and notice these are both undefined. Now, if I manually change them and I change them, say Tim Rasika here, and now I submit, we should see that this closes and it does actually update for us. 
The issue is if I don't modify them at all and then I hit submit, okay? Uh, oh, okay, it actually looks like it didn't make it go to undefined. Although, let's see if I go post and Tim, if they're undefined now. No, okay, they're not undefined. Hmm, that's weird why they were undefined before. Let's, mm, let's try this one more time. Let's submit. And there we go. So now they're all, they all go to undefined. So again, this is kind of weird, but what's actually happening here is that the state for some reason is not going to be holding the correct profile data when we don't make any changes to it. So just to kind of debug this a little bit, let's print out the first name and the last name. So let's print out first name and last name as well as the bio here when we don't make any changes just to see what they're equal to before we add them into our form data uh, and then we can hopefully fix this problem. So let's refresh. We're going to have to sign in again just because we've refreshed the app. So let's sign in as Tim. Let's go here. OK, let's hit edit. Now let's make a change that's going to persist. So Tim Rasika, hello. OK, submit. Tim Rasika, hello. OK, that's what the state is. Nice. It updated. Now let's just go post and Tim just so that we get a fresh API call to get everything here. OK, now let's go edit and let's not make a change and hit submit. Now notice they all become undefined. Now, I'm not a React expert, and so I don't know why for some reason the state is not getting what the uh, what do you call it, what the props are, because the props where my profile data is, is first name, last name and bio. So I assumed it was going to store that data. But for some reason, it's not. So really, there's no point of us even putting that in there because, well, clearly it's not the correct data. So what I'm going to have to do is check if the state is empty. And if the state is empty, then I'm going to have to replace first name, last name and bio with the current profile data from inside of here. So really the fix involves this. We're going to say if and then we're going to say first name is equal to an empty string or we could just say something like if not first name really up to you how you want to do it. Then we're going to say set first name and then this is going to be profile data dot first name. Now this is only going to trigger if we don't manually make a change to change to first name. So that's fine. If we do make a change, it won't trigger. Then this is going to be last name and we're going to say set last name and we're going to say profile data dot and this should be last name. And then lastly here, we're going to go with bio. OK, and then we'll say set bio. And this can be profile data dot and then bio. Now, alternatively, I'm thinking that there's probably a world where we can do this inside of a use effect where we just set the first name, set the last name and set the bio equal to this information. As soon as this information comes into us, I'm assuming what's happening is that originally when the profile data is passed, it's actually empty to the component and then it's not being refreshed. And so that's why uh, we're getting kind of the empty state here. Because if we go to profile, actually, I think this makes sense. I think I've just figured it out here. Uh, the update profile is not going to be done immediately because we're sending an API request. So it takes a second to get this data. So immediately when we actually start rendering this edit profile and we pass the profile data, we're passing empty profile data. And that means when I go to edit profile here and I set the initial state, I'm setting it with empty profile data. And so I'm getting undefined. So now if we just set it as an empty string and then we update it using the profile data, once we've hit the update profile button, we should be good to go. Again, we could probably do this in a use effect, but I think this is fine for now. OK, so let's save this. Let's go back here and let's give this a try. So let's refresh. We're going to have to re-sign in. So let's sign in as Tim. Log in. OK, let's go to our profile. Let's go edit. Let's change this to something that makes sense. So Tim, Rasika. OK, hello world. OK, submit and let's make a change now and let's just submit with no changes. OK, so submit and that looks good. Now let's go back to the profile. So post Tim and it does not show undefined. Awesome. So that's exactly what we're looking for. Looks like we are able to edit the profile successfully. Let's try changing the image now. So let's go with the young man's face. OK, submit and let's see if it works. And there we go. We get it. Uh, oh, OK. So this time the first name, last name and bio are gone. OK, so it looks like we do have an issue. Uh, we're going to have to fix that. So let's try this one more time, though, just so I can make sure I get the issue correct. So Tim Rasika, say bio. OK, let's submit. All right. When we submit, we get that. Let's go here. Let's go back to the profile. 
OK, so we're getting all that. But now if I choose a file here, so let's update the file. And let's submit. For some reason, it cleared my first name, last name and bio. OK, so that's annoying. Let's just make sure that actually is occurring and it's not from our callback function. OK, so it is actually persisting in the database. Let me have a look and I'll be right back. All right, so I've just fixed the problem, but it did require a few major changes. So when we're looking at our state here, notice that I just have these as empty strings. OK, then for use effect, I've added this in here to edit profile. So I imported it first, right? And then what I'm doing is I'm setting the first name, setting the last name and setting the bio whenever the profile data changes. So whenever we load the new profile data from our profile component, then it will force this to update here. And so we'll force update the state. Then what I'm doing here uh, is I'm just appending all these things in the same way that we had before. However, when I call the callback function, I'm no longer passing the new data. Now, when I go to profile.js here, notice that in the callback function, I've removed everything and now I'm just calling update profile. So yes, I did say before that it was going to be faster to get the data back and then make those changes. However, that was really bug prone and I realized this was going to be a better solution just because there's not going to be all these weird edge cases, edge cases, sorry, and things going on that we need to handle. So even though the other way will be faster and we should try to come up with a way to do that, for the purpose of this video, we're just going to recall the update profile and that's going to force another API request, which will now give us all of the new data in the format that we're used to expecting. And then we can just update the profile using that. Uh, and that means we won't have any data inconsistency issues as well. So for hide edit callback, I'm no longer taking a parameter and I'm just calling update profile. So those are really all the changes that I made. Uh, another change I made is that if you go here, notice that I have first underscore name, not first name. So that was one of the causes of a lot of our issues was I had camel case as opposed to snake case. And so hopefully you guys can understand all of those fixes. Again, code will be available from the description in case I lost you here. Uh, but I think we should be good to go now. So let's come back here. Uh, let's refresh the page and let's give this another test. OK, so let's go Tim. Let's go here. Now I have undefined because I was messing with us before. Anyways, let's change this to be Tim. Let's go. Hey, let's submit. And now we get the correct stuff. OK, now let's make another change and actually let's just submit the current data that we have. Notice we don't get any undefined. OK, fingers crossed. Let's upload a new image here. OK, let's try this. And yes, awesome. Everything is working. We can now move on to adding followers. OK, so we've updated the profile. A lot of the hard stuff is done now. We just want a way to be able to uh, follow and unfollow accounts. So actually not overly complicated to do that. We're going to do that from the profile page so we can now close the edit profile page. We're done with that. However, I want to go into my API calls and I want to write those and then I want to write the corresponding back end API endpoints uh, that we'll need. And then that way we can just work in the profile file for the remainder of the video. So let's write some functions that can add and delete a follower. So I'm going to say functions dot add follower is equal to we want to take the user that we're going to add the follower for and then we want to take the following ID. So who are we following? OK, then we're going to come here and we're going to going to return and this is going to be functions dot. We need to get the user ID of the user that we want to add the follower for. We're then going to say dot then. We've already looked at this before, but we're going to get our IDs. And then inside of here, we're going to say sanity client dot. And now we're going to patch because we're going to be adding an element to an array, which is a patch or update operation for the current user. Right. So that's why we're patching. We're going to patch IDs zero dot underscore ID. OK, now we're going to add our dot. Then we're going to take in our data. Uh, or sorry, we don't need a dot then. My apologies. We're going to have a dot and then this is going to be set if missing. And we're going to set if missing the following field to be an empty array. Just so when we try to add something into the array, if we didn't already have it, we don't get any errors. Now we should have the field there already. But again, if for some reason we don't have it, we're going to set it if it's missing. I mean, that's pretty intuitive. And then we're going to insert something. Now we're going to insert after. And what I can write here is following and then colon negative one or sorry, just negative one. And this is going to reference the very last element in the following uh, array here, just like we would in Python. Now, it doesn't really matter where we're adding this element in uh, because we don't really care about the order of it, but we'll just add it at the end because that kind of makes sense to do. And then what we're going to do is we are going to add a 
underscore reference. And this reference is going to be to the following ID like that. And then we need a unique key inside of this array. So the key I'm going to use is nano ID and I need to import that. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say import nano ID from and then nano ID. I believe it's a default import. Actually, no, it's not. So we're going to have to import it like this. And what nano ID is going to give us is just a unique ID that we can use. Now, the reason we need an ID inside of here is because every element in our array, we want to be able to have quick index access for it. And we can access every element using a unique ID. So when I have key now, if we had, say, a duplicate uh, reference in here, we shouldn't have that. But if we did, we'd still know which element is which because we have the unique key. So this just helps in the database for them to quickly locate different elements. Uh, hopefully it's making a tiny bit of sense, but every element that we have inside of the array, we add this key, which is a unique ID that we get from this nano ID function. We installed that at the beginning of the video. OK, now the next thing that we need to do here when we're going to be adding a follower uh, is we just need to add the type. So I'm going to say underscore type like this, and this is going to be a reference. So let's add reference like that. And that is literally all we need to do to add a follower other than commit. OK, so we'll commit like that. All right, so let's just walk through this one more time. We're getting the ID of the user. We're already going to have the ID of the person that we want to follow. And I'll talk about how we get that in a second. Then we are going to, well, get the ID from the user. We're going to patch this user because, again, patch, we take an ID of a document that we want to make a modification on. We're going to set if missing the following field, and then we're going to insert after the last element in the following array. If it doesn't have any elements, it'd just be the first element we insert. And then here we pass an array of all elements that we want to insert. We're going to insert multiple elements at a time. So I could put another object if I want to insert it here. In this case, I just want to insert one. So I'm inserting a reference to the following ID because the reference type or the type of this array is reference, right? And then I'm saying key, nano ID, the unique ID of a key. And then I'm saying type reference, and we're all good to add a follower. OK, now in a similar way, we're going to remove a follower. So I'm going to say functions dot remove follower. This is going to be equal to user and following ID as well. And then inside of here, we're going to return the Sandy client. And then this is going to be dot patch. And again, we're going to have to get the user ID actually. So first, I'm going to say return functions dot get user ID. We're going to get the user ID of the user. I'm going to say dot then. This is going to be IDs. And then here, we're going to say sandy client dot patch. This is going to be IDs zero dot underscore ID. Okay, let's save that. And then after the dot patch, we are going to say unset. So this is how we actually remove something. And we're going to unset the field that we want uh, in this array. So I'm going to say inside of here, following like that. And then this is going to be underscore ref. And then the ref is going to be equal to a string. And this string, I'm actually going to have to, sorry, make this back ticks just so that we can insert what I need here. So we're going to have a string. And I'm going to go with following ID like that inside of parentheses or not parentheses, sorry, this is going to be squiggly brackets. Okay, so let's save that so it goes down on the next line. So what we're doing here is saying, okay, we are going to get the user ID, we are going to patch that user, so make an update on it, and then we're going to unset, and we're going to unset following, and then at this key. So really following is the array, and we just want to unset one element from that array, which is really removing it from the array. The element we want to remove is the one that has a reference, which is equal to the following ID. So that's why we're putting it here. And then we need a back tick so we could embed this directly inside of here. Then, of course, just like before, we need to commit. And once we make a commit, it will update it in the database. And there we go. OK, so now that we have done that, we just need to go to index.js and we need to write the corresponding, uh, what do you call it, uh, endpoints here for remove follower and add follower. So I'm going to say app dot. And then we, when we want to add a follower, it's going to be post. So I'm going to say post and then this will be slash add follower. Again, you can maybe make this a patch request if you want, but we'll just keep it as post. It's not really a big deal. And I will go here with request and response. And then this is going to be const body. And I want to say request dot body because I need to get a few things here. Specifically, I need the user as well as the ID of the person that I want to follow. So now I'm going to call the remove or sorry, not remove the add follower function. And I'm going to pass to this the body.user. 
as well as the body.id and the id is going to be the id of the person I want to follow. Then I'm going to say dot then data and then I will return uh what is it? Yeah, res.json and then data. Okay. That's what we need for that. Let's copy this and do the same except this is going to be the delete method and this will be for remove follower uh, because we're deleting something, right? And then we are going to have our request.body. Same thing, we want body user body ID, except rather than add follower, it's going to be remove. Now we just need to import those two functions. So let's go add follower and remove follower. And now we are good from the back end standpoint. So let's close this. Let's rerun our back end. And now let's go to our front end and let's actually use these inside of our follow click function because the follow click function is really the last thing that we need to code out here to add and delete the followers. So the first thing I need to check here is am I following or am I not following? I also want to make sure that I'm not the owner and that I can't somehow click this before the uh, the page fully renders. So what I'm going to do is say if owner then return just to make sure that I can't go any further inside inside of the logic here. And then I'm going to say if not following. So if I'm not following, then this means that I'm actually going to add a follower. If I am following, then I'm going to remove. So we'll have an else statement here and we'll do something there. OK, so I'm going to say const request options. This is going to be equal to an object. Now the method is going to be post. OK, again, you could have made that patch. Uh, some of you are probably going to argue in the comments that I should have changed some of the methods, but that's fine. We'll go with post and then I need to add a header here uh, and the header that I want to add is content and then type and this is going to be application JSON because I'm going to be sending JSON data and then for the body here, I'm going to say that this is JSON dot stringify and I'm going to pass my user equal to my user and my ID equal to the profile underscore data or sorry profile data dot underscore ID. So again, we can get the ID from our profile data. The reason we can do that is because the profile data returns to us all of the data from our database and every single element in our sanity database has an underscore ID and the ID is going to be completely unique for each document. So this is the ID of the current person's profile that we're on and the user is the name of our current user that's viewing the profile. OK, so that's what we're doing there. Uh, that's actually all we need for that. And then we're going to fetch a request. I mean, I don't know if fetch a request is really the proper way to say that, but we're going to fetch an endpoint maybe. Uh, and this will be uh, add follower. OK, and we want to add the follower with the request options. And then we're going to say dot then we're going to say underscore res. And we don't actually care about the response here. I mean, I will still return the res dot JSON and then I will say dot then data and then I'll do something here. But I'm actually just going to update the profile once this occurs uh, to set the new following count. So you'll see what I mean here, but I'm going to say update profile and then params dot username like that. OK, so what we're doing when we add a follower, right, is we don't care about the response here. Uh, it just doesn't matter to us what it is because we can just update the profile. Then that will update the follower count of this user to go up by one when we follow them. There's no other updates that we need to make. And so again, we'll just do update profile. OK, so add follower request options. That's post request application JSON. We're sending the user and the profile data ID. This will add the follower for us. Assuming all of that works, we'll follow successfully. And then we don't actually need to like add an alert onto the screen because when we call update profile, it will actually call this uh, update following for us. And then you'll see that we'll set the following to be true, which means the button's going to change. And so that will kind of be the uh, what do you call it? The response to the user or the information to the user. Now, just so I don't get yelled at, I can do underscore data here just to say I'm not using that variable. And now that's fine. OK, so otherwise, if I'm not adding a follower, I'm deleting a follower. So let me copy this here and we're going to change the type to be delete. And then rather than add follower, I'm going to say remove follower. And then we'll do the same thing with update profile here. Uh, it's saying res is not defined. Oh, sorry. So let's fix this. So get rid of underscore res, get rid of underscore res. And, and now that should be good instead of here. So that's actually all we need, I think, for adding the follower and for removing the follower. Yeah, that should be about it. Now, I could add a catch statement if I want to add an alert saying that there's a problem. I think for now, though, this is fine. Uh, if you want to add that, feel free. 
Okay, so that really should wrap up this entire application. Now, I'm hesitant to say that because, of course, we're doing a lot of complex stuff and there's always a possibility that there will be some bugs or some issues here. But let's go and test this out and see if this works. So let's refresh the page here. Uh, if we want to follow someone, obviously, we have to sign in. So let's sign in as like Joey123. And let's now go to our account. And for Joey, okay, we see we have Joe Smith. That's the name. Let's go to search. Let's search for some users. Okay, so when I'm searching, let's go to Tim. And let's follow Tim. Now, okay, we got an issue here. It says unexpected token in JSON at position zero. So as I suspected, we have an error. Let me figure out what that is, and then I'll be right back. All right, so I have found the error here. It just has to do with when I was unsetting and committing in my remove follower. So I'm going to go here and place this like that. Let me remove my semicolon. So what I was doing was I was adding the unset and the commit after uh, the Sandy client. So I was kind of adding it here as opposed to inside. So I just need to fix that. And I need to do the same thing here uh, for this patch. So let me copy all this and paste this inside of this parentheses. So that's what was being messed up. Again, have a look at the new code here. I have sandy client dot patch. Then after the dot patch, I'm doing this as opposed to after the dot then, which is what I had before, which was causing me to get an internal server error. So let me restart my backend. Of course, we had an error. I think this should be good now, though. Uh, let's see. Let's go back. Let's refresh. OK, let's sign in as Joey123. All right, let's go to our search. Let's search for a user. Let's go to Tim and let's press follow. And fingers crossed, we will see. Okay, nice. So the followers go up by one. Now it says unfollow. Now the moment of truth is, is it going to show my uh, new post now based on who I'm following? So if I go to feed, now I see the post of Tim because I'm following Tim. So let's click into Tim and let's unfollow. And let's see now if those posts go away. Okay, so let's go back to feed. And there we go. Now we don't see any posts because, well, we're not following anyone. So let's just do a few more tests here. I'm going to sign in as Tim. So let's log in as Tim here. Let's go and notice that I have one follower. That would have been Joey from when I was following before. Let's go to search. Let's search. Let's go to Tim1234. Let's follow. Okay, now it has two followers. Nice. Now let's make a post. So let's just add a random image here and say test. OK, let's post. Let's see if that works. OK, all good. Let's go to our profile. We should see now we have another post here because I've signed in as Tim. Now let's just go to search and see what other accounts we have. Uh, we have Joey12345. OK, so let's go log out, sign in as Joey12345. Let's go to search. Let's go to Tim. Let's follow. And now he has two followers. OK, let's go to feed. And then I should see all the posts from Tim. Awesome. OK, everything is working. I'm very excited. The video is now complete. All right. So I'm going to conclude the video here. This was an extremely long video. So if you made it to this point, I'm expecting that you leave a like and you subscribe to the channel, maybe even leave a comment because this took a very, very long time to film, record, come up with beforehand. And I will give another thank you to Sanity for sponsoring this video. Again, completely free. I think it was really easy to use and also a great tool because we have this visual, uh, you know, Sandy studio that I can go in and actually view all of the stuff happening with my database. It just makes it way easier, especially when it comes to debugging. And again, for people that aren't kind of tech savvy and aren't going to write the code, if they were working on a project with with you, they could come in here and they could add whatever it is that they needed to, again, without having to write any code themselves. Now, this is as close to a social media clone as I can realistically make on YouTube in a decent amount of time. Of course, we don't have likes, we don't have comments, we don't have you know DMs and stuff like that. But with the tools in this video, you should be able to add those features and extend this to really create whatever you want. Of course, the styling is not as good as a hopefully want it to be, but you can mess around with that. It's very time consuming to do CSS styling as you briefly saw in this video. Anyways, if you made it this far, please do like the video. Please do subscribe, maybe even leave a comment. And I hope to see you in another YouTube video.